All right. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where it is in the world that you happen yeah. to be joining us from. Guten uh, Tag and Buena Sera. And I was trying to learn uh, hello or good evening uh, in Italian, but I think I've, Buena Sera, I think, is right. And Susan is speaking in tongues. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a great way to start. Um, in any event, thank you for joining our uh, little jumpstart here. This is an introduction to creating websites uh, using Python and Flask. Uh, this is a uh, Web Wednesday, uh, which, by the way, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, go ahead and plug the next handful of Web Wednesdays that are coming up. You'll notice them on uh, on the Brick slide. We've got a lot of cool stuff, Azure websites. Um, I'm going to be uh, in here doing Angular and MVC with any framework. So a lot of really cool stuff. You'll see all that on uh, on the Brick slides. Um, but you know, what do you say we introduce ourselves and introduce the course and, and get rolling? Because we got we got a little bit to talk about today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Getting so, everyone rolling. Yeah, why don't you talk about yourself? So my name is Susan Ibeck. Uh, my Twitter handle is Hockey Geek Girl. And uh, my job is I'm a technical evangelist at Microsoft. And what that means is I help developers understand how to get started with our different tools and technologies. A lot of stuff with Visual Studio these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am also a Microsoft certified trainer, and uh, the first program I ever wrote was on a computer with 64K of memory. So I'm not going to admit to how long I've been coding, but that <laughs> might give you a hint. <laughs> yes, yes, that's um, a little bit of a giveaway. <laughs> absolutely. I've worked with a lot of different programming languages, and I think one of the most important things to realize is, you know, as you play with all these different programming languages, is that, you know, you learn one language as a starting point, yep. and that can take you so many different places. Yeah. The principles we're going to see today in Python, you know, someday you're going to introduce, may explore another programming language for web, and you're going to see similarities to what we see here today. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in any event, uh, I guess I should introduce myself. I think so. Uh, I am uh, Christopher Harrison. I'm a uh, content developer uh, here at, uh, at Microsoft, focused mostly on uh, ASP.NET, although that's now expanding into uh, an ever-broadening range of, uh, of web technologies, um, and uh, Office 65. I was uh, an MCT for uh, 15 years. I guess I still am, uh, but not a, a full-time uh, MCT like I was. Uh, and I got started with a, with a Commodore 64. And I actually wrote a blog post on this blog post on this uh, in a, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, where I talked about the fact that the uh, first main program that I punched in, it was uh, from a copy of uh, an old magazine called Byte. And uh, it was a clone of a popular game. And instead of being able to just type out print, you had to put in the question mark because otherwise you would run out of memory. Yes. So yeah, so quite a little while. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, you can find me out uh, spending time with uh, my wonderful wife, four-legged child, and uh, running more miles than most people would consider normal, I think. Yeah. yeah. Good on yeah. you. So you do the same, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, hit our agenda for the day. So what we're going to start with is uh, actually an introduction to both Flask as well as HTML. Uh, so if you haven't played around with Flask, not exactly sure why we chose Flask, what this is all about, we're going to get into that in uh, Module 1. And then we'll also discuss a little bit of HTML. Um, I am going to say right away, though, that if uh, you're trying to use this to learn HTML, this is really not the best spot, but we'll talk about some resources where you can go get that. Right. Because Flask is what's going to allow is one of the ways you can take Python onto the web. Exactly. So that's where the connection between the Python and Flask comes in. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And there's actually other alternatives um, that, that you could use as well. There's Bottle. There's Django. Um, we went with Flask. We'll actually talk about why mm -hmm. uh, we went with uh, with Flask uh, in a in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, we'll uh, go ahead and actually take a look at getting in and uh, creating web pages. And uh, that's going to be our terminal terminology warning section, um, because that's really where we're going to get into how those requests are going to be mapped and how we're going to control what code is going to get executed uh, behind the scenes. And then all of that is really kind of the appetizer to the main event, uh, the first of two main events, uh, which is going to be module three, where we'll actually build the structure of our little trivia app that we're going to be using for uh, for our demos. And that's going to be the front end. So that's going to be uh, the ability to ask the questions and, and answer them later on, add questions and answer them later on. But what we're going to see is we're going to want somewhere to actually store those. And that will roll us right on into modules four and five, five being the second main event. Right. Um, where, where I'm going to go yeah. into the back end of things. Mm -hmm. Because when one of the things we're going to see as we get into the websites is the fact that when you're building web applications, you have to think about what is the user seeing and how do we communicate with the user, as well as when they give us information, how do we store that information and mm -hmm. how do we retrieve information uh, on a server side? So I'm going to be talking about the, the Redis aspect and different ways that you can store data so that you can remember what's happening between calls. Absolutely. And then finally, last but not least, we'll have done all this 
work here locally. Wouldn't it be nice to share this with all of our wonderful viewers and our friends? Well, exactly, because by default, if I sit here on my computer building a website um, and I'm running my website and testing my website, it's only available on my machine. You know, I, I noticed a common phrase throughout all of it. You kept saying website, website, website. Um, I'm thinking we should probably get that onto the, um, wait, wait, it'll come to me. Oh, uh, we should get that onto the web. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Hey. So exactly. <laughs> so one of the, le so of course we're gonna finish off with saying, hey, now that we built something cool, how do we share that and put it out there onto the great world of the internet, onto the web, so others can see it. Absolutely. And that's where we'll, uh, we'll close everything off, is actually uh, taking that, putting that out there, and you'll actually be able to see all of our work. And if you've been uh, following along at home, you'll even actually be able to get in and, uh, and deploy that out as, uh, as well. Fantastic. Now, now that we've talked a little bit about us and what we're going to talk about, let's talk about you. Um, and let's kind of um, uh, set where it is that, uh, that we're aiming this. And uh, what we're looking for is really, you know, new Python developers that are looking to take that next step. So if you checked out our Introduction to Programming with Python, which is a, a two-day event, lots of great content, um, and uh, you may even get a toaster. Uh, that's right. Yeah, you'll have to check that out to find that out. Um, but if uh, you followed along with that, this is really designed to be the uh, the next step from there. Um, and then also uh, burgeoning web developers. So if you're just kind of trying to check things out. Um, but I would also mention that if you've done web forms, if you've done MVC, and you're really just trying to see how things are in other environments. Yeah, just um, because you do hear a lot about Python these days. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe you've been developing in .NET for web, and you're curious to just explore Python web development. Yep. This will be a reasonable course to take you down that path as well. You may be familiar with some of the concepts, because as yep. we mentioned earlier, concepts tend to be the same from language to language. But we will show you things like the routing and so on for, for Flask and Python and that sort of architecture. Absolutely. And I would, I would say, kind of going back to uh, a point that you had made earlier about uh, you know programming languages having a lot of similar concepts, is that if you've already done uh, C Sharp or, or VB, a lot of what we're going to be seeing in, um, uh, in Python is going to be relatively uh, similar to what you've seen before, and so you'd probably be able to still follow along uh, just fine, even if you haven't necessarily done, uh, done Python. So if you've done another programming language, um, you can definitely uh, check that out. All right. Or check this out. Um, last little thing is, uh, of course, you can go off and get your uh, 50 points. Um, I still, you know, I say this every single time. Um, I do need to uh, update that um, because it's actually now 2.5 million uh, registered uh, users. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there's your uh, little voucher code. And uh, I would also mention that it's on uh, the FAQ page as well, yes. which is where you're also going to find our, uh, our slides. Now, before we launch into module one, mm -hmm. I do need to mention one last thing. Um, and this is actually brand new. This is the first uh, live MVA jumpstart that's going to have closed captioning. Uh, right now, it's closed captioning for English. Uh, but we do have closed captioning that you should notice on the uh, on the video stream. And I'm not sure which I'm, side of the I'm, stream I'm seeing, I'm I'm seeing comments okay. about the closed yeah. captioning. So, so it it's, it, it's, it, there's a button like right about there somewhere. I think it's on. It's either on this side or it's on that side. I don't know which side of the stream <laughs> I actually we don't, we don't see the closed captioning. Yeah, we caption. don't see us. Uh, but in any event, um, you will notice there's a little spot right down there that will say captions, and then you can turn that on or, uh, or turn that off and actually see live closed captioning, which again, this is the first uh, MVA jumpstart doing hey, that, which I think is, cool. uh, is pretty slick. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Okay. What do you say we talk about Flask? Yeah, I think that's enough intro. <laughs> let's let's get into the uh, let's get into the meat of this. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead and introduce Flask. Uh, introduce Flask. He said in English. So what we want to start off with is really just kind of some some level setting here. So what is a web application? You know, kind of start there. And then what is Flask? Why did we go with Flask? And how do we actually get in, get started, and do that, as we've learned before, that Hello World application? Yes. And then we're going to close it all off with a primer on HTML. And the main goal with uh, the HTML primer is just to make sure that if you follow along, along with course one, and maybe you haven't done HTML, that you're now going to see enough to know what's coming uh, with, uh, with HTML and how HTML works. Cool. Oh, wow. Actually, I've uh, just been updated. The closed captions are available in, uh, in 12 languages. Wow. The, the live ones? Wow. I thought they were just English. Huh. Fantastic. That really cool. Wow. That's awesome. Cool. All righty. 
So with that, well, I now I'm really curious how they translated my hello, good evening in Italian、uh, got translated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they、All、translated、right. that back to English. Maybe they did.、Um, okay. In any event,、um, yes, you can expect corny jokes throughout the day. Um, let's go ahead and talk about what a web application is. And、uh, so I pulled this from Wikipedia because, of course, when you're trying to figure something out, where do you go? You you go ask the internet. Yeah, and, yeah. And that will invariably lead you to Wikipedia. So it's a web application, or、uh, I'm sorry, a web application or web app. Is any software that runs in a web browser? It is created in a browser-supported programming language, such as the combination of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and relies on a web browser to render the application. That. Clarifies everything, I、uh, think. It clears everything up for me. Absolutely.、Yeah. Don't you love it when you get a definition like that? You're like, we're going to teach you Python and Flask, and there is a description that doesn't use either of those words. But、yeah. don't worry, it will all make sense. We are going to. So bring let's it all let's translate that into English. Yeah, exactly. So what we're going to really wind up having with any web application is two main moving parts that we're going to have a client and we're going to have a server. Now the server, and and I always like that restaurant、uh, analogy when we're talking about client and server. That when I walk into a restaurant and I sit down at the table, I'm now a client. I'm going to make requests of a server. The server or waiter, waitress, whatever term it is that you want to use there, is then going to take my order, run back into the kitchen, have somebody cook it for me, and then bring that food back out to me. Okay. And so that really is that client server. So I'm the one making the requests. I'm looking for whatever it is, and the server is going to go off and do something behind the scenes. And so, in our little case with our trivia app, it's going to be that we're looking to create a brand new trivia question、yep. or ask a trivia question. But we could go further into maybe looking up restaurant reviews,、uh, maybe posting different updates on fill in your favorite social network here, etc. All of those different things are web applications, and again, they have those two same moving parts: that there's a server and there's a client. Now we're going to focus mostly in on the server side today, and you are going to notice that there's a lot of different technologies that we can use to create the server side of a web application. That we could use MVC. Uh huh. We could use PHP. Yep. We could use Node. Yep. Or of course we could use Python and Flask, which is what we're here to talk about. Right. I didn't really bother putting that up on on the slide. Yeah. But that. Now, but, but so Python Flask falls into that server category. Exactly. Yeah. That if, if I yeah we'll go with、uh, there we go. Python and Flask.、There、that's that's really important because the the client side is really important to realize when you're when you open up something like Internet Explorer, which is where we go to do our client stuff. It doesn't Internet Explorer doesn't understand Python. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so you'll notice that regardless of what that server side technology is, it's still going to work with your browser. And the reason for that is because what you're going to send out the door is markup and other languages. That the browser can understand. So every browser is going to understand HTML. Every browser is going to understand JavaScript. Every browser is going to understand CSS. And this is a big question that I get from a lot of people who are brand new into、uh, web development. Is they'll go,、oh, okay, well I'm going to do let's say MVC. So Microsoft. MVC. I'm going to do MVC. Well, wait a minute. Does that mean that's only going to work with Internet Explorer? And the answer is no, because you're going to always send down HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which are things that every single browser is going to be able to understand. So the app that we're going to build today with Python and Flask is going to work in IE. It's going to work in Chrome. It's going to work in Firefox. It's going to、yep. work in Opera. It's going to work in whatever what, browser gets invented. I, 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 exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The, yeah. the key thing is whatever server technology you use, and we're going to be coding in Python Flask as our server.、Um, the code it finally sends out to the person sitting at the browser. Is always going to be HTML, CSS. Now a lot of that's done for you. You don't have to sit there going, "Oh my gosh, do I have to write every little thing myself?" <laughs> so we're going to be focusing on Python Flask. Though,、yep. if you're going to get into more advanced web development, you probably will want to learn some HTML, CSS, JavaScript. That's a good next step for you if you're new to web development.、Absolutely. But we're going to get you started with minimal HTML. Yeah.、Uh, we're going to do a little bit of HTML, but just with the Python that you know how to use, we're going to be able to get some websites built. Yep. Exactly. Now, the last thing to point out here is that there might be other components behind the scenes. Because let's think about, you know, an e-commerce site. And so I go into that e-commerce site and I say, hey, I want to place an order. So these are these are websites where I go and order books and things.
things it, online. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of other components because after all, when I go in and I say, well, I want that book, you know, they need to send a signal out to uh, the warehouse. They need to send a signal out to the shipper who's actually going to get it to my house. So there might be a lot of other things that are going on uh, behind the scenes. And I was just kind of like to point that out, that it might not just be your little app, that you might be incorporating services from, uh, uh, from elsewhere um, and bringing all of that in. Cool. Well, then, what's Flask? Yeah, how does Flask fit into this big picture of, okay, so there's the client, there's the server, there may be a database storing some information? Exactly, yeah. So well, as it turns cleared up. out, yeah, yeah, it turns out Flask is a micro framework uh, for Python based on uh, WorkZig. Verzug. Forgive me if we're mispronouncing that. Uh, Jinja 2 and Good Intentions. <laughs> I, I, I like the Good Intentions at the, uh, uh, at the back end there. Okay, well, let's try to clarify that um, a little bit here. So Flask defined. Well, Flask is a, a very lightweight framework. And this is one of the biggest reasons why we chose this technology over a couple of the other ones that are out there for Python as the next step. Because it does what it needs to do and nothing else. That one of the things that I always have a problem with when I'm trying to learn a new technology is sometimes just the, the entry point requires such a, a steep learning curve that it just turns me off to the whole thing, that there's just so many different moving parts and there's just so much that is just dropped onto you. You're just going, it's intimidating. Yeah. Where do I start? I, I, so I need to learn this and this and this and this. And that's one big reason why we chose Flask is it's, it, it's very straightforward that there, it doesn't do a whole lot. You can get it to do a whole lot. But out of the box, it doesn't do a whole lot. It's very lightweight. And everything as we're going to see is going to be based on components. So out of the box, it does just a little bit. And then there's going to be components. So for example, if you want to call those services, yep. if you want to do templating, mm -hmm. and, and Susan's going to be very happy about this, if you want to do databases, you can, you, can, you can add it in, yeah. But you, exactly. start off, you start off with basically, hey, I want to display web pages, yep. I want to do a little code, then go back to another web page, you start off with that, and then you add the extra pieces as you're ready for them. Exactly, as you need. So that way you can focus in on, oh, okay, this is all I need to get started, start building up some strength there, and then go to the, uh, the more advanced topics. All right. So the basic features here are the fact that it is based on Python, which is a nice... Um, uh, entry-level language, very flexible, and it is also open source. So you can use this to build whatever it is that you might want. So why did we choose Flask? Well, it was for all of those reasons. It's unobtrusive, it doesn't get in your way, that nice low entry point, and it's also a great place to learn concepts. And, and one thing that we want to stress here is because we always, it's always one of those trade-offs when, whenever you're teaching something is, you know, how real world do, do you want to get, especially at the entry level, because a full real world application is going to have a lot of moving parts and it's going to take quite a little while to develop. We're going to be going with a relatively simple um, application here, but you can absolutely 100% use Flask to create full-blown real-world applications. Now, you very well might find after a while, as your application starts to grow, that maybe you start to outgrow Flask as well. Eh, absolutely. But I don't want you to leave here thinking, okay, well, the only thing that I've learned with Flask is just the ability to create a very simple little application. You can absolutely use this to create much bigger applications create enterprise apps, 100%. All right. Well, let's actually get in yeah. and, and, and yeah, get started let's, here. Let's start looking at code. Yeah. Take us time. Exactly. Exactly. So what we're going to need is our different components. We're going to need to talk about environments. We're going to need to talk about the Visual Studio templates. And then we'll do Hello Flask. So I yes. promise we're going to get to code. OK. Promise good. You. Awesome. Looking All forward right. to it. OK. So a um, couple of things that you're going to need. Um, as it turns out, there's a lot of tools that you could use to write Python code. That's right. There's, you can get stuff for different machines. If you're working on a Mac, you can absolutely down soft, download software that will allow you to develop on the Mac. Yep. But we're going to be using uh, Visual Studio. And what you do is you have to install Visual Studio. And within it, you'll need an add-on to allow you to do Python coding called Python Tools for Visual Studio. Yep. So step one, install Visual Studio. Step two, install the Python tools for Visual Studio. Um, you can get Visual Studio for free. Uh, the, you can get that Visual Studio 2013 Community Edition. Please do make sure you have the most recent updates applied. 
And then last, you're going to need to install an interpreter. That's going to allow you to execute your Python code. So if you go down to pytools.coplex.com, that website you can find, uh, if you go to the documentation tab, you can see all those installation instructions, the links to mm -hmm. all those tools for you. So that one URL is really useful if you haven't set up your environment yet you're going to want to do that. Yeah, right up at the top of that, that page, you'll actually see um, a little link that will say installation instructions. Just click on that, and it will walk you through uh, the uh, the whole thing. The one that I do want to highlight here is that Python interpreter, um, that the tools themselves just plug into Visual Studio, but they don't give you the Python interpreter. Which allows you to actually run your Python code. <laughs> exactly, which you're probably going to want to do if yeah. you write all of that code. Um, so do make sure that, uh, that you install that. Um, otherwise, you're going to wind up running into... Uh, uh, into a couple of problems. Okay, now we've already highlighted the fact that Flask needs extensions, needs yes. components, needs packages, whatever word it is that you want to use you there. You need to add stuff to Flask. Exactly, you need to add stuff. Yeah, we'll just go with stuff. I like it. So you need to add stuff. So that stuff must be installed. Right. So the question is where? Well, as it turns out, you can install this into one of two spots. You can install this into the entire system, which is going to make this globally available. But the problem with doing that is sort of twofold. That number one, it's now going to be globally available, and maybe you don't actually want that. But also number two is a lot of the different add-ons that you're going to get are going to be parts of different open source projects. And so they're going to be updated at different times and at uh, different speeds. And anybody who's ever done an update knows that sometimes you'll update one component over here and then all of a sudden this one breaks. Yeah. So having the ability... You, <laughs> I, know where, I know where you're coming from on this one, absolutely. There's nothing worse than you've got two projects up and running, and they're both working, and then somebody makes an update to something, Yep. and you can only handle an update in one of the two projects. Exactly. So it's, it's really wonderful to have this option yeah. of not saying, let's install, because I might need version 2 here, I might need version 3 here. Mm -hmm. So when you install it globally, you're stuck with the same version for everything. Exactly. Maybe I want version 2 now, but for this project over here, I want version 3. Yep. Yeah, so I would say as a best practice, install that into your local environment then. And you'll actually notice that Visual Studio will give you that option, that it will ask you, okay, well, where do you want to install this? Do you want to install this into um, uh, System Python, or uh, do you want to install this into the local environment? It will give you the ability to create a brand new local environment. And there's my little, here, wait, wait, I need to back this up. I, I worked hours on this animation. Are you ready? Okay, let's see. Oh, look wow. at that. Woo. Uh, wow, you've got it. You got like an expanding box. Yeah, here. I know. You're going to be know. doing a PowerPoint MVA next, I yes, can tell. Yes, exactly. No, nobody wants to see that. Um, <laughs> in any event, um, really, uh, install that into, uh, into your local environment. And now let's actually get in and let's do a demo. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me bail out of my slides here and let me open up Visual Studio. And it is worth noting here that uh, in the background, we've already installed uh, the tools that we need. So we'll, we're just gonna be able to fire up Visual Studio and away we go. Um, and I also wanna highlight, um, let's do this. Doo -doo 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 -doo. I want, well, I didn't get it in private, but that's okay, that's just what came up. HP colon, whack, whack, um, github.com, uh, Geek Trainer, uh, and Flask. That was what I called it. So one of the things that we did um, over the last uh, couple of days here um, is we went in and started setting everything up for the demos that we're going to be doing. So you'll actually notice right here, the one that I'm circling down at the very bottom there, that trivia, that's the actual final, hey, we're done. We've also got, this is what it's going to look like after module two. This is what it's going to look like after Module 3. This is what it's going to look like after Module 5. So if you want to go download that and use that to follow along, so that way you don't have to type furiously, you can do that. I'll put the URL back up in one second. But what I want to highlight right here is this download zip. So that way, if you don't want to um, mess around with maybe doing this inside of Visual Studio and connecting to the project and so forth, maybe you haven't done that, just download zip. And then away you go from there. I would mention, however, um, that there is the ability. I c apparently can't talk and type at the same time. Usually I can. Um, Geek Trainer, um, WAC, uh, Flask. There we go. Um, this right here, 
is the uh, is the URL. I will mention that Visual Studio has the ability to pull this down for you, and there is of course an MVA on Visual Studio and GitHub that's yeah. uh, that's worth checking out. So it's actually just called Visual Studio and Git, okay, rather than GitHub. Yeah. So, cool. But, so, uh, but yeah. yeah. So we actually had just had a question in the Q and A window asking, "Hey, where can I get the demo code?" So there you go. GitHub.com/slash/geektrainer/slash/flask. Just pick that download zip file, and you've got your own copy. There we go. We'll put it up one last time there. And I put it into the Q and A window as well. So. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You're probably just going to want to keep that on copy and paste. I expect that yeah. people asking. <laughs> it's been that. known to come up again. Yes. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. So uh, there is that, but let me go into uh, Visual Studio here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a uh, brand new project here. So I'm going to say File, New, and uh, Project. And then you're going to notice that I, of course, have, because I've installed the tools, Python, Web, and then there are all of the different web options that, uh, that are available to me. Now, um, as we mentioned, you'll notice Bottle Django. Yep. We're not going to be using we're, those, we're using Flask. We're we've using Flask. Flask. Yep. So we've got Flask here. And then um, I'm actually going to sort of sidestep for two seconds, I, only just because I, I always feel the, the, the need to point this out. Um, a lot of times, you know, people hear Azure and they think Microsoft. Okay, well, that's good. Um, and then they think, oh, well, then I have to do that with C Sharp. As a matter of fact, you don't. Nope. So if you want to program your cloud services using Python, Python, you absolutely can, 100%. Yep. Okay. Now, you're going to notice that we've got one, two, three, three Flask projects. Ah, 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 ah. And you might be wondering, which one should you choose? Should you go with Flask Web Project? Should you go with Flask Jade? Or should you go with the blank uh, Flask Web Project? Here's the difference between them. So, first of all, the difference between one and two is that the Flask Jade is going to use Jade as its templating engine as opposed to Jinja. We're going to be using the Jinja one, so we're not going to go with that one, but that's the difference between those two. But the main thing about the one and two up there is that they're both built. That was weird. There we go. Huh. It's not letting me type on my screen. Try again. There we go. That was weird. Um, in any event, they both use what's known as Bootstrap. Now, Bootstrap is wonderful. There's an MVA on there. Just go to MVA MS. You'll notice if you just search Bootstrap, you'll find the one that John Galloway and I did. We're more than happy to walk you through all of Bootstrap. But Bootstrap is a perfect example of what we were talking about before. Um, it's going to throw a whole bunch at you that you now kind of need to figure out before you can start writing your code. And again, that steep learning curve, we want to avoid that. Yeah, we want to, we want to get started. We want to have our, our first website up without a massive learning curve. Exactly. And so I do love Bootstrap, and Bootstrap, once you learn it, will make your life so much easier. Yeah, but it's a good next step. Exactly. Yeah, we want to keep it nice and easy. So we're just going to go with our, our blank um, uh, Flask project here. The other big advantage of using the blank one is so many people will ask, Okay, well, wait a minute. I went with this, this template, and it threw a whole bunch of stuff in there. And I know it works, but I don't know how it works. Yeah, I've, I've had that happen before where I, I create, open, create the default project, and then I, I run the default project, and it's got like five pages I'm navigating around, and, and then I get lost of what code is where. Exactly. And so I always find it nice when I'm trying to learn to just start with a clean slate. So is this going to mean more work for me? Absolutely, mm -hmm. because I'm just trying to learn. Um, am I probably going to, in the future, go with option one there, that Flask Web Project? Absolutely, but let me start here. Let because, me, yeah, yeah, because when I'm getting started, I'll actually understand everything that's in there. Exactly, exactly. All right, so let's go in and let's call this um, Trivia um, MVA. So this will be the one that we'll be okay. building sort of as, as we go along here. Um, and I've got my little Python Flask. Uh, the solution name is just fine. And let me hit OK. But, but wait, we're not doing Hello World? Well, we'll do Hello World. I'm just not going to call okay. it Hello World. All right. All right. OK. Now, this is what I was talking about before is um, you'll notice that it says, hey, look, this requires external packages. We need to install them. Now, here's the great part. You do have to be internet connected. But this will automatically download them for us. 
So we don't actually have to go out and manually download and, you know, unzip them. And or, we don't or, have to know which ones. Exactly. I really, I love the fact it says, you need some packages. Would you like me to get them for you? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> don't make me figure it out. Absolutely. So it's just going to go off and grab them, but it just needs to know where to put them. And so you'll notice right here that it will say um, into a virtual environment or into um, Python 3.4. Um, and remember, that this is going to be shared by all projects. So, so that was that system option you were talking about. That's that system global option you mentioned earlier? That's exactly it. And then that virtual environment, that's going to be the private one just for here. And that was the one you were recommending. Visual Studio even recommends. Even Visual Studio <laughs> recommends. We all agree on this. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, the one thing that I do want to highlight, um, if you remember back to the installation uh, steps that we talked about a couple minutes ago, um, and I said, hey, look, you're also going to need the Python interpreter. If you forget to install it, this is where it's going to fail out, is right here, that it won't create that virtual environment. Because in order to create that virtual environment, it needs Python. So this is where it's going to fail out if it, uh, if it doesn't have it. OK, so with that, I'm now going to say um, install into a uh, virtual environment. It's now going to say, all right, well, what do you want to name it? ENVS convention, who am I to argue? It's going to ask me what um, uh, version we want. We only have 3.4. And I'm just simply going to click Create. And then with blinding speed and amazing accuracy, it will go off and pull down all of the different packages that we are going to need. And just kind of chugga, chugga, chugga. Move your mouse, makes it go faster. Or it makes me feel better. One or the other. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just answering a question. Oh, no, carry on. <laughs> I am also kind of doing a little dance in the background here. That's not your usual slide dance. I'm, I was well, waiting yeah. for the slide dance. Well, hey, so you're on camera now. I, so I am on camera. Slide. Yeah, but it wasn't the slide dance. It was the, it was the moving mouse dance. Uh, so, I've always yeah. wanted a little crank on the side of my computer just so it would make me feel better. So when I'm waiting, <laughs> I could turn a little crank, and then I wouldn't be able to tell myself I'm helping the computer go faster. <laughs> Bring back the turbo button. You yes. know it makes sense. OK. So let's take a look at, uh, at what we've got here. Now, first of all, it did create um, this little app pi file, and, and I'm going to get to that. Um, but I'm going to get to it in a minute. That what I want to start off with is you're going to notice over here that we've got our Python environment. There's our little env that we just created. And then you'll notice that we've got Flask, It's Dangerous, Ginger 2, Markup Safe, PIP, Setup Tools, and the uh, WorkZig down at the very bottom. So, Visual Studio automatically went out and downloaded all of those for me. Nice. Now, here's the thing. I need those here on my computer when I'm doing Flask development. But these packages are global. They're universal. Everybody knows, or Visual Studio knows, and that's really, I guess, the important part, knows that these packages are needed. So let's say that what we're eventually going to do like we've already done, is we're going to take this project and we're going to push this up into GitHub, which we did. Yep. Well, we don't need these packages in GitHub because they're the exact same packages for everybody. So right. there's no reason to keep uploading them into GitHub. Yeah, because we just want to share the code we wrote. Exactly. Exactly. So the problem then becomes, well, let's say, like maybe some of our viewers have done, is somebody's gone out and they've pulled down the project. And they're maybe seeing a little bang next to that Python environment, and they're trying to figure out, OK, well, wait a minute. This isn't working. What's wrong? Well, here's what's cool. I love this feature. Because it's true, right? You know, yep. And you guys will run into that, actually, if you go and get our demo code. Mm -hmm. If you go to take our demo code, take that zip code, and try and open it up in Visual Studio, you're going to get the source code, but you're going to see that that environment's going to be empty. It's exactly. not going to have the pieces. Because the environment pieces were not uploaded. Now, you're going to show them a trick. Exactly. Now, there's a little requirements text file. And on this little requirements text file, it's going to list off all of the different packages that we have grabbed. Now, you'll notice the only one in here is Flask. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, Christopher. I'm no math major, but I noticed there's only one there, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven items over there, and I'm pretty sure that seven isn't equal to one. Mm -hmm. Here's what's cool is, <laughs> hey, you know? <laughs> seven, one, it's close, easily mixed up. I forgot to tell you there was going to be math today. Um, no. Um, but in any event, uh, what you're going to notice is that all that we had the entry for was just flash. Well. When you say, I want Flask, Flask, up on the little Python servers, 
is built to say, all right, well, if you're going to do Flask, you're also going to need It's Dangerous, Ginger 2, Markup Safe, PIP, Setup Tools, and WorkSafe. It's, so it's, it no. So all those environments that are listed there, it all those Visual packages. Studio knows when yep. you ask for Flask, those are the packages you need. Exactly. Yeah, because when it grabs Flask, it's going to bust that open, and and Flask is going to say, well, I also have these requirements. So I also need you to go grab this one, this one, this one, and this one. So that's exactly what we've got going on here. Now, you're going to have the requirements text file from GitHub. You're not going to have the environment. Now you may notice the little bang on it, and I, I personally find the easiest thing to do, just hit delete and delete on the environment. Ah! So this is kind of what it would have looked like if I'd taken the code from GitHub and just opened it up, sort of, except Similar. I'd see an environment with only one yeah, little Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so just delete that environment. Okay. And then what you're going to notice is that I'm going to right click here on Python environments and I'm going to say add virtual environment. So I'm putting a new environment back in. Exactly. And then right down here, so you'll notice it's the exact same screen that we saw before. Yeah. But I want to highlight that little text right there. Ah, uh, look at that. It found a requirements text file. So all I have to do is just simply hit create. And it and says, get a sip of coffee. So basically, it says it's going to look at the requirements.txt file. From mm -hmm. that, it's going to add the necessary components to your virtual environment. And now you're off and running. Exactly. While you're sipping on coffee. Nice. Yep. Or water for me. Okay. I need coffee. Okay. I'm this, I'm this loud and, and jumpy without coffee. You don't want me with coffee. <laughs> True story. All right. <laughs> Susan on caffeine and before people doing closed captioning would, would uh, yeah. they just lose it. They wouldn't be able to keep up. Fingers flying everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, so what you're going to notice here is uh, it's now recreated that environment for me. So that's, that's what you're going to want to do. So that's kind of the, the basic steps there. Now, let's go ahead and, and focus in on, on our code now. And so what this automatically did was it created an app.py file, which is, by convention, the entry point to our application. Yeah. And so what you're going to notice is there's a triple quote comment here. And this is for those of you who took the Introduction to Python course with us. We used a different convention for comments. The person who made this template chose to use a triple quote, quote convention for comments. Yeah, and it's honestly, it's, it's a little hacky. I'm not a fan yeah, of it. Yeah, I prefer the other one. Yeah. But anyway, it is yeah, what it is. It's, it's a comment. Yeah. Okay. It's a comment. Yep, exactly. So what it's saying is it's saying, hey, look, this is going to be you know, what's going to host your development server. Um, it contains the definition of roots and views for the application. Okay, cool. Then you're going to notice this little line here from Flask import. Flask. Right. Import we use to access code in libraries. Exactly. So you'll notice from Flask, so Flask is the name of the package. What do we want? We want Flask. So this allows us to access the Flask code. Exactly. This little part right here is going to create our application. This underscore underscore name is just hard coded in to just grab the, uh, the name of the server. Don't worry at all about that. This is one of those things where you can just treat a tad amount to magic. It's just, it's one of those things. It just, it needs to be there. Okay. So this falls into the category of, you know what, this is going to be created for you. Don't mess with those two lines exactly. of code. Exactly. Yep. Leave those two alone. And while we're at it, go ahead and leave that line alone as well. Um, and that's just simply going to create a little interface that again is just going to help serve up our pages. So, so really our code please, starts here. Yeah. yeah. We'll just. <laughs> Do not touch. touch. There we go. I like that. And our code goes down and later. Do not touch. Yep. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. Our code. Yes. So now we get to the part where we're where we're really interested in exactly. playing around. Yep. Yeah. Happy faces are uh, are optional there. So, okay. Now, what you're going to notice down below here is this little thing called app route or root route. Yep. Root. Um, I'll probably bounce back and forth between the two pronunciations. And then you'll notice uh, a little single quote, forward slash single quote, which of course is a string, and a forward slash. Now we're going to get into routes in the next module. So for right. right now, you can treat this tad amount to magic. But what this is basically going to say, and, and you know, one of the conventions that a lot of people like to do is they like to actually put out what the URL is that this is going to represent, which in our case would be whatever the name of the server is, forward slash. Yep. And that's it. You do see that a lot. Exactly. And so, you know, you might go in a little bit later, and again, we'll, we'll talk about how to do this, and it might be maybe server and then question. Right. And then, you know, maybe um, server and then uh, create, or, you know, whatever it is that, that it happens A lot of times when you visit a restaurant website, there'll yeah. be a slash menu, yeah. uh, a slash directions. Exactly. Same sort of thing, right? Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. and slash is sort of the main restaurant page. 
Exactly, and we're going to see how to how to make all of that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do for right now is I'm just going to get rid of that comment because we don't need it. And um, Susan, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Okay. And I'm just going to circle or square, I guess, um, that one little spot right there. Just the blue section, just what's inside the blue. What is that? That is pure Python code. Okay. And that is Python code, but is creating a function called hello. And the function we're creating called hello returns a string that says hello world. So there is nothing that's special there. No, that is a standard Python function. That's just hello world. There's nothing extraordinary there. Nope. And this is the biggest point that I want to make in both this module as well as in the next module is, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, a little uh, uh, a little girl named Dorothy and, you know, she had the power all along to, to get home. You've actually had the power to build an awful lot with Flask by learning Python. So if you already took that first Python course, you already have a lot of the knowledge that if you know how to create Python, now it's just a matter of kind of figuring out, okay, well, what methods is this adding in? And what components is this adding in? And how do I work inside this environment? But the language is the same. So you're basically expanding your vocabulary, if I can just sort of beat that yeah, I like analogy that. into that, the ground. I like the idea of it's yeah. expanding your vocabulary. You're expanding your tools. So yeah. you're, you know, think of it as a toolbox. We're adding one more tool to the toolbox. Exactly. We got the Python tool, now we're adding the Flask tool. Yeah. And together that allows us to bring it to the website. Exactly, yeah. You're starting to learn all of those different uh, you know, colloquialisms and, and all of those different kind of cultural references that you know, when you're learning like a normal language, I could go off and I could learn French and all the, all the syntax on French and, and how to conjugate verbs, verbs and all of that good stuff. But if you drop me into the middle of France or you drop me into the middle of, of Montreal and expect me to speak, there's still going to be a lot more that, that I need to learn because I need to learn how to now work inside of that environment. So, you know, as people make different cultural references and, you know, say, for example, things like Bob Uncle or whatever the French equivalent of uh, that But my favorite, t'es dans les patates, one of my favorite, which means you're way out in the left field, uh, you know, middle of nowhere. It's a very or, Canadian or, French expression. Yeah, or, or you're way out in left field. Yeah. And, and again, you know, that's that's a very, you know, cultural So it's vocabulary, yes. Yeah, and, exactly. and the more you understand, the more you can communicate, the more you can do. So exactly. in this case, we're expanding what we can do by expanding our coding vocabulary. Exactly. But you still have the, the basic structure, that you still have that basic language. So you still know, how, you know, there, there's basic verbs and so forth. So now we're just expanding the, uh, the vocabulary there. Okay. So now that we've got that little part right there, and again, um, I know I haven't spent a lot of time on that line. We'll Don't, come back to it. We're going to come back to it. And then this line right here, or that little block, again, this is all server-side code. What this is actually doing is this is launching our server. Yeah. And what do you mean that's launching our server? Well, I'm, I'm so glad that you asked this. Um, I'm going to do this through the menuing system. This, by the way, will be the only time probably I'm going to do this through the menuing system. Um, I typically just go F5 or Control F5. But just to kind of show, I'm just going to start without debugging here. Okay. Now, what you're going to notice is I get a little thing saying the project's out of date. Okay, fine. And, all right, let's do two things here. First thing that I want to do is, since I created a new project, I have to change my color scheme here. Yeah, it's a little easier to read on the screen that way. Exactly. This right here, this is, this command line is our server. This is our server. That's, this our, is actually, that's the server that's running our code for us. Exactly. That you'll notice right here, if you want to get you know, kind of uber technical, it's actually making the little request using HTTP 1.1, and we had a, a 200 response. So there is our server. This is actually what's, what's running this. And in fact, you'll notice, if I close this out, by the way, you are going to notice there's Hello World. Let me. All right, OK, we've got our Hello World code yeah. running there. I like that. But you'll notice if I come back to here and I hit refresh, give it a second, you're going to notice that it's going to fail. Because I closed that server, that little command line was our server. And that was running our code. So when we stopped it running, then our website stopped working. Exactly. And so you'll also notice that we said, hello world. So let me just go in and update this. Let's say, for example, hello, Susan, just to prove there's nothing up my sleeves except for my arms. Thank you for laughing at that, Barry. Oh, you took a second. <laughs> What you're going to notice is that, sure enough, it now says, hello, Susan. Right. So whatever it is that we return back... Is what's displayed on the web page. That's pretty boring text, don't you think so, Susan? It, I mean, it's got your name. 
I know, but I think we could be able to dress it up a little bit. So we're not limited to just displaying text in terms of what we return. We can do something with it, right? Correct. Yeah. Web pages let's, usually look pretty fancy. You exactly. Know? Yeah. Let's, Different colors or bold and italics. Let's, let's get a little better. Yeah, exactly. And so what we're going to need for that, back to my slides here, da -da -da -da, with a, a flourish and everything, is our HTML primer. Yes. Now. Because as well as being able to return text, we can actually return HTML. Because really, when you get right down to it, HTML, just text. That's really it. Yeah, you know? and HTML is that one of those languages that browsers understand. Exactly. So that means when we return HTML to a browser, it can say, oh, I know how to display that. Exactly. So Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox, they understand Firefox. HTML. Firefox. Firefox. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. Maybe I should have had caffeine this morning. <laughs> you want some coffee? <laughs> no, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, so let's talk a little bit about um, about HTML and some basic uh, concepts here. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. Okay, cool. That's just what that's what it is. Okay. Yep. There we go. Um, so what this is is it's the standard markup for creating web pages, and it really consists of two main components, what are known as elements and attributes. Now, an element is going to consist of two tags: an open and a close where it's going to either describe or do something to what's inside of it. So in our little case right here, our little body, it's describing, hey, look, that's the body. That's what we're trying to the display main, out. The main part of our web page or exactly, whatever. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The body, it's like the body of a letter, the, you know, the body of the page, the body of the book, the main part. Exactly, exactly. And so you'll notice that all of our tags are going to be contained inside of angle brackets. Yep. Now. Those tags, because we always get asked this, case yep. sensitive, not case sensitive, just treat everything like it is case sensitive. Um, technically, HTML is case insensitive, but convention is always use lowercase letters. It's a good habit, also, because something I'll be talking about this afternoon. Yeah, exactly. Just, you know, it's one of those things you just want to get yourself into good habits right away. That, you know, whenever I'm teaching an intro to programming class, um, I, I, I spend, I, I swear, half the day, uh, if it's a full day, it's not like half of it, just going over good practices. Because you want to learn those skills right away um, because that's always what you're going to lean on later on. So, you know, learn, learn, learn good things. Now, let's talk a little bit about those closing tags. A lot of times you don't need them. Because what's going to happen, and sort of a long story, find me on Twitter and I'll, I'll explain the whole thing, but what's going to happen is the browser's always going to make a best effort. Yeah, it makes an educated guess. If you leave off a close tag, it says you probably meant to close that, and if it can figure it out, it'll just keep going. Exactly, and so the HTML doesn't need to be perfect. Yep, it's very forgiving. But, but try to keep it as good <laughs> as possible. It's going to aid the browser, but more importantly, it's going to aid the developer. And that's you. <laughs> it's going to make your life easier if you exactly. get in the habit of, yeah, just make everything lowercase, yep. close your tags. It'll be easier for you to read. It'll be easier for you to update later when you want to improve and make changes to your code. That's exactly it. Now, as a result, there are some tags like BR, which, by the way, stands for line break, which just simply means go to the next line. Yeah, it just gives you, uh, I yep. use that a lot when I'm building web pages. It just makes a blank line between Yep, exactly. Yeah, Between just two, just, two lines or two words. Go to the next line. So technically, you don't need to close them. It is still best practice to close it. And then the, um, uh, the cool kids, I've been told I'm not a cool kid, um, put a, a space forward slash angle bracket um, as the shortcut uh, to, uh, to close them. So if you've right. ever seen that, and, and we'll be seeing that a little bit later on today, that's what's happening. Is it's yeah. just the, the shortcut way. Yeah, because that to, forward uh, slash is always how we indicate the closing tag. So exactly. It, so sometimes yep. it literally is open, close, all in one yep. string. Exactly. Now, our elements are going to be grouped together in many types, and there are more elements here than I'm going to stop and list because we'd be here all of today and tomorrow and, and the day after that. And there and is a full course and, yeah, on exactly. HTML, so yeah. we're not going to try and do that. But we're going to give you enough to be able to start playing. Exactly, exactly. And so let's kind of break it down into three main categories here. We've got what are sometimes known as semantic tags, new to HTML5, and they're really just there to describe the data. So this is my header, this is my footer, this is the navigation section. Yeah, they help. They just help the, the programmer sort of understand the different parts of the page. Well, they, they, they also help um, search engines as well understand the parts of the page. Because when um, you know, Bing comes along and crawls your page, it needs to be able to quickly figure out what's on the page. And so if we just simply say, hey, look, this is bold, and actually I'm going to sort of skip to the end here. Um, if we just simply say something is bold, well, 
what do I know about it? I know it's bold, but that's all that I know. If I see it contained, however, inside a footer, now what do I know? Well, now I know that that's the footer of the page, and now I've got a little bit more of an understanding about what's going on there. So you are going to notice that there are those format tags, and you are going to notice that I'm going to use them today just to try and keep things a little bit simple. Um, but generally speaking, you want to avoid those, and instead you want to use um, CSS, you want to use style. Which um, we're not that, getting into which, today. Exactly. But said. So we're going to start you off with, oh, look, you can make change the way things look. Uh, when you start building full websites, you can probably want to use CSS to control the appearance of your web pages. Exactly. In terms of bold font, color, and so on. Yep, that's it. That's it. Yeah, you can actually do all sorts of cool things with yeah. CSS. There's an MVA for that. Um, and then, last but not least, is our controls. And again, we're going to see these a little bit later. Um, but this is where we can get things like links and buttons and, uh, and input tags yeah. as, uh, as well. That we will play with. Yeah, and that's just sort of like a, a, a real quick synopsis of some of the different things that are available to us. A standard HTML page is going to look like this. HTML. Oh, wow. You put HTML in your I HTML. I did. Um, Susan, cause a distraction. Cause a distraction. Yes. Uh, but I'll mention another neat thing about the header, footer, and uh, nav, those ones we use to sort of indicate the different sections of a web page. It's kind of cool. So those are also used by screen readers. Yes. Uh, so a lot of the tools that, if, for people who have low vision issues and uh, rely on those ones that speak to them, yep. uh, they actually use those header, footer, nav to help tell a person, hey, this is the header of the web page and the body of the web page as well. Absolutely true. Is yep. that a long enough distraction? That was perfect. Okay. So apparently when I was typing out this slide, I moved a little too fast. Um, you know, it's one of the nice things about having IntelliSense and it will automatically <laughs> fix these things for you. Um, I meant head there. Now, head and header are different. So this is not header, this is head. And inside of head, we can do um, different things like adding little um, things to the page, for example, metadata, or in this particular case, adding the title to the page. And we'll see where that's going to be used in a couple of minutes. And then finally, last but not least, is the uh, the body. And you'll notice inside the body that I've used a, uh, a div tag. And this div tag is sort of a generic helper tag that's going to indicate that whatever's contained inside of there, by default anyway, the next div tag will be on the next line, the next div tag will be on the next line, and so forth. So just kind of... So it just allows you to make the code line by line? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. In a nutshell, um, there's other things that could go along with the div tag, but for right now, that's, that's sort of perfect. The last little thing that I want to mention um, is, uh, is attributes. These are key value pairs. And they just allow us to add additional things to um, a particular tag. So for example, um, an A tag or anchor tag, which is going to create a link. So if you clicked on this, where is it going to go? www.microsoft.com. We use those a lot on web pages. This is how you move from page A to page B to page C. This is hypertext. Yes. See, little link. There we go. Cool. Let's go in and, and kind of take a look at a demo here. Yeah, time let's, for some code. Yeah, let's, let's spice up. Our, uh, our little page here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to kind of build out the whole thing is let's say HTML. Uh-huh. Let's say head. So now you're actually typing in action. So instead of just a string you're returning now, you're actually returning HTML. But that's OK, because we know that the client, the browser, Internet Explorer or Chrome or Firefox, yep. understands HTML. So it knows how to read this text and display it as per the rules of HTML. Oh, and you're using H1, which is header one. Thank and that's, you. That's a, that's a tag that HTML understands to display it as a, a, a primary header. So it has sort of default ways to display things with H1. But it basically is a header. OK. Now, what I'm going to do here. Um, and and I'm, you're getting a high five if you manage to do this without a single typo. <laughs> Well, fortunately, I kept it very easy for myself. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, open and close angle brackets, though. So uh. <laughs> It certainly is. Um, OK. And I'm just going to try and format this. Uh, and, uh, and I see you're trying to keep everything lowercase on your tags. Yeah. And you, I can see you're closing tags. So you've opened header, and then you closed the header. You open title, you close title. And you can see how they're nested inside each other as well. That's very common inside HTML. Yep. Yeah. OK. Um, and uh, our, our lineup is, is, is going to be OK. This will uh, work. OK. Um, so anyway, so what I want you to notice here um, is simply the fact that I built out this full HTML. And HTML, at the end of the day, is just text. That's, that's really it. And so it is going to be returned back as HTML. But you know, again, it's just simply text. Still a string. Exactly. And so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to Control F5 here. I'm going to launch this. 
And so now you're going to notice, first of all, hello, Susan. I feel special all of a sudden here. All yeah. right. Oh, hi. Yeah. So you'll know. <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> and you're also going to notice, by the way, that there is hello world there. Is that what the title tag did? I'm so glad you asked that. As a matter of fact, that is exactly what that title tag did. And then you're also going to notice, and um, you can right-click and hit uh, view source. Um, I always go Alt-V, C, um, which will do it. Um, but, you know, nobody ever uh, um, I did a new shortcut for me. So. Oh, so there you can actually see the HTML code that we exactly. sent back to the browser. Exactly. Yeah. Now, obviously we could keep doing this, but we probably... Then it would be an HTML course. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> I, well, I would say two things. That, A, yeah, it would be an HTML course. And actually, slide, slide, slide. Um, there we go. Yeah, if you're wanting to get more in HTML, um, there's an MVA course on it. Uh, Bob Tabor, the HTML5, CSS3 Fundamentals. Um, great course to go check out. Um, you'll also notice the 20480, full five-day course taught by um, Microsoft Certified Trainers. And hey, we were both Microsoft Certified. We, we, we still are. We still are. We still he, are. Yep. So yep. there's lots of material out there to help you get started with HTML5. So you can, that's the set. Once you've you know, mastered sort of the Python and Flask components, now you're seeing how the HTML affects the output. Those are some great resources for the next steps. Absolutely. Okay. So what did we learn? So, we learned how to manage Python environments. Right. Setting up environments, installing the different packages. We learned how to get started using Flask and Python. Yep. Even which project type to use. But it sort of begs the question, what in the world can we do with this? <laughs> well, for right now, we just built a foundation. Yeah. So now what we can do is we can use this to begin pursuing deeper knowledge. And you know what? That's exactly what we're going to do after a 10-minute break, because I don't know about you, but I could use a break. I, I think maybe I need some <laughs> caffeine. All right. <laughs> we'll see you guys back here in 10. Okay, well, uh, welcome back uh, to introducing, or introduction to, uh, creating websites using Python and Flask. Alongside Susan Iback, I am uh, Christopher Harrison. And uh, I actually want to go back to one big thing that we pointed out in uh, Module 1, yep. um, because there's been a couple of questions about this inside of the Q&A. The people have gone out to GitHub, they downloaded the project, they tried to launch it, and they're going, hey, wait a minute. I got an error message. Yes. So let's go in and, and highlight this. Now, um, the first thing that I need to stress right away is um, make sure that you have downloaded and installed the Python tools for Visual Studio. Yep. And that you've installed a Python interpreter. All available at pytools.codeplex.com. Exactly. P Y T O O here. P Y T O O L S. <laughs> I'll put it in the QA window as well. Yeah, you know, just do that because unfortunately my, my typing on Zoom it um, seems to sort of come and so go. I, I'm, putting that, I'm putting that link right now into Perfect. the QA window. So if you haven't got the Python tools installed or you're not sure where to get the code yep. for the interpreter, it's all on the installation instructions there. Awesome. I love it. Now, this little um, project right here, you'll notice this is trivia for Module 5. And if you're just tuning in, we know it's still Module 2. Um, the reason that I went with this is because I pulled this down from GitHub this morning. So didn't already have it on my system, just pulled it down. And I want you to notice that's, generally speaking, when, when, when you see something that, that looks the, like this. The little warning symbol yeah, is. That's, that's sort of universal. <laughs> it, it means something's not right. <laughs> exactly. And so you'll notice that when I go to launch this. I get an error message. And the error message that you're going to get is going to vary a little bit depending on what's going on. In my case, it happens to be system cannot find the path specified. Mm -hmm. So again, what I need to do is I need to, and let me, there we go, um, recreate my environment. So I'm just going to right click on this, and I'm going to say remove. And we'll go ahead and remove that from the project. Which you might, which is a little counterintuitive. You don't think to yourself, yeah. delete the thing with the error. But the thing is, you're going to recreate it correctly. Exactly. By just going back in, right click, add virtual environment. And then back over here, 
it will automatically read from that requirements text file for us. So really all that we have to do is just click create. And then if we just sort of give that a couple of moments here, and I'm going to zoom back out. And uh, again, you know, sip of coffee. I'm almost out of coffee. But yeah, now it's actually going to recreate the environment correctly with all the packages that are needed yep. for Flask. Yeah, you can actually see all that in the output window behind the scenes, that it's going out and it's pulling everything down. I, I know it's giving me a lot of warnings, but that's okay. Warning, warning. Um, you can also now see, it. now you can see in the Solution Explorer all those nice packages, and we can see the little warning symbol went away. Yep. And we can also see, little Control F5, hit yes. No module. Oh, hang on. That's you must have oh, downloaded. That's yeah. a finished version. Yeah, you're Sorry. right. Um, That's, he just tried to run the code. It's going to work after we're done module five, and yeah, we're on module two. Yeah, give me two seconds so. here. Let me just go grab that. That's funny. Here, look, it works. Oh, wait a minute. No, yeah, yeah, you can't uh, jump ahead three chapters without doing the code in yeah. between. So, but yeah, so absolutely. But the key thing is, but you can see the little warning symbol's gone away, uh, <laughs> yep. said, and the code will actually run, except we're missing the packages, which we'll be adding this afternoon. There we go. Uh, so There we go. Okay, and so now, now it works. Okay. Okay, see, it, it does in fact work. There was just one little thing I needed to, uh, to add in. And in fact, I'm curious if somebody, uh, if that was a, an error message that somebody was getting. Mm. So you know what I'm gonna do real quick here, is I'm just going to, uh, to check this in. Um, You're going to update the uh, code yeah, on the server. So, exactly. but if anybody, so if anybody else was getting that error about the Redis, uh, if you just uh, download the zip file again, we're just going to update the copy that's in GitHub so that you have the correct version and we don't accidentally give you the code for the later stuff. Exactly. Cool. All right. Now then. Um, Nothing like being live. Exactly. <laughs> we are coming on this show. All right. All right. Now, um, I also need to open up the correct project. There we go, and I need to open up my slide deck. And now, there was another question that came up in the Q&A as well, um, asking about that app.route slash thing. Yeah, we should probably talk about that, shouldn't we? I think so. That might be a, a nice reminder. We said we would talk about that, so I think it's time. Yeah, okay. Well, let's roll into module two then. Okay. Creating web pages. You know, now that we know what a web application is, yep. how do we actually send information from the user to the server, and from the server to the user. Because that is huge. I mean, that's what allows us to really make a web application. It's one. Well, we already actually have the ability to just display stuff to a, on a web page to the yep, user. Exactly. But yeah. obviously, when I order books online and so on, I can I go I ask the server, "What books do you have on yeah. Python?" And it gives me a list, and I say, yep. "Well, I want to order this one." So yep. there must be a way to have two-way communication. Exactly. So here's what we need to get into: is we need to start talking about how this communication is going to take place. We need to talk about that writing concept. That's going to go back to that question that you were talking about. And then we need to kind of enable a little bit of additional functionality. But let's, let's, let's start by you know, talking about how to talk to servers. Now, caution. Caution. Nice yep. So, so it is a warning. But the cool thing about this is you'll be able to speak geek so there, well there, after there you this. Go. There that, you go. <laughs> uh, that, that you are going to be able to, you know, impress your friends with GeekSpeak once exactly. you've mastered this topic. So here's the thing: is stick with me. Yes. I'm. I'm. I, I promise you, I'm going to get you there. It's just going to take a little bit, and there's going to be a lot of explaining that I'm going to have to do to get us there. Because there's going to be a couple of very big terms that we need to understand, and we need to really understand the why. So this is sort of my spiel. Let me go. I promise you, you got to trust me on this. I'm going to get you to the other side. So let's start by defining two big terms here, and then digging into them. Okay. And the two main terms here are request and response. Okay. Now, request is coming from the user. So the user has made a request to the server. Response is what the server is going to send back. So again, kind of going back to that uh, restaurant analogy, I'm getting hungry. Okay. Coming back to that restaurant analogy, I ask my server, hey, I would like a steak rare. My server is going to go off get that and bring that back to me. So I made my request, stake rare. My server is now going to respond by bringing me said stake. So request, this is what I want. And then response is that server sending that information back. Now, let's take a look at sort of a, a real world application uh, example uh, of this. And let's talk about creating a website. 
Sure. And, and in fact, we should probably back this all the way up and, and ask a question. You know, why are you creating a website in the first place? Well, the reason that you're creating a website in, uh, in the first place is because you have information that you want to share and because, quite likely, in some way, shape, or form, you want to make money. I mean, that is that is true. I mean, if you think about the websites you visit, they're either trying to show you advertisements so they make money, or they're trying to sell us something, a service, or a product. Okay, so let's 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 break yeah. that down. So let's start with with number one is advertising. How do we make money with advertising? More visitors. So we want to make it as easy as possible for people to come to our site, keep seeing the same pages, and we want to make it very easy for other people to share those pages. So that way, when they go to Facebook, they go to Twitter, and they say, "Hey, look." I saw this. This is really cool that they have the very easy bill out. So, so if somebody, when I want somebody advertising, sure. Okay. So advertising. Um, let's go with number two, services. So I'm trying to sell a service. I'm a law firm. I'm a, a plumber. A plumber. I'm a spackling company. Um, spackling company. We'll stick with plumber. Okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, so what I'd be looking for if I'm a service like that is. I want more visitors because, after all, the more people that come to my site, that's going to increase the chances that they're going to pick up the phone or fire up an email and hire me for my services. So once again, I want to make it very easy to allow people to share my site and keep requesting those same pages over and over again. And if we bring this into the last example of, hey, look, we're selling products, which is sort of the one that everybody thinks of, the more traditional, once again, it's still the same concept. I want to make sure that people have very easy ability to see the page that describes the super widget that I want to sell them. So basically, regardless of the type of web application that you're going to be creating, the end goal is we want eyeballs. We want visitors. Why? Because chances are we want money. That's why we're creating these web pages. So let's take a look then at our little example here. And let's say that we're setting up a little photo sharing app. So we've got a, a, a little guy here. There's our, our little photographer enthusiast. See, you'll notice he's got a camera. He says, you know, I'd like to download a picture of a koala. So he goes to adventureworks.com slash, and then in this case, sleeping koala. And that's going to send off the uh, little picture of the koala. I, in fact, take that picture. By the way, getting a picture of a sleeping koala is the easiest thing to do. I think they sleep 23 to 23 and a half hours a day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, that's, <laughs> that's their state most of the day. Um, that's a lifestyle that I envy. Yeah. Um, in any event. Um, so they go in and they say, all right, well, this is what I want to see. And the server's going to go, okay, sure. There's the picture, and send that on down. And I want you to notice something about this URL is that it's nice, it's clean, it's simple, it's, 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 it's replayable. That every single time that somebody types in that URL, they send that request over the server, you know what they're going to get? They're going to get that cute little koala picture right there. Just like every time I say, my favorite restaurant slash menu, it brings me up the menu for my favorite restaurant. That's like it's, exactly yeah, it. Really, it's, I know exactly what I'm getting back when I type in that URL. And there's the next big point. You know exactly what you're going to get back. So you know you're going to get a menu. I know I'm going to get a sleeping koala because right. that's exactly what it says. Again, I suppose it's possible we might get rickrolled in the middle of this, but that's a different conversation. So you'll notice that's exactly what we're going to get. So having that nice, clean URL and having this URL be replayable becomes very important. And as it turns out, when you make a request up to a server, there's two different places that information that you want to send up could be sent. Okay. So it could be sent in the URL. Right. So that's going to be either inside the query string, like it is here, mm -hmm. or it could just be part of the URL itself. So I can actually pass information right there as part of the URL, and that's going to be replayable. So anybody with that URL could access that page. So anybody that sees that URL could access that page. And let's kind of spin this back to my analogy that I've been using, is if I'm sitting in a restaurant, and I say to my server, maybe some special code. Maybe there's a little discount code. And so whatever it happens to be, so let's just say the, the discount is, is Web Wednesday. So I say to my server, Web Wednesday, and that's going to get me 10% off. Well, if somebody else overhears me say Web Wednesday, you know what's going to happen? They're going to be able to say Web Wednesday as well and get the exact same discount. And in a lot of cases, 
That's exactly what I want, that I want that information to be shared. I want that information to be public because if you're going to offer a discount like that, Typically, you're doing that to attract more customers, to get more people in, and, and we want that to be replayable. Bringing that back over into our environment here, again, we want this to be replayable. So every single time that somebody comes in and they say, sleeping koala, we want to make sure that they can get back that picture. So it's important to be able to send information inside of a URL. Yeah, and you, earlier you had that query string as well, and you do see that a lot, on, I find, on pages where are uh, online stores. Yes. Uh, my husband and I were, sh were shopping for lighting fixtures, and it was like, hey, I like this lighting fixture. Mm -hmm. And he'd send me a link, and it would be a URL just like that, slash, uh, hall lights, query, and it would have a little question mark, and then it would have like the catalog number of that particular light. Exactly. And when he sent me that link inside an email, I click on that link, and I saw the exact same lighting fixture my husband was talking about, and then we're like, oh, yeah, I like that too, and then we can go buy it. Exactly, exactly. We want that to be replayable. We want that to be shareable. That we want more people to come in and look at that. Yeah. Cool. But you know, sometimes there's information that we wouldn't want replayable. So let's kind of go back to my restaurant analogy here. And let's say that I start speaking my credit card number out loud huh. to the yeah. server. Now, I, I don't really want the person next to me knowing my credit card number. Well, because again, at that point, it would become replayable. Because if that's the way that we're going to exchange credit card numbers, the person next to me, here's my credit card number, they start speaking that. And again, that's and now, and now you're paying for their dinner. Yeah, exactly. I, and, and we do use credit card numbers on the web. So it's a very relevant analogy. Exactly. Exactly. So that's the, 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 this is going to work. So we need some way that we can tuck that information away. Make sure that that's not going to be visible. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to tangent here for 30 seconds. See, that, see, see you'll notice I, I slid to the side. That's so this, your tangent? This is, that's tangent. A, this is your side. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to talk over here. Um, one big thing that we're not going to get into today is a thing called SSL, uh, Secure Sockets Layer, which would do encryption. And one big thing that I want to highlight about this header information is that it's not going to be replayable, it's not going to be in the URL, but it's not by default going to be encrypted. Which means if you've got someone who knows how to sneak around and sniff things... You need things. to move to the side because we're in oh, sorry. mode. Okay, so is it right? Okay, right. So yeah, right. so yeah. So we're in that means mode. these people who know how to go hack things and and dig around and stuff, they can see the stuff in the header if they know what they're doing. Exactly, yeah. So we would need to use SSL. So this is not going to encrypt it, and so it's it's just going to tuck it behind the scenes. We still need to encrypt it, but we also still want it out of that URL because we don't want anybody to be able to see that. Okay, back to here. Back to, so, back to our main program. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we return back to our regular programming. So back over here on that header info, and that's again going to be sent behind the scenes, but it's also going to give us one other big advantage here, is that there's no size or type restriction. So again, let's say that I happen to be very specific about the order that I want to make. So I'm going to, let's say, order ribeye, and I want that to be rare, but I want that to be With only, mushrooms yeah, and yeah. the teriyaki sauce. I, exactly. You know, and, and Sliced vertically, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I want all of those different things. Well, if I just keep saying this to, uh, to my server, chances are my server is going to forget this. There's only so much information that you could communicate that way. Sort of the same thing with a URL. Depending on the browser and a couple of other things, your URL is going to be restricted on the number of characters. Header information, however, not restricted whatsoever. So we can send a lot more information, and it's also going to be tucked away. So. Let's, uh, you know, I'm actually going to go slightly out of order on my slides here. Let's actually see this in action and ignore the fact that it says post. I'll come back. Okay. So, you know, here we go with somebody maybe wanting to make a comment here. So let's say they really like that picture. So they like to put in a comment. This is not something that I want replayable, that I want to make sure that everybody time, every time somebody wants to make a comment, they have to go in, fill out the form, that they can't just simply grab the URL. So this is where sending it up inside the header information comes into play. So we give them the form. They type in their little thing called cute picture. I really should have stopped that animation over there. But you'll notice they typed in cute picture. Yep. And so now that information is going to be sent up here. And I want to highlight the URL. And you'll notice that it's still www.adventureworks.com. Whack. Comment. Yeah, it's true. I'm using the exact same URL, but two different things are happening. The first time I use, I specify the URL, it's just giving me back a blank form. Correct. The second time, it's I'm, I'm sending it my filled out form. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so we're going to get to that to that first part here in, in, in a second. The, it's that second part that right now is very important because you're going to notice cute picture 
is not in that URL. So it must be in that header information. There you go. And that is exactly our header information in action there that it's going to be sent behind the scenes. Now, let's come back to that first part that Susan just mentioned there. And, and you'll notice sort of that two-step process here of, hey, look, I'd like to comment. Well, in order for me to comment, what do I need? I need... I need the form to fill out. Exactly. So I punch in, whack comment, and it gives me that form back. Right. Okay. And then I go in, I fill out my little cute picture, and then we send that back up. So how does it how does it know when to just give me the blank form and when am I sending in a filled out form? Fantastic question. And that's going to be based on two what are known as verbs, which are get and post. Now, a lot of times when people hear get and post, they automatically assume, and this is fair, um, and I got to be honest, I, I, I did this as well. Because it sort of makes sense that when you hear get, what you're thinking is, I'm getting information. When you hear post, you're sending information. And it's not entirely true because I can still send information with when, a get. I, with, when I do get. Mm. Because after all, kind of winding all of this back to my little cute koala picture here, um, you're going to notice we sent information. We said we wanted a sleeping koala. And that was a get. Exactly. That was a get. So we can still <coughs> send information. But the main difference is that we only have the ability to send data inside the URL. Okay. With post, we can do it in the URL as well as in the header. Which, and so remember, or yep. could be URL as well as header. So, okay. you know, it could be, could be both. Now, the question becomes, well, how does the server know? When the browser makes the request it will actually say, hey, I'm making a get request. Or it will say, hey, I'm making a post request. And we're going to see in the next module how we can actually control that, how we can actually um, uh, do either a get or a post. The main thing that I want to mention here is that the default is get. So it's only going to be post if you explicitly do something to send up a post request, which is typically going to be done with a form. And again, come back to me in the next module, and I'll show you how that's going to be done. So as a coder, when I'm writing my yep. Python code, does that mean I'm going to need to be able to say, well, hang on, if this was a get, I just want to send them a blank form. And if this was a post, then I know I'm getting my information back? 100% correct. That's exactly it. That inside your code, you're going to need to be able to detect. And that is going to be sort of the typical pattern excuse me, a typical pattern here is you're going to first detect the fact that they did a get, and then what's going to happen is you'll send down the form. Yep. And then you're going to detect the fact that, hey, look, they set a post, and then you're going to read that data. So that's going to be the typical pattern. And so when we go in and we create, for example, uh, a, uh, a create uh, question, that's exactly what we're going to have, that we're going to have one little block that's just going to send the form down. Uh-huh. There we go. And we're going to create another block that's going to accept that brand new question, save that back into our data store, and then send back to the user, hey, look, that was successful. So you're going to notice that that's going to be very common uh, uh, programming inside of Flask and inside of your, uh, your little application. Cool. Yeah. All right. Now, like I said, a bit of terminology. But okay. hopefully what we did there um, is kind of brought all that together and, and saw that. And I know that um, chances are, after kind of going through all of that, we need to see it in action. And we will, I promise you. But this is one of those things where we need to define this right up front. Because when we start getting into things like routing, we need to kind of understand that little get post and, and all of that good stuff. So okay. that's always why I like to cover that. Um, and just to close it all off, um, the response information, there's an awful lot that could be sent back down uh, with, uh, with response. Could be things like uh, status codes, the type of file that we're going to send. That you know, One of the things that we've been highlighting is things like HTML, CSS, JavaScript. But you know, we could send down images. We could send down videos. So there's a lot that we could actually send down. And so if you are going to send down an image, you need to tell the browser, hey, we're about to send down an image. Otherwise, it's not going to be expecting that. And you do that inside the header information. But typically, the content that you're going to be sending down, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Cool. Now, you asked me a question many minutes ago now. 
Yep, yep. And that yes, question was, a, was? That question was, we had a question in the Q&A window that asked uh, a little more, was trying to remember what that app.route slash was doing inside the code. That's so. a great question. And that is a route. So let's get in and start digging into what routing is all about. Now, what I always like to say when it comes to Flask is that at the end of the day, what a user is doing is they're calling a function. That Here, let me, let me back out of, of my slides real, real quick here. I'm just going to add in uh, an ad hoc demo. Um, doo -doo -doo. There we go. There's my little um, uh, music for uh, an ad hoc demo. Okay, so you remember this from before. So let's again ignore this right here. What's this again, Susan? That is a purely Python function. That's it. That's all that that is. So what's going to happen here is this function is going to be called, and in fact here, we can, we can see it. I'm going to put a breakpoint right there. I'm going to hit F5 to go into my bugger. Whoops. Um, and apparently I'm going to hit the number five as well. <laughs> well. I'm not sure Python knows what to do with that, so all right. <laughs> That's okay, neither do I. Um, there we go. Take two here. Chugga, chugga, chugga. And you'll notice, well, you'll notice it decided not to break for me. That was awful nice of you. Did you delete the breakpoint by any chance? Oh, no. we'll try again. Yeah, take two. Um, oh, oh your code's still running. Yeah. <laughs> the number of times we all do that when we're doing demonstrations. It's like, wait, my project is still running. Not enough code inside your function, my friend, to get breakpoints. There's rules about breakpoints, about what types of lines of code they're allowed to be on. So if you declare a, a variable or something, <laughs> yes, that'll force it to stop long enough for us to show you that it's running. Uh, so this is something, it's just there's only certain lines of code it'll break on. Now they're going to think you really do have some magic uh, code up your sleeve. Stop. There, there we go. go. Hooray. <laughs> All right. Congratulations. <laughs> now we can actually yeah. get it to break. Um, and, and you know what's sad is that we spent all of that time for what's going to be a very simplistic demo. I know. Um, but here's the point that I want to make is that we typed in this little forward slash. And, and if I go back to my browser here and let's just kind of zoom on in here, um, you'll notice right there at the very end that it, it there's a forward slash. So... That is actually what's being sent into Flask, what's being in, uh, sent into the server, and then behind the scenes, it's now going to run that function. So at the end of the day, all that we're doing here is we're just running Python functions. So what we need is we need a way for our users to communicate to us which function it is that they want to call. Now, of course, they're not going to know that they're calling a function. No, you know, they they just, no they're idea. just typing in some sort of URL. But, but at the end of the day, they're making a request. They're, they're looking for some behavior. Yeah. So that when you go to restaurant.com or you know, whatever When I go to my is, favorite restaurant slash menu, I'm asking for the menu. Exactly. When I say go to restaurant slash directions, I want to see the directions. And when you go you know, sleep in koala, you're looking for the sleep in koala. koala. So again, in two-part harmony, um, <laughs> what you're going to notice is that at the end of the day, we're just making those method calls. That's, that's, that's really, a, and our users are requesting functions. Functionality. And that is what routing is all about. That routing is all about taking the URL that a user punches in and doing something with it. Now, traditionally, in, in a lot of other technologies, the user, again, not necessarily knowing it, is making a request of a specific page. So they're specifically looking for about us.html. They're specifically looking for register.aspx. But the problem with that is... You know, what happens if later on we decide that we want to change? That maybe we don't want to use HTML anymore, that maybe we want to use PHP or we want to use MVC. Now that starts to become a real problem. So we want something that's going to get away from calling specific pages and instead request that functionality. And so you'll notice that we've got register and you'll notice that we've got about. Because if I back up here, what you're going to notice is that we've got this little extension here of that .html and that .aspx. I have no idea what that is. Yeah, for the user, that's very confusing. Exactly. And I remember that in the old days it was .htm, and yeah. some were .html, and some were .htm, and yeah. then it was .asp, and then it was .aspx. It got really confusing for the poor users. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, if I say whack about or register, I know exactly what's about to happen on the other side. 
I'm going to bring up the About page. And do I care what's happening behind the scenes on the server? I certainly don't care if you did it in ASP versus ASP.NET versus HTML. I just want to get to my web page. I just want that functionality. That's exactly it. So it's going to create more readable URLs. Mm -hmm. It's going to give us increased functionality or flexibility. And then, most importantly, it's going to give us search engine optimization. And, you know, we could spend uh, the entire day talking about um, SEO or search engine optimization um, and probably barely scratch the which surface. Is, yeah, all, which yeah. is all about trying to show up on the first page when they do a search. Exactly. And, you know, here's the thing is if you just follow a couple of very simple little steps, you're going to be just Fine, that you're going to be able to show the search engine what your, your site is all about. And one of the simplest to highlight is the fact that your URLs are very simplistic. That when I go to WAC register, I know what's going to happen. When I go to WAC about, I know what's going to happen. And not only do I know, the search you engine know, knows. And the search engine knows. And that means more people find you. That means more people visiting your site, which means yep. you make more money with your advertising, your restaurant, or whatever you're doing. Show me the money. Yes. Um, <laughs> by the way, last little thing to mention here is that there is an MVA on search engine optimization. Why, why am I not surprised? I couldn't say the coverage at this point on MVA is pretty amazing. <laughs> hey, so. you know? Yeah. All right. But All back right. to our routing. Back to our routing. So what I want you to notice is... Routing is taking that URL and translating it into something. So the server needs to understand what in the world the user is requesting. So the server doesn't know what WAC register is. You're going to tell it what it is by adding in those routes. And that's going to be where you specify the URL for that particular desired item or function. So let's go in and take a look at, at kind of routing 101 here. That if I go into Visual Studio, doo -doo -doo -doo, and let's just come down over to here is I'm going to say app route. Okay, so you're adding another route now. So we right now we had the, the slash did our hello world. So you're now adding a new route. That's exactly what I'm doing. Okay. So I'm going to start with a forward slash. Okay. Start from the root of our server. And then I could type in really whatever word it is that I want here. So could I use Wibble? Yeah, though a user wouldn't really know what the heck Wibble's doing, but okay. Shove two pencils up your nose, put your underwear on your head, keep saying Wibble over and over and over again, and it helps you get out of the army. If you say so. True story. <laughs> um, so in any event, <laughs> um, could I say Wibble? Absolutely. Wibble, wibble, wibble. Um, but it doesn't actually mean anything to the outside world. So I want this to be nice, clear, and, and, and clean. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say create. Because what this is going to do is this is now going to create a question. Right, because this, oh, this is the first step towards a trivia app that it, you and I were planning is. to build. It right. is. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to build a, like a little bit of it now just so that way we can sure. keep using these demos later. Don't worry, we are going to get um, into the specifics of it. But yeah. right now, yeah, create. Yeah, this is going to be the starting point. Now, so we just added that in. So what we've now said is, hey, server, if you see somebody type in create, what I want you to do is I want you to call the method that's going to be right under it. That's all that happened right here. Yep. If you'll notice that that was the method that was called, why? Position. Location, location, location. It was right under that app route. Okay. So I now come back over here, and I'm just going to define... A new Python function. A new Python. And I'm going to call it create... That, and that is really a good practice. Just call it the same thing as the route, and that way it'll be easier for you to remember. It doesn't matter. You could have called it Wibble, but it's just easier for you to follow your own code if you use the same names for your functions as you do for your routes. Exactly. Now, I am going to cheat a little bit here um, in that I'm just going to send down um, an H2 tag. Um, I'm not going to build out the full text that we saw up above. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I'm, I'm uh, well, not going to do that is just because we're going to go back and, 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 and throw we're that focusing, out. We just want to show that this route calls this function, right? Exactly. That's, that's it. That's all that we want to do. And so sure enough, you're going to notice, chugga, chugga, chugga that if I go in and I now say create, there is our create page. So you'll notice right up at the very top, I said create, and it's now on the create page. Perfect. So a different route, different functions called, different output displayed to the user. That's exactly it. Now, let's, um, let me close that out, and I'm just going to close all of that out. There we go. Now, one of the things that can happen here 
is that your application can get very big. Oh yeah. And so it's very possible that you're going to have dozens, maybe even hundreds of different routes out there. And so, you know, it's going to get a little bit tedious to try and keep everything inside of one file. It could get very cluttered. Yeah. So fortunately, we can create additional files. So let's actually just add in, add, new item, empty Python file, and I'm going to call this routes, which is where our routes will be stored. I like that. Go. Nice and easy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut my code here. So you're taking the code out of the app.py file, the routing code, yep. and moving it to the routes.py file. Exactly. So I just simply move that into my routes, and I'm also going to um, server whack uh, create. Let's you know, add, add some comments. Comment. Good idea. And so this demo is not going to work. You're going to notice that I move that code over. So it's the same code that we saw before, and I run my app. And you're going to notice I'm going to get a 404. File not found. And you're probably wondering, well, wait a minute, why was that not found? It's a good question. The reason that it wasn't found is because my application doesn't know to actually go call that routes file. So what I need to do is I need to go import. Well, that kind of makes sense. It's not just going to magically just go searching for, are there any files out there somewhere that have the routes defined? You have to tell it. It'd be nice if it was magic. <laughs> there is no magic in Python. Um, so what I need to do is import that. So I'm just simply going to say from routes, import, and then asterisk, which means import everything. Now, by the way, there is um, no magic to the name routes. Okay. That it's just simply... A convention? Uh, routes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, it is convention. Again, could I have called it Wibble? Sure, but nobody's going to know what that means. I mean, if I opened up somebody's project and I saw a file called routes, I might guess that that's where they're doing the routing. Exactly. And that's why you're doing it. Yeah. And you might also decide, you know, as your project gets bigger, that you're going to create additional routes files as well. So you would just simply import all of your additional ones. So, you know, maybe for our cart, um, we would say import um, asterisk. And maybe from our products, we would say import asterisk if we were creating um, a... Um, uh, an e-commerce site, you know. So yeah. we've got all those different files. So we just simply import all of them in, and uh, and away we go. So now let's go ahead and launch this again. It's going to fail again. Yep. And now you're going to notice I'm getting a slightly different error message here. Yeah, it's actually coming back saying app is not fine. That's true, and you did have code in there that says app dot route. So it looks like it can't figure out what app is. You're absolutely right. It can't figure out what app is. So what I need to do is I need inside my routes pie is I need to pull in two things. First of all, we're going to be doing Flask in here, right? Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. We're doing Flask. Guess what we need? Maybe need to import Flask. Hey. So we need that. And then we also need app. So I'm going to say from app import app, which I know is sort of a, a little bit of a funny <laughs> line from uh, app, import app. Um, here's what's happening is, let me do this this way. Um, app here, this is the file. So that's pointing to our app pi file over there. Okay. App is the name of the variable that we declared. So if I come back over here, there is the variable that um, uh, that I had declared. Right. So, so that's that's the that app variable it was saying it couldn't find. Exactly. So now we've got Flask. Now we've got app. And now we run this one last time. Chugga chugga chugga. And there's our hello world, Susan. Let's go in and say create. And awesome. there's our create page. So nice. So now we have a nice, tidy way of sort of, yeah, not cluttering up one file with everything, because that can get unmanageable very fast when you start building bigger sites. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, absolutely. So just cut and paste for routing information mm -hmm. into a, a routes.py file. You can call it something else if you want, but routes is a nice, easy to guess name, yep. intuitive name. And, but you do have to add a couple of import statements to the top of the file. There you go. All right. Cool. Now, let's... Keep on keeping on, shall we? Yeah. Because up until now, all that we've done is just shown off the ability to do this part of the URL. Right. Now, 
it'd be nice to be able to take a variable right over there instead of that question mark ID equals blah, blah, blah. No, it was query strings. They call the query strings. Yeah, exactly. And and we want to make sure that this is going to be nice and, and clean and easy so that if I go to www.example.com, wax speakers, wax, Susan, I back, guess what I'm going to see there? Um, Christopher Harrison. Close. <laughs> <laughs> um, I figured you'd hacked my website, gone in there. <laughs> not quite. Okay. Um, no, what I'm going to see there is I'm going to see information about a speaker named Susan Ibach. And it's all right there in the URL. And sometimes this is what's known as a vanity URL because the name of whatever it is we're going to see on the other side is inside of that URL. And, and why is this important? Well, once again, it's important for search engine optimization, for SEO, because that's Susan Ibach. So the search engine is going to know that that's Susan Ibach. On top of that, it's once again going to give us predictable URLs. So if somebody hands me that, www.example.com, whack speakers, whack Susan Ibach, and I know that, for example, maybe Christopher did speak there, yeah. that I could go in and I could say, whack Christopher Harrison, and hopefully it just, I've guessed. Exactly. And I bring up the speaker information on Christopher. That's it. And so now what we need to do is talk about how we're going to add in those vanity URLs. Right. So once again, let's come back over here and let's um, just go in and say um, server, whack, question. Okay. More on that later. And then I'm going to use an angle bracket, title, angle bracket. Okay. Now, angle bracket, something angle bracket is traditionally... It's traditionally used to be a placeholder, right? Yep. Okay. How about app route question title? Okay. It's traditionally used as a placeholder. Okay. Guess what? It's a placeholder. So here's what's cool is that it's automatically going to be looking for some bit of string afterwards that's going to be title. And I would also mention real quickly here that if you wanted to constrain that, that maybe you just wanted that to be an integer or you wanted to force that to be a string or, or something like that, cool. that you could go in and do that. So, yeah, if you're, if you're expecting an ID number, an account number, yeah, you could specify. Yeah, you could say int colon. Yeah. Sure. So in my case, I'm just going to say title. And then I'm going to say um, def uh, question. And I'm going to say title. Oh, so you're just accepting as a parameter to function, just like we would with any Python function. We want to accept parameters. That's it. And I'm going to say return. And let's go in and say um, um, h2. And I'm going to say plus. And I'm going to say title. And I'm going to close out my um, h2 there. By the way, something I just like picked up on here. Um, and this is, you know, it's one of those things. Sometimes Python is a little bit too flexible, and so you you wind up easing into bad habits, and, and I've sort of eased into that, that you might notice here, and I apologize if I've confused anybody, um, you might notice that I've been using single quotes on the route, and I've been using double quotes <laughs> here, um, and that unfortunately has just been sort of the way it's been flowing off my fingers. Um, I could absolutely use single quotes across the board, um, and I could absolutely use double quotes um, across the board. So um, just sort of a... A bad, um, a bad uh, flow I got myself into. Um, now, in any event, let's um, let's go in and and, and highlight something here. Uh, you are going to notice that once again, Susan, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. The uh, the spot highlighted in blue. That's a. Uh, that is a just a Python function. There but you go. the difference between this one and the others is this one's accepting a parameter title, which means the function's expecting me to pass in a title when I call it. Cool. So it's expecting title. So it's expecting a parameter, still just a normal Python function, but expecting a parameter, guess where it's going to get it from? Uh, I'm hoping it's going to get it from that URL. Um, do I have to do anything to magically connect that, say that that title placeholder, I want to put it into that title parameter? Just make sure that the names are the same. That's all okay. that you have to do. So if you say title, say title. If you say wibble, say wibble. So you just have to make sure that those two are the same. That's it. Cool. And so now, if I, once again, launch my little page here, and I go question Wibble, it's going to print out Wibble. And if I say question Christopher, it's going to print out Christopher. So it's just taking that title, passing that in, and then giving me access to that. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah.
that is neat. And so I actually, yeah, can actually read a string or something that they typed into the URL, and then in my code, I can use that string. That's going to be pretty powerful. That's exactly it. Yeah, it's very powerful. We'll actually see later on how we're going to be able to use this to go load our questions for our little trivia app. Okay. Now, back to our slides here, because we've got... Go away. <laughs> Too Stay. many things open at the same time. There we go. <laughs> My test bar just didn't want to behave. Um, one of the little problems that we can run into here is that we need to be able to create links. And so in order to create a link, we need to have the URL. And unfortunately, the URL might change. That's true. Um, and it might change for restructuring purposes or, or otherwise. So if it changes, and I've hard-coded that URL in 12 different places, I now have to run around to all of those 12 places and change that. Ah, uh, yeah. And that is true of coding a lot of times. What drives you nuts is, you know, it's that old rule of, as soon as you find yourself copying and pasting the same line of code to 10 <laughs> places, you're thinking, oh, it's easy, just cut and paste. Yeah, it's easy until one day that thing you cut and pasted changes, and now you have to remember to change it in 12 places. Exactly. So... You know, there's, there's an old um, phrase that, that's sort of streamlined as um, Einstein once said, don't memorize anything you can look up. And the full story behind that is he was doing an interview and, and um, uh, some constant had come up um, and Einstein didn't know what it was. And the reporter was, you know, flabbergasted at this. How could you not know what this is? And Einstein said, why would I memorize something that I could look up in a book in under two minutes? My corollary to that in programming is don't hard code anything that you can look up. So if I can ask for that value, I'm going to ask for that value rather than hard coding that in because once again, that could change. So let's take this and take a look at how we can add in a link here. So once again, back over here to, uh, to our little page and uh, on the home, instead of saying, hello, Susan, sorry, Susan, um, I want to now create a link into the um, create page. Oh, awesome! Because okay. I mean, we all, we see web pages doing that all the time. You Absolutely. are forever, you know, you land on the page and it said, "I'm going to go back to my restaurant." And you know, on the main homepage, there's if you don't know, you can type restaurant slash menu uh, to get to the menu. Then usually there's a little link on the page where you can click and say, "Take me to the menu. Take me to directions. Let me make reservations." Exactly. Okay. So that was like a perfect uh, level of distraction here. Um, I try. <laughs> and do do do. Whoops! I need as we add the code here. My quotes. But yeah, there we go. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up my little um, uh, create link, and I'm just going to. So add that's that just in. so create link's just uh, a variable that contains a string, that's and that it. and that a href that's the syntax of HTML for providing a link to another page. Exactly. But what I need inside of there is said. Link. Which would be some sort of URL, www dot something or HTTP exactly. something. Yep. And so I want to point that at create. Okay. So as long as the function name doesn't change. Okay. So you got to keep that, because something's got to be consistent here. Uh -huh. So as long as the function name doesn't change, you can go ahead and keep doing it. And so all that you need is this little thing called URL for, and then in my case, it's going to be create, right? Yep. Well, you're going to notice that if I fire this up, it would not work. The reason is that it's not going to know what URL 4 is, well, 4. It doesn't know what URL 4 is. Okay. So I need to go import that in, and you're going to notice that that's inside a flash. So I go in and I say, aha, URL 4, let's bring that in, and that's now going to bring that to life. And so now you'll actually notice that if I go in and I say URL 4, open paren, now it's actually giving me the IntelliSense. So now I could go in and say create, just like that. Wait okay. for it. There we go. And now let's go back in. Let's say yes. Let's chugga, chugga, chugga. <coughs> and now you're going to notice it says create a question. Okay. And I put my mouse over this. And down at the very bottom, you're going to notice that it now says create. And just to sort of prove a point here, there we go. If I updated that route to say Wibble, Wibble's always just my throwaway word, and it's also a reference to a BBC show that nobody knows. Um, what I want you to notice is this, is the function that I had created, 
I don't know why my typing keeps disappearing. Um, the function that I had created, I had said define create. create. So you had re- you just renamed the route. You didn't change the function name. Exactly. Just created the route, uh, uh, renamed the route, didn't change the function name. So as long as that stays the same, that's just going to make a mess of things. It's still going to make a mess of things. There we go. Um, as long as that stays the same, it will always pick up what the route is. So you'll notice that it automatically updated itself to now be Wibble. Awesome. So that means yep. I can change the URL that a user wants. If I want to rename or I, I'm making a French version of the website yep. or something, so I want to change it to, well, I guess menu is still menu in French, but uh, <laughs> create instead of create, yes. then I have that ability. And now that route points to that same points to that function. And I don't have to change my code just because I change the URL people type in to get there. And that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And by the way, um, Barry, our camera guy in the back, asked a question, is Wibble from Black Adder? And the answer to that question is, yes, it is. Woo-hoo! Thank you for getting my reference. <laughs> cool. All right. You're not alone. <laughs> Fantastic show, by the way. Um, in any event, let's, um, let's close all this off. Because we covered a fair amount of ground there. And so the question then becomes, well, what do we learn? Well, we learned about um, Get and Post. We learned how to create custom URLs. We learned how to send information um, uh, to the user. We are going to see in the next module how we can pull that information in. Well, what can we do with all of this? Because that seemed, you know, sort of of, of esoteric. That seemed um, uh, kind of academic. Well. You know, the biggest thing is, is that we now learn how to best share information with the world. That you want to keep your URLs predictable, nice, clean, you know, make sure that the user understands exactly what they're going to get when they click on your link, and in turn, the search engine is going to get. We also saw how to create our custom URLs, and we also saw how to go in and begin building our own web applications. But of course, we need to keep going. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's more to do here, but I need a break. I bet you're not the only one. So, <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead, take 10 minutes, and uh, we'll come on back. We'll see you in 10. All right. Well, uh, welcome back to uh, our jumpstart on introduction to creating websites using Python and Flask alongside Susan Iback. I am Christopher Harrison. Now, we um, have been taking a look at really kind of the basics of everything, uh, about how to handle our routing, about uh, HTML, how to send information down. And I think now it's time to kind of bring it all together and let's start building a uh, a bigger app. Now, before I get into that, um, I do want to mention real quickly uh, for everybody that is uh, watching this live uh, about the uh, the couple little streaming issues. Yeah, there was was a couple of uh, things this morning. So yeah. yeah. So uh, one big thing to keep in mind is that this MBA will be available about two weeks from uh, from today. Uh, today is uh, Wednesday the 17th. Um, so, um, yeah, so you can check that out in a couple weeks if you did wind up missing some uh, really bad jokes from uh, from the first couple <laughs> of, uh, of modules. And there's incentive right there. Yeah. Go watch on demand. All right. So uh, our big purple slide here, or my big purple slide, um, we could. We could keep building all of our little files to just, you know, send text down to our users. We could. Yeah, okay. yeah, because we at this point, yeah. we have the ability to have multiple web pages to yep. move between those different web yep. pages. So we, we have that ability. We, That's we a start. Could. By the way, that is the oddest sentence I think I've ever written. Who who, who did the, 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 the editing on this? Um, in any event, by the way, that would be me. That'd be you, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I really need a better editor. Um, in any event, we could keep doing that, but that isn't going to make it very easy to create a rich UI. I mean, here, let me, let me actually bail out of the slides for a second, and, and, and let's fire back up uh, Visual Studio here. I mean, look at... 
Look at this. That's, you know, that's a pretty clunky line of code. If you're going to have to do that every time you want to display something nicely on the screen. And, you know, when I was having that out, one of the things that that um, uh, that you had mentioned was that you were going to give me a high five if I did that without typos, which, by the way, you Oh, high five. five. This is yeah, true. There, yeah. There oh, you go. go high five. You oh, managed it. Oh, wait. Here, here we okay. go. See? There we go. Captured. We go. Well done. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, we, we could do that, but that's going to get really a whole really fast. Fast. And on top of that, you know, there's a very good chance that you're going to have a division of labor, labor between your web designers and your web programmers. That if you're anything like me, and I know I am, I'm good at the. I, 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 I pull out that line every MVA. Um, if you're anything like me, and I know I am, I'm very much a back of the house kind of guy. I, 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 I can you know, do all the, the programming on, on, on the back end, but if you're looking for something that's going to look very pretty, I need a lot of help. Um, there are, it's really not my skill, but there are people that have that skill, and I want to make it easy for them to do their thing, make it easy for me to do my thing, and then we'll bring it all together and we'll have a very good looking app at the end. Yep, makes sense. Yeah. So let me go ahead and bring all this up. So in order to do this, in order to build the application that we're going to want, we're going to need forms. So we're right. going to need to talk about how to allow our little user, there's my little user dude, and my user to um, send information up to the server. That's going to be with a form. So we okay. need to figure that out. We also need to figure out how we're going to build better um, uh, HTML. That's going to be our Jinja templates. And then finally, last but not least, we're going to build the structure of our app, that front end, and then you're going to come along and you're going to take care of the uh, I can the do a little more back and a little, little more logic to the back end. Perfect. Okay. So let's talk about forms. What is a form? Well, a form is all about collecting information, sending it up, and then eventually we're going to need to read that. So let's start by talking about how we're going to collect information from the user. And the way that we're going to do this is by setting up input controls. And this is, a, this is an HTML, one of the HTML uh, controls we can use on our web pages. Exactly. And, and it's worth highlighting that there's dozens of these. Um, that there's options for drop-down lists, there's checkboxes, there's radio buttons. Um, and you could also, with a bit of JavaScript magic, you know, create your own. But we're trying to keep this a little bit simpler, that our main focus is on Python and on Flask and not on HTML. So we're just going to keep it real simple with our basic um, input controls. Um, but I do want to highlight, once again, there's MVAs where you could learn all of this if you wanted to, uh, to dig deeper. Now, the first main attribute to highlight is name. And this name is important because that's the name that's going to get sent up to the server. So you need to make sure that the name in your HTML form is going to match what you're going to be reading on the server. So name becomes important. OK. And then you're going to notice right here the different options for type. And so we've got text, which is going to give us a text box. We've got password, which would give us you know, asterisks or little dots uh, for the letters that we type in, so that way we don't see what the password is. Um, again, I'm going to go back to my tangent. Let's go back to tangent mode again. There we go. Um, one big thing to keep in mind is that even though we say type equals password, it does not encrypt the text. So it just hides it on, on, the, on the display, on the browser, but it doesn't encrypt it when it's sent from the client to the server. You're going to need SSL again uh, to, to do that. So it okay. just protects you from somebody looking over Wait. your shoulder and watching you type in your password. Exactly. Exactly. It doesn't have, you need to get in tangent mode. Sorry. Other way. Other way, I can't. The, I can't get a, the, It's the, like forward I'll, slashes I'll, and back slashes. Yeah. I can't keep it straight. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so it's only going to put the little uh, the little dots on there. The last one to mention is uh, is email, and this is one that uh, that I always get asked when I'm doing different web classes: is how do I get on a touch keyboard the at and the dot com to automatically appear on a text box when I'm asking somebody for their email address? And the answer is type equals email. And it's worth highlighting that that is a new um, HTML5 yes. type. Which, uh, um, yeah. So if you're running a really old browser, it might not work, but most browsers these days support that. Well, yeah. It, it wouldn't work on the Titch keyboard. It's not going to bring that up. But one very cool thing is, once again, you could actually do input type equals Wibble. Um, and what it's going to display is a text box that, again, remember, we talked about the um, 
sort of the best attempt that the browser is going to do. If it sees type equals and it doesn't see something that it recognizes, it's going to go, well, it's probably a text box. I'm just going to give you a text box um, and just go with that. So it's just not going to put in the uh, the rest. So it'll still function, but it's not going to give you the cool little add and, and, and the dot com on that. Okay. Now, the next part is we've given you the UI to type in information. How do we get that information up to the server. We're actually going to need two things. We're going to need a submit button, and I don't have a slide on the submit button because it's going to be button type equals submit. I'll show you in a minute. But we also need to determine how we're going to send that up. And if you remember, it was get by default. So it's always going to be get by, by default. So when we typed in you know, our, our URL forward slash or forward slash create or forward slash question, it was just simply get by default. If we want it to be post. So we want to be able to send information in the header, then what we need to do on our form, so you'll notice form and all of our input controls go inside of there, then what we need is method equals post. Right. Now we could say method equals get and, and send that up and you'll notice for example if you fire up Bing yep. and you type something in that it will appear inside the URL, the reason is that they said method equals get because once again they want to make it replayable. So you could actually take a Bing search result page, copy the URL, paste that in and it will work because it uses method equals get, puts all that into the URL, again post is going to send that into the header. The other thing is the action parameter. And you'll notice that I don't have an action parameter um, in here. Nope. And the reason for that is because by default, it's going to go back to the same page. And I put that in quotes just to kind of use that kind of loosely. That if you remember, you know, we want the ability to do create, for example. And we talked in module two about that two-step process, that step one is going to be, you know, sending the user the form. The blank form to fill out. Yeah. Exactly. And then step two is going to be sending that up. And we just want it to go right back to that exact same spot because remember, again, we're going to have those two blocks of code. This is going to be get. This is going to be post. So we're just going to put all of that right inside of that one spot. Okay, so so let's. I'm gonna clear my screen because yeah, I got a lot so of I had, uh, yeah. So if I had, so if I had a website, uh, one of these ones where I'm ordering books or something, a lot of times on those, when you finish typing in your order and you sort of hit submit, it then takes you to enter your billing information, mm -hmm. uh, and then the next, then when you submit that, it takes you to shipping information. That's when those actions become important. Um, sort of. So the action, uh, well, yes, actually, because if it was going to go to a different page, one of the ways to handle that would be to have different actions. So you might have uh, one action that's going to say, um, enter address. So uh -huh. I'm, uh, I'm going to have uh, something called uh, address. And then I've got another one here that's maybe going to be uh, credit card. And then I've got um, another one that's going to be confirm right. or whatever it is that it happens to be. One of the ways that you can handle that is by using different actions. So if you wanted to send to somewhere else, after so after you submit give me this page then I'm going to send you to the next page right action is one of the ways you can do that exactly yep okay but in this case we're going to be in uh, our uh, little trivia uh, app we're going to stay on the same page exactly exactly now the last step so we figured out how we're going to collect the info figured out how we're going to send it up the last step then becomes how we're going to read that information and what you're going to notice is that there's a request form collection where it's going to look for the names on the input controls, match them up, and give me the ability to pull those in. So it's so, going to be so that's form. how that's how in my Python code, yes. I can say, tell me what they typed into that form. Exactly, exactly, and that's what we're going to be doing. So you'll notice here, input type equals text, name equals answer. Inside of my Python, it's going to be name equals. So we just declare a variable here, and then request form answer, and you'll notice answer and those have to match because I have I'll tell you the number of times I've made typing mistakes between those two <laughs> and said why am I not getting a value in my Python code and then I'm like oh wait never mind I have a typing mistake between the two variable names I, I, I have a great memory it's just really short um, and so the number of times where I'll, I'll put in something over here and then I go into the Python code and I just completely forget 
what it is that uh, that I've done. Um, I really do recommend either one of two things that either A, um, you just do them both in tangent. So I go in, create my little bit of code, and then immediately create the form, or B, that I go in and I um, simply fire up two browser windows so that way I can see them both side by side. Yeah, have the code editor windows side by side. It, That's it, why you want two monitors. By the way, if you haven't done it yet, as you get into coding one day, you're going to want dual monitors. Oh, every <laughs> developer. Uh, when I take over the world, uh, which will happen, um, every developer is going to have dual monitors, if not three. Yeah, I, have, yeah. I have three at my desk. Yep. And I cannot imagine um, living uh, living without it. Yeah, yeah, every developer needs dual monitors. Okay, let's go in and uh, and create a uh, a form here. And this is going to be sort of a little bit of trust me, we're we're we're, we're going to get you there. Um, but I am going to. Um, sort of do this in steps. So I'm just going to create a new folder here that I'm going to call templates. We'll talk about why in a minute. Yep. And I'm going to create a uh, brand new form here. So I'm going to say add, uh, and I'm going to say new item. And this is going to be create question. There we go. And whoops, I did I say, that as a Pi file. I, say, I didn't think you wanted yeah, a yeah, Python yeah, file. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the number of mistakes you make yeah. is always directly proportional to the number of people watching you. Um, yeah, I noticed the moment I had a blank file, I'm like, wait a minute, it's, it's supposed <laughs> to be getting HTML. I don't want to type this in. Um, uh, great question. All right, so you're basically creating an HTML file, which yep. is just something basic that HTML you can. Could... Okay. Yeah. So just create a new question. And then I'm going to go ahead and say, let's say H2, um, please create a new question. And then I'm going to create my little form. And I'm going to say method equals. Post, and you are going to notice, by the way, the IntelliSense does show me other verbs: mm -hmm. um, delete, put. Um, there's also a couple of others. Um, the only two that we're interested in today are get and post. Okay. So post, which again is going to send it in the header info, and then I'm going to go ahead and say uh, div, and I'm going to. I'm actually going to get a little fancy here because I'm just feeling like it. Um, so I'm just going to say for equals um, title, and I'm going to say title. And uh, what that little label is going to do is it's going to look for an input control with a name that matches. So you'll notice name equals title. And so if you click on title, the text title, it will automatically put the focus or put your cursor into that text box. Good. And that's one of those little things that you should get into the habit of because it makes it um, uh, more usable with touch. Because then I can touch not only the text box, but the text as well. And, um, and these days with mobile devices and tablets, you're going to have a lot of people using your website uh, on touch devices. So it's something, yeah, build up good ha touch habits early. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, really just designed for touch first. Now, I am going to um, uh, sort of be a little bit lazy here. Um, and so this is going to be for the uh, question and question and question. So basically what you're creating is a text box, which Yeah, you is, talk, I'll type. Yeah, exactly. So we got a, a, a text box to display where somebody can enter a title to sort of and specify a category for the type of question they're going to do for our trivia app. We're creating a text box where they can type in a question that they can quiz somebody with and somewhere where they can type the correct answer. Because our goal, the final app we're, we're going to actually be building today, is a little trivia application where you can submit trivia questions and then people can try to answer the different trivia questions. That's exactly it. And each trivia question has a title, it has a question, and it has an answer. There it is. And so that's exactly the form that I have just created right here. Now, let's create one other one real quick here. So I'm just going to go in, and I'm going to say add, new item. And we're going to go to the other side here. And let's go ahead and call this answer question. OK, so this is going to be the form which someone's going to use to answer a question. Or to be, uh, is this going to be the one where they, yes. they will be prompted with a question and they type in an answer? That's correct. Uh, OK, right. Yeah. So on this page, basically, we're going to need to display the question that they have to answer. And we're going to need some sort of text box where they can type in the actual answer to the question that they're prompted with. That's exactly it. Keep talking. Uh, keep talking. All right. And uh, you can see that, once again, we need a form because when we want to send the results back to the server, we're going to need to have a form to do that. And of course, we post the completed form back to the server. And that's going to allow our Python code, when it receives the form back, uh, to actually find out what they typed in as an answer. Because we're going to have to write Python code to see if they typed in the right answer or the wrong answer. 
and then react to that. There it is. Okay. So, um, so just like Susan said, so we're creating two different forms here. This is where you're going to be able to upload questions. Now, I know we haven't seen the form yet, mm -hmm. um, and 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 we'll go in and 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 see that in a second. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? Um, I'm going to do it this way. Um, watch this. Is you know I just created basic HTML. So let me actually just go into um, here and trivia MVA, trivia MVA. Um, templates. So there's my basic HTML file. Yeah. So let me just right click, open with Internet Explorer, and sure enough, there is that little form that we just created. And if I hit submit answer, that would then uh, then upload it. And then the exact same thing would hold true here is if I say open with and uh, Internet Explorer, you'll notice again that there is the, the, the one for creating the new question. Right, because as we said, HTML is a language that the browsers understand. So, exactly. So you don't, once you've got it, so all we've literally done here is said, here's an HTML page. You could yep. just ask a browser to display that HTML page, but then when they press submit button, there's no, it doesn't know what Python code to call. That's where all this Flask stuff comes in, and that's why the HTML is part of our bigger application. Exactly, yep. Yeah, so that's, that's what we need now. Susan mentioned a big point here, that this is going to eventually display, hey, enter the, uh, the correct uh, text of the question. You know what I need right here? I need the question. Yes, this is true. Somehow we have to, because you're right, somehow Python has to have a way of saying, here's the question to display to the user, and then we can check if they have the right answer. Yep. Cool. Well, guess what? We got a technology for that. I Glad to hear it, otherwise we'd be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Jinja. So, what is Jinja? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's like a ninja template. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the names in, in this Flask Python. I'm just having too much fun with Oh, absolutely. Names. Yeah, you gotta have fun with the names. Um, so, Jinja is a uh, template language, and it, in a nutshell, gives you the ability to inject code into HTML. And, and that's actually why I just jumped right ahead and I just created the template folder, created a couple of HTML files, because those are basic HTML. And I am going to be able to inject my own code into there just by using Jinja. So for example, if I wanted a bit of code to detect whether or not the person was right and display congratulations, you're right. Or maybe I want to go in and display, sorry, you didn't get the question right. Mm -hmm. Then I can go in and do that. But here's the thing, of course. If I say, sorry, you didn't get the question right, sorry, um, then we're going to need to be able to display what they answered uh -huh. and what the correct answer is. So I need so a way. Need placeholders, yeah. Yeah, so I need a way so that uh, my Python code needs a way of saying, hey, when you display that, that HTML back to the user, um, can we pass some values back to display on that page? That's exactly it. That is exactly it. And so that's what Jinja allows me to do. So these templates are just HTML, nothing fancy, and they're going to be inside of a folder, wait for it, called templates. So you're putting the routes into a file called routes.py, and now you're storing templates in a folder called templates. I try to keep things as confusing as possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Now, one of the interesting things is that Jinja does have a code syntax. So if you want to inject if statements and for loops and so forth into Jinja, you can. And you are going to notice that it's similar to Python, but it's not Python. <laughs> just, in, just close enough to confuse you. Yeah, something <laughs> like that. Um, that if I, all I want is placeholders, then I can do that very easily just by using double curly. So double curly placeholder will automatically display those variables in that spot. The question is, well, how are those variables going to be set? Well, as it turns out, there's a brand new method that we're going to have uh -huh. called render template. So we call this, this is Python code, this method up here. This, top. this is uh, Python code up top. This is the name of the template. So it's automatically going to look inside of that little templates folder for something in my case called template HTML. Okay. Sort of abbreviating there. There we go. Yep. And it's also, in my case, going to pass in two parameters called name yep. and called so now oh. when I'm saying display that page, I have a way of saying, hey, I want this name to go here. I want this value to go here. That's exactly it. Cool. That's exactly it. And you can also get in and add logic as well. So if you did want to do an if statement, you could do an if statement. If you wanted to do a for statement, which is the first demo that I had on this slide, you can do that as well. Now here's the, um, uh, the catch. 
is the way that control blocks work, so for loops and, and, and if statements, the way that they work is based on tabs, based on positioning. It doesn't really work in HTML. Because my positioning is going to change really depending on my HTML, that I want to be able to format my HTML and just have a little bit of code there. So the tabbing isn't always going to come out quite the way that I'm going to want it when I'm dealing with both HTML as well as code. So as a result, we need to get a little bit more explicit here that you're going to notice that we've got end for to end our for block. And you'll notice that we've got end if to end our if block. Now I also want to highlight the little correct there and my little names here. And those in my case are simulating parameters that would be passed in again by using that little render template. So if you gave me a collection of names to display, then I could display all of those. And if you give me a Boolean value, then I can react to that. Now, earlier on this morning, one of the big things that we talked about was the concept of Python Flask and it being a stepping stone yep. for other technologies. So that maybe you want to use this and you want to go off and learn Node, or you want to learn PHP, or you want to learn something near and dear to my heart, MVC. There's an MVA for that. Um, if you want to go off and learn those technologies, a lot of what you're learning today is going to be applicable to there. So let's take MVC, for example. MVC has what are known as views. Views in uh, Flask terms are templates that what they're designed to do is to display our data. So these Jinja templates we're creating are kind of like views in MVC. That's exactly it. Okay. That's exactly it. And so as a result, since, again, we're just learning this, we should really start to get into some best practices here. Yes. And good to pick up good habits right off the top. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so as a result, what we want to do is, when we're talking about a view, is keep it a view. That there's this little concept of you know, model view controller, where our model is, is our data, our, our view is how we're going to see it, and then the controller is going to be kind of working a little bit behind the scenes to take the model, combine it with the view, and, and, and send it out the door. Our view should basically be dumb. It should not know about what's going on behind the scenes. It should simply take some data and display it. Right. It shouldn't have business rules, but say things like, oh, if the answer was correct, then I want to do this. If the answer's wrong, I do something else. That's starting to get to the, the logic of how your program works. And yeah, you don't generally put that inside views. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they really shouldn't contain a whole lot of logic. So let that route method that you've been using determine which view to load and then create different views for different output because you know if we wanted to really you know keep digging into this and, and and start creating a lot of error handling and things like that you know we're gonna want a view to display an error message and we're gonna want a view to display this was correct and this was incorrect and and this is how we're gonna ask you for uh, for the answer to the question because that in the long run is going to make things that much more flexible because I get to focus then my attention on how do I want this to be displayed and how do I want this to be displayed rather than than injecting a whole bunch of code, because when you start to do that, it's just going to get confusing after a little while. Um, and by the way, while we're talking about a little route methods, it's also not a bad idea to even start creating separate Python files for all of that complex logic, or maybe create classes. Hmm. Hmm. Classes. You know, we should we should we should talk about creating another MVA. On, on, on creating classes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Let's, let, let's talk later. Absolutely. Okay. Sounds All good. Right. Yeah. All right. In any event, let's sidestep a little bit here and talk about how we're going to bring all of this together into building our app. So the app that we want is a basic trivia game. So we want to be able to do two things. We want to be able to add questions and answer questions. That's what we want. Yep. Now, if, if you want homework, Later on, you can add on additional functionality. Maybe the ability to uh, delete questions. Maybe the ability to modify questions. So this is going to be kind of our basics. So we want to add questions. We want to answer them. If you want to keep building on from there, you could keep building on from there. So what are we going to need for this? Well, we're going to need the ability to add our questions. So we need a page with a form. 
to add a question. Hey, we've got that already. Yep. We need a page to say it was saved. Yep. Okay, well, we're going to have to create that Yeah, yet. we don't have that yet. And then we need somewhere to save the question. And that's coming up. That's coming up. The next we don't module. have that yet. Yep. That's when I get to, uh, to <laughs> dominate the conversation a little. <laughs> <laughs> you get to, to, to write code. And I'm just going to, you know, lean back, <laughs> yeah. play on my phone. Um, in any event, um, <laughs> the next little thing right here is you're going to notice that we also need the ability to um, answer questions. So we need a page for the form. We've got that. Yep. We need a page to say you're correct. We need that. And we need a page to say that you're wrong. And again, we need that. And we need somewhere to save that question. And again, that's going to be Susan. And so these two items, we're going to see after our break, these three items and the logic to make all of that happen. We're going to see that here in just a couple of moments. But just to um, put out the big picture there. Our moving parts, there's our route pi file. We've got our create and our question title. And that was what routes.py was what controlled when someone types in a particular URL, which pages and so on are being displayed. And that's exactly it. Yep. We've got those two little methods. We created those earlier. And now we're going to link those up to templates. So we're going to have our create question and created question. Probably not the best name, but yeah, it'll work. It'll work. And then we're also going to need for the question side. Uh, a form for answer question, and then a correct and an incorrect. So those are going to be the moving parts. This already done. This already done. I need to create this. I need to create this. I need to create this. And I need to update those two. Oof. Guess what that I'm is, about to do. That's quite the to-do list. Okay, so wait a second. So we have, uh, so basically we have a few new web pages we're going to need to create. Yep. And uh, we need to make sure we've updated our code so that when the templates are expecting values, that we're passing in the correct values to them. Exactly. All that's right. Exactly. It. Okay. I think I can so, keep up with that. Cool. I'm going to start by creating the HTML, just because that's sort of the easier side, and then I'm going to go back and take a look at the code, so that way we've kind of got that nice clean separation. And I am going to come back to the slide a couple of times, just so we can um, kind of keep seeing all of that um, as we move forward. But let's go in, fire up Visual Studio here, and let's start off by updating our answer question here. So again, we needed to add, uh, add in our question. Yep. Watch. Right. So now you're using that Jinja uh, uh, syntax mm -hmm. to specify that when this page is displayed, I'm going to pass you in a question to display there. That's exactly it. And let's also go in and add in another real quick new item here. And let's add in the um, correct, which is spelled ECT. Okay. By the way, one little thing to get yourself into the habit of, again, you know, speaking of good habits, sure. always have a title. Always. Oh, yeah. Always yeah. have a title. Always, always, always. Okay. So let's just go in, let's say H2, and congratulations. You yeah. are correct. So this is the page that's going to be displayed when somebody has attempted to answer a question and they've answered it correctly. So that's it. just a nice, simple page that says, congratulations, you've answered it correctly. And let's go to the other side. Which is if they get it incorrect? Yep. All right. So if this page will be displayed, if somebody attempts to answer a question and answers it inter incorrectly. And so yes, now what we want to do is let's go in. And again, we'll go with an H2. Sorry, um, you are incorrect. And then let's go in and let's say um, div. Uh, the answer is. And let's go in and once again, curly curly. Ah. Because now, yeah, the nice thing is if somebody's got the incorrect answer, it'd be nice to tell them what the correct answer was. Exactly. So, yeah. So, so. we'll go in and we'll call that uh, answer. And then we'll go in and say div and uh, you said, apparently I've lost my ability to type, <laughs> um, curly curly, and submitted answer. So we'll have to go in and create those variables. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll go back and do that in a minute. But the big thing that I want to highlight here is I want you to notice that you know, I didn't do anything fancy here. That I went straight from 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 text into the Jinja and into the HTML, and that's one of the very cool parts is that you could just drop these wherever it is that you need that dynamic text. So wherever you need it, just boom, and 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 there it is. So just that simple to go in and uh, and set up. So I really love uh, love love that uh, that capability. Cool. But obviously, at some point, I could have to go update code to put values, to make sure that when we display that page, we pass in values for answer and submitted answer. Yeah, we'll need to get there. Um, but before I do that. We still have some more pages. Yeah, I, I I think have like one more. 
uh, created questions. So this is the page that comes out uh, because we're going to let the people who visit our website add their own questions. So this is the page that's going to come up and tell them that we've successfully accepted the question they've submitted. That's correct. Uh, you asked, and let's just say curly curly, question. Beautiful. Okay. See, just like that. And, and again, the big thing that I want you to notice here is that 90% of this page is what? It's basic HTML. That's it. And only the little bits that we need here are that bit of Jinja. And that's one of the things that I really love about these, these Jinja templates is that it, it makes it very easy to go in and, uh, and do that. Okay. So let's, um, let's go back to my slide, um, just because I think now is kind of a, a perfect reset point here. And uh, boom, 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 boom. There so you've now created all the forms you have listed there. Exactly. So we, we did the form. We did the um, basic uh, HTML for correct, for incorrect, and for created question. OK. Now we just need to update the code to call all of that. Now, I am going to, as I kick back into Visual Studio here, make my life a little easier. There's two little things that I'm going to need to make this work. Okay. I am going to need request. Remember, that's what we're getting from the user, request. Yep. Yeah, we're going to use that request.form to ask for values from forms. That's it. And I'm also going to need my render template. So I'm just going to call those right now. I, I need those now. One of the things that people frequently ask me is they ask, hey, Christopher, how am I supposed to remember that? And chances are there's probably a couple of people asking that in, in, uh, in the forums right now. And my answer is really kind of threefold. Number one, you know, check out a book, check out the documentation, check out a website, which will explain it all. Uh, number two, watch an MVA, a video like this. Uh, number three, I guess, take a course. Um, and then number four is to actually get in and do it. Because kind of going back to our language analogy here, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to learn vocabulary. So how did I wind up learning the term phantasmagoria? Well, the way that I wound up learning the term phantasmagoria, which by the way is for, for very vivid, lifelike, um, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes a little bit weird uh, dreams. Um, so Phantasmagoria, the way that I wound up learning that was just through the people that I wound up meeting. And, and uh, sort of a long story, but I, I wound up learning this word because of a couple of people that I met and through just usage and being exposed to the English language. Sort of that same concept here. So how, how are you supposed to know this? You get in and, and you keep reading, you keep learning, and you keep using it. And after a little while, it's all going to start to mesh. So a lot of times people will see this and they, they start to go, oh, I'm never going to remember this. Here's the great thing is there's a lot of blog posts, documentation, classes, videos, etc., where you can go learn it and you can refer back to it as well. Don't be afraid to go look things up. We all do it. So don't feel the need to memorize it. Just you will start to just kind of learn this after, uh, after a little while. Yeah. Okay. Phantasmagoria is one of my favorite words. So it's discombobulated. It has such an onomatopoetic quality about it. Um, Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Before oh. I get completely lost, it's too, it's, 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 uh, okay. I'm, I'm, anyway, so, uh, let's go in and, um, start putting together our, uh, our create. Now, if you remember, what we want to be able to do is set up those two little spots here for the get and for the post. That remember with get, this is where we're going to send down the form that the user is then going to use. And remember on the post, this is where they've actually given us that data and they're um, going to be sending that back up. So that's how we're going to know, do they want the form or are they giving us data? Mm -hmm. So on the create side, here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if request method and for whatever reason, I'm getting no completions, but I promise you this will work. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and say, if it happens to be get. So what this tells me is that we need to send the user the form. Right. That's it. So this was like when uh, initially when somebody wanted to comment on the koala picture, we started off by saying, oh, well, let me give you a blank form to enter the comment. In this case, we're sending them a blank form so they can enter their question. Exactly. 
So now I'm just simply going to say render template, and now it's going to ask me for the name, and this is going to be create question HTML, just like that. Otherwise, if it's request uh, method, uh -huh. and if it happens to be post, well, now what I know is that they submitted the form, so now I need to read the form data and save it. Right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make your life a little easier here. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, Thank you. And I'm going to say title equals request form title. And if you remember from before, we you know had all that in, in there. All right. And I'm just going to make my life a little easier. Answer and uh, question. So these are the, these names. When you say request form title, request form answer, request form question, these are the same names that we're going to see inside at HTML. There we go. Title, question, and answer. There All right. Go. Awesome. So yep. that's how it knows which fields to read from the form. That's exactly it. Now, um, what I'm going to do um, at the very end here is I am going to add in um, an else block. Um, just to say return invalid request. You did mention there were some other ways you could submit. I mean, we're only using get and post in our code, but... Exactly, yeah. So there could be other verbs. I don't care about any of them, um, but you know, one of the things that you should always do is account for the fact that somebody may send up um, a, a bad request. So that's why I'm going to throw in that, uh, that else block. Um, but in any event, back to our, our little post here. The next thing that I need to do is store this in the database. So that we can store that and have yep. access to it and later on if somebody wants that question asked. Yep. Uh, yes, this is where Susan will have to do some work. There All right, go. make that note for me. I'll come back <laughs> later and I promise I'll come back and I'll add some code there. Perfect. And then uh, the next little thing is I want to... It'll come to me in a second. Oh, uh, return the template. So yes. we'll say uh, return, uh, render, uh, template, and uh, this is going to be created question. And if you remember on uh, created question, over here, we wanted to display the question. Right. So in the template, you'd said, you're going to give me a value for question here. So when we call it, we're going to have to pass it a value for question. And so you'll notice I'm going to say question equals Oh, I liked Quesiton. Or, or Quesiton. <laughs> um, now, you know, this is one of those um, things here. When you look at that, it sort of looks a little odd. You're setting question equal to question. You might be thinking, well, what in the world are you doing? Yeah, question equals question is a little well, confusing. Yeah, of course yeah. question equals question. You know, generally speaking, yes, that's true. Um, here's the thing, is that the second question is pulling from, I should really draw my line to the right spot, um, it's pulling from that question variable that I created over here. Okay. This first one right here, this is becoming that brand new parameter. That's the, that's the name that was inside created question.html. Exactly. So you look at it, and it just sort of seems odd. And, it's a little and, confusing at first yeah, glance, for and, sure. And, and I'm completely with you on that. It, it, it does look a little bit odd. But if you didn't just simply go with that, what you'd wind up having to do is come up with essentially an arbitrary naming convention just to separate the parameter question from the question variable. And, and you do see people that do that. They'll call it like T question equals V question for the yeah, variable question or, versus template question. Yeah, and yeah. M and P and yeah, all sorts of P question, T question, P question. You know, <laughs> if it's a question, it's a question. And, and just keep it with that. And honestly, I think in the long run, it is, it is going to make your code more, more readable. Okay. So now let's go in and uh, let's build up the, um, uh, the second one here, uh, which is going to be uh, question title. So um, uh, what we're going to need here is, once again, um, if our request uh, method is get, and this is again going to be where we need to, I'm just going to make sure my tabbing is in the right spot. There we go. Um, send the user the form. So this is going to be return uh, render template, and this is going to be an answer question. Mm -hmm. That's what I call it. Answer question HTML. And again, we're going to need the question. So we'll say question equals question, which means up top here that we're going to need to grab the question. So I'm going to need to say question equals question here. Yep. Um, but of course, you know we don't want to hard code that in. 
we are going to want to get um, um, some data. So once again, um, we'll go in and say uh, read question from data store. That and, looks like uh, more work for me to do later. Yep, Susan, um, please add code here. All right. And then uh, we'll go and say um, LF and request. Come here. So once again, this is the idea of somebody's. We're gonna somebody's gonna be asking. A, we, somebody wants to try and answer one of our trivia questions. So first, they pass in a web page with the category or title of the question they want to be asked, and then we say, "Oh, do you want that?" So we pass them back the question with the blank in a blank form, so that they can type in an answer, and then they type in the answer, and they hit that submit button, and that submit and that form. We said forms do a post when you hit that submit button. Correct. So then when it comes back here, it goes to the post. So they've now typed in an answer, and we come back, and we can look up that answer. That is correct. Double equals. Um, now, here's the thing, is that we now need to, once again, do a little bit of work here, because now we need to go get that question, um, or read the answer, rather. Read uh -huh. the answer from the data store. Yep. To see if they gave us the correct answer. Correct. So, Susan, we're going to need some more code here. All right. We'll see what we can do. All right. So, uh, what I'm going to do for uh, right now is I'm just simply going to say answer equals um, answer, uh -huh. just because I want a placeholder. Sure. Um, and then uh, down below, I'm going to say if it turns out that the submitted answer equals the answer, right? then we're going to go in and say render template. And they were correct. I need to return that. I know. And that one, we didn't uh, specify any particular variables inside that particular render template, so we don't have to pass in any, any parameters except which HTML template to display. That's correct. HTML, and I want um, submitted answer. Right, because when we were telling, we, we did say design our template for when you tell them it's an incorrect answer, that we were going to tell them uh, you answered this, but the correct answer was this. Correct. That template. So that one, we do have to pass its parameters. I need a colon. Um, there we go. Okay. okay. Now, um, so we've got all of this now baked in. So um, just to kind of walk through the logic here. Uh, what you're going to notice is if it turns out that it's a get and then what we're going to do is we're going to load up the question, and we're going to display out the little form that shows the question and the little text box where they can answer it. If it turns out that it's post, what that does is that tells us that they made the submission. So then in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to read the answer that they gave us from the form. We're going to load the answer up from the data store. We're going to check to see if they got it right. If they did, we send them correct. Otherwise, we send them incorrect. Okay. So that's sort of the, uh, the review there. Now, the last thing that we need to do is we need to also add in the methods that this is now going to accept. We need to tell it to actually accept both get and post. Now, in theory, this also kind of means that I don't necessarily need that invalid. I still like to have it there, um, just because I think it's a, a good practice that if you know that there's potentially multiple items here, that it could be that it could be, you know, get post, delete, um, and a few others. Let's just make sure that we've got a catch all. And so that's why yeah. I like that down at, uh, at the very bottom. Okay. Now, give me two seconds. I'm just going to scan my code. Give it a glance through. And I just want to make sure that I can actually call something here. So let me, we're really cooking here. I give this a 70% chance. All so right. So create a question. Let's hit create. Title. Um, hey, can test. you do me one quick little thing? Could you bring up that command window again? Because I think it's neat the way you can see if it's doing the get or the posts. So yeah. we can see how the first time it's actually bringing up that page. When it's requesting form, you can see it's doing gets, gets, and gets. It hasn't actually done a post yet. Correct. Yep. And by the way, ignore the fave icon. That just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's that. So let's go in, and I'm just going to go very creative um, uh, here. Um, test. Uh, question is, uh, when was the Battle of Hastings? And I'm going to go with uh, 1066, which is the right answer. And I'm going to click Submit. And sure enough, you're going to notice that it tells me, um, thank you for your question, you asked 
When was the Battle of, uh, of Hastings? Now, you'll also notice that I did, in fact, um, uh, set all of that up. But, of course, I don't have a data store, so it's not actually stored behind the scenes. But the main point that I want to highlight here is the fact that this is baked off of that template. And to go all the way back to something that we mentioned earlier this morning, this is going to work regardless of the browser. And, and, and you'll notice... It, 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 there's, nothing, there's no way that I, as the user, can tell that this used a template. This is HTML. I have no idea that this actually used a, uh, a template. And if I bring up a non-competitor browser from another company, and I paste in that exact same URL, chugga, 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 come on. Did I close out my command prompt? Oh, okay. It was just there it is. Just taking, taking some time. Yep. So we'll go with um, test and uh, what is your name? And Christopher, not really a trivia question, um, and hit submit. You're going to notice it works. So again, regardless of the browser, it still works. Right, because... Uh, and it, you can't even tell it was written in Python. Exactly. Because and that's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. It's just HTML that gets sent up to that browser. And what the server is doing is irrelevant. Cool. So just to kind of review here, we've now got the create and question methods created. Yep. We've got our create question and our created question. Yep. So both steps there. And then answer question and both the right and wrong there. But the last thing that we're missing is the data store. Right. That's your job. But I'm hungry. I think everybody could uh, <laughs> use a little break because it's amazing how much you guys, if you look at that code now and yeah. how much you've really mastered, there's a lot of content. Yeah, so, so really, you know, what, what did we learn here? Um, well, you're going to notice that we learned how to create and use those Jinja templates. Yep. We learned how to create those, um, uh, those forms. And so now we actually have enough to start creating real-world applications that don't use databases. Yeah. We'll get to that, yeah. but let's go ahead, we'll take a meal break, and we're going to be back in about an hour. Enjoy. See you soon. All right. Well, uh, welcome back to uh, Introduction to Websites using uh, Python and Flask alongside Susan Ibeck. I am Christopher Harrison. Now, up until this point, we've been building out our server-side components uh, on, uh, on Flask. We took a look at our Jinja templates, and we really got a very nice structure around an application to start doing all of our little trivia and storing and asking questions and so forth. But you know what we need? Well, we have a basic problem. Somebody enters a question, and we have no way of remembering what question they gave us. Yeah, we need somewhere to store all of that. Yeah, so um, where can we store this data? We're going to need some sort of data store. Okay. So that's what we want to focus in on now. So up until now, we've been very focused on how do we communicate with the, between the browser, or users at the browser doing something, sending information back to our Python code, sending information back to the user. But there are times we need to remember what happened in between or from session to session. You think about it, if you're placing an order at an online store, well, we need to be able to remember what you ordered so we can ship it to you later. So we do need an debate to, kind of a good thing. to store that information. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about some different data storage options. And then we'll, we'll delve into one of them in particular so that you have at least uh, a couple of different tools in your toolkit that you can use to remember values. Perfect. I love it. All right. So let's jump in. Um, said, lots of websites need that ability to remember data. If you think about it, order information on online stores. You can ship it when it arrives. High score tables on video games. Uh, just remembering your favorite products, you know, what you would looked at last time you were here. That kind of stuff happens all the time on websites. Yeah, I basically say uh, that websites really are just a, a front end to a database. When you get right down to it, that's quite frequently it is, hey, here's my facade, my database in the back, and we're just going to, to be sending data back and forth between there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of different ways. You have so many choices, really, in terms of how you actually physically store the data that you need to remember when you're on a website. 
Um, one of the options is store data just in a text file. Yep. You know, it's an option. Yeah, you've got code. You can write code things, store it in a text file, and read it back when you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, XML files. And I'll explain what XML files are in, in just a moment. We're going to get to that. Relational databases, uh, that's definitely another popular option as well. Seth and I will explain <laughs> what makes it a relational database in particular. And the idea of what we call NoSQL databases. That's another term you hear a lot. So let's we'll basically take a look at each of these options, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of the pros and cons sure. of these different choices. I like it. Something tells me that NoSQL is going to have um, NoSQL. You think there's NoSQL used for NoSQL? I'm, I'm, I'm going on a limb here. Then I'm going to go on the, a limb and, and guess that somewhere else there is SQL. OK. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's the corollary to that. OK. So when you get down to that, trying to make the decision of which data storage option you should use, the answer is always going to be the dreaded, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> that is the generic. If anyone ever asks you, how should I do the following in insert programming language here, the answer is, well, always. it depends. It depends. <laughs> it's, it's the safest answer for everything. Um, but in this case, it really is true. <laughs> so let's take a look at those four basic options and, and just talk a little bit about what they are so that maybe you'll be able to make the right decision and figure out when it depends yes. on what. Yes. At least you know what it depends on. Um, so the first option is to use a text file. And if you, uh, text files usually just comma separated variable files. Uh, you can open them up in things like Notepad. And they're just files that you can store right on the file system, same place that you're storing your code. Mm -hmm. And they can contain text data. As I said, most of the time we'll use these comma separated variable or CSV files. And, you know, so there's a typical sort of file there. And they're, they work very well if you want to store very simple data. It's, it's a perfectly valid way to store store information. Yeah, if you just need like, you know, a couple of nodes, a couple of just very simplistic key value pairs, just some place to just, you know, throw some data, the text file will work. It will, you know? absolutely. Yeah, and not the more, most robust solution. No, but, no, it's, but it'll work. it will work. And if you took the introduction to Python MVA, we actually covered in modules 11 and 12, we covered all the code you can use in Python to read and write from text files. So we have covered that. I'm not going to go through it again, but that is absolutely an option. So what we showed you in that course is a real world scenario that is mm -hmm. sometimes used. The limitations, though, of text files, if we actually take a look at this sort of uh, file right here, one of the things that you run into is if you take a look at it, you know, all the records, uh, we've got a bunch of records at the top. And these, I know these represent different people and mm -hmm. their ages. But underneath, I have uh, some information about some companies. And the problem is, if I write a program that's going to try and read this information, one of the problems it's going to have is it doesn't know when am I looking at an employee record and when am I looking at a company record. Yep. So it's going to read Northwind Toys Company and think that's a person's name. And when it sees 11 Any Street, it might try to read that in as an employee ID or as an age. And, and then it's going to go, what's this Toronto, Ontario, Canada stuff doing at the top? And it, it's all messed up. And, and on top of that, what you'd be trying to do is convert the age into a number. You're going to see 1180 Street, and then all of a sudden things are just going to, to blow up at that point because it's not going to be able to convert 1180 Street into, uh, into a number. Right. And this is why we say text files aren't a particularly robust way of storing data because we have no way of saying what data type is this, what is this data. The programmer has to know how that data is formatted. And the person who creates the file had better create it right because if they don't create it right, it's going to blow up when you try and read the data. Absolutely. So, yes, it works, but not always going to be our best solution. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time on any street, by the way. Have you spent a lot of yeah. time on any street? Yeah, any street. Yeah. Um, so the other option, of course, if you're worried about, you know, okay, I can't tell if it's an employee information or company information, a lot of people might choose to split it across two files instead. Mm -hmm. So if we look at this example here, uh, again, we've got information on companies and we've got information on employees. And you go, well, hey, I can solve that problem not being able to tell them apart. I'll just put them in separate files. I could see a lot of files being generated by the end of that. Yeah, you could end up with a lot of files. And this will, again, this will work. And another one of the things about this, and you will see that very naturally, there exists when you start working with files and with data, but there's often a relationship between the data and the different files. Mm -hmm. There's a very good chance here that, you know, the, uh, that certain employees may work at Northwind Toys specifically. And some of these employees work for Tailspin Toys. 
So they're working at different places. How do I know that by just looking at these two files? There's nothing to indicate which employees work at which company. I don't have a way of doing that. No, you really don't. You really don't. I mean, you're basically just sort of uh, on your own to try to figure out, okay, well, now which is which. And if you tried to then start inserting in some brand new rows, things could go sideways in a hurry there. Yeah. yeah. And that sort of type, that type of data comes up a lot in different scenarios. If you think of customers who are placing orders at a company, if even in a trivia application like ours, we mm -hmm. can sort of set up, you might be able to request different categories of questions, and mm -hmm. then you get all the questions for that category. Just being able to do that, like what, are, what is the list of categories, what are the list of questions per category, can become very difficult if you're just using text files. But again, if all you want to do is store a few values so you can look them up later, absolutely, you can do it with a text file, it will work. So uh, a couple of other limitations to be aware of when we talk about pros and cons. Uh, one of the other challenges is if you only want one record in the file and the file has 500 records in it, guess how you find record 143? <laughs> you read one, record one, record two, record three, record four, record five, record six, records. OK, I'm done now. Uh, until just, you You're just doing this the whole time, just the exactly. you know, index cards. No, yeah, exactly. No, no, no. Just imagine you know, if the rule was, if you were trying to look up, a, a, you, I remember there was a time in our lives we had these things called phone books. A what? A phone book. And you could look up phone numbers in them. But imagine if, no. if you wanted to get one number out of the phone book, you had to read all the numbers before it. Uh, that's going to be a very slow way of looking up somebody's <laughs> phone number. So again, it's not going to be the fastest way to retrieve a single record. If you're always retrieving all the values, it's fine. But if you're constantly just trying to get one value back, that's again a place where text files start to fall apart in terms of not being the optimal solution. Right. Um, sorry, we uh, covered that. Some reason I went backwards instead of forwards. <laughs> All right, now let's take a look at another option. This one's sort of, um, it's interesting. It's sort of a transition to the world of databases. But, so it solves some of the problems of text files. Okay. And that is an XML file. An XML, um, if we take a look at an XML file, if you take a look at this file, it may kind of look like some other code we were looking like this morning. Because... Well, it looks kind of similar. Yeah, it, it may look a little bit like, look, we have, uh, we have open and closing brackets. Uh, angle brackets. We have the idea of opening and closing tags. Um, this looks a lot like HTML when you open it up. It does. It, it, it really does. In fact, uh, HTML stands for hypertext markup language, and XML actually stands for extended markup language. So it's intended to look like HTML. Mm -hmm. um, so that is quite deliberate. But what's interesting about XML is, in the end, it is just a way of saying, here is some data. Whereas HTML is designed for you to tell a browser, hey, I want to put a text box here, and I want this text to be in bold, and I want to put a button here and create this form. The XML language is designed to say, I have a record, mm -hmm. and this is a list of employees, and each employee has an ID and a name and is a company that they work for. So that's how XML is designed. Its, its tags are all designed to let you specify, here's the information that I'm storing. So you're describing the, the, the data then, rather than uh, what you frequently do in HTML. Um, and you should try and stay, uh, stay away from it. But you can often describe in HTML how you want the data to look, mm -hmm. but not necessarily describing the data. XML is all about describing the data. Data, yes. Okay. It describes the data. So if you take another look at this, uh, this example, XML again. Now, what's neat about this, you think back to our when we had just a CSV file. Um, whoops, that's what I meant to do. So if I had a CSV file, this would have just been that I had Doyle McCarthy here, and then I had you know two Jody Mills. Can't type, apparently. <laughs> apparently, I should I, be drinking yeah. caffeine. <laughs> um, so if I had done it that way, you can see sort of I get this. This would be what it would look like in a CSV file. Right. But how do I know that the value of 1 is an employee ID? I don't. It's, it's only based on position. And, and what would happen if uh, somebody else who wrote into that file flipped those two? Yeah. You'd be in real trouble at that point trying to parse and, and figure all of that out. Whereas, right, so if somebody put in Doyle comma 1 instead of 1 comma Doyle, suddenly I'm trying to read the file, it's going to mess things up. The neat thing if we look at the XML is you'll actually see that I say here's the value 1, but I specifically specify that's an employee ID. Mm -hmm. And this is also for the employee. This employee also has a name, and that employee's name is Doyle McCarty. 
Mm -hmm. So for each employee, I have that ability to be very specific and to describe, as you put it, it's describing the actual data. I'm saying this is employee information. Yep. What am I telling you about the employee? I'm telling you their ID is two yep. and that their name is Jody Mills. And, and, and you can tell that without knowing anything else in, in advance. And really, even if you didn't know anything about XML, you, you, you look at that document and it basically just describes, hey, this is what we got going on here. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's fairly intuitive. Building them for the first time is always a little confusing, but it's funny. If I'd handed you that file and said, what do you think this is? You probably would have figured out it's a list of employees and that's their IDs and names. Yep. So it's also very self-describing and that's yes. another nice thing about XML. Uh, so those tags said describe the data inside the file so we can see those different names and IDs. The other interesting thing about XML is we can mix and match different types of records in a single file. So it's perfectly valid. In this case, I have a, a list of employees, but they all belong to the company. Mm -hmm. So I specified, first of all, wait, first I have a company, and that company is Tailsman Toys, and here's all the employees that are part of that company. So those elements act as containers then? Yeah, it's, I'm sort of showing a parent-child type mm -hmm. relationship yeah. almost. So it's like, like the parent company here, for his parent company of Tailsman Toys has this list of employees. For this company, here's the list of employees. And along the way, I can provide you information about each company and yep. information about each employee. And anybody reading the file can tell which employees go with which company. I can tell if it's company information or employee information based on where it's located inside the file and how it's described. And you can even kind of keep going with that hierarchical structure where you go in and say maybe here's the employee and here's the people that they manage and the people that they manage and, and kind of break all of that down. And then through code, you can kind of explore all of that and bounce your way through the XML file. Yeah, absolutely. It's not limited to, a, to one parent-child. You can have grandparent, right. parent, child, grandchild. Yeah, you could show a company has, this company has these departments, those departments have these employees, those employees have worked this, these shifts, right. and go as far down as you want. Yep. Um, so that's the idea of XML files. Now, it is the other thing we mentioned there was a problem with uh, text files, is if you wanted to retrieve one record, you had to read the whole file. Mm -hmm. One of the neat things about XML is it has a query language. So there are specific languages and commands you can use to query XML files. Yep. Uh, there's XPath and XQuery. So XPath basically allows you to specify uh, a path that points to the record you want, whereas XQuery literally allows you to say, go look in the file and find a record that matches this, this set of criteria. Yeah, X XQuery is much more robust than, uh, than XPath. You can actually do c kind of a couple of really cool things with, with XPath and go in and find attributes and so forth. But if you really are trying to get that, that full power and do things like for loops. Or and, say, get, and, me and all the, get me all the companies in Tailspin Toys. Yeah, example. exactly. Yeah, just those companies. XQuery is going to give you the ability to do that. XPath will, will point you to it, and then it's still up to you to go in and read the rest of those values, XQuery will really let you uh, get into all of that. And you'll notice that most of the surrounding technologies with XML start with the letter X. They just, yes. you know, yay. XML, XQuery, <laughs> XPath. Yay, it's, letter X. Yes. <laughs> it's really good when you're playing the alphabet game, you know, because I can never come up with enough things Absolutely. to start with X. And today is brought to you by the letter X. That's right, or at least this module. Yes. <laughs> So, so we have these languages and these uh, that we can use to query and get individual records back. Right. So that's, again, another improvement over basic text files. Now, in terms of drawbacks, um, XML files can get very big. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're picky. Uh, if you forget to put the closing slash employee on there, then when you try and query the XML file, it goes, I can't read your XML file. Because somewhere, you forgot to close a tag. They're also case sensitive. Yeah, they're case sensitive. HTML yeah. isn't case sensitive. XML is. Yep. So those types of things, so they're very finicky about the syntax. Um, said, don't, if you forget a closing element, then it just comes back and says, I can't read your XML. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is case sensitive. Um, the files can get quite big. Um, those are the drawbacks. But mm -hmm. as said, certainly much more powerful and can be more efficient yep. than, than straight text files. Absolutely. Um, they found libraries out there that actually support working with XML files. So if you want to explore this, uh, two of the more popular libraries that contain functions that allow you to do things like sex query and to read XML files, um, Beautiful Soup. I love the names they come up with for libraries in Python. <laughs> Beautiful Soup, Beautiful of course. Soup. <laughs> no soup for you. Um, wow. And uh, LXML. Uh, bad. <laughs> hey, come on, you're not the only one who can make bad Absolutely. 80s television references, yeah. come on. Uh, so an LXML are two popular libraries which will help you out. So if you want to try XML files, we're not going to cover it here. There's too many data store options for us to cover everything. Plus XML, there's actually a lot to it and we could... Is there an MVA out on XML yet? I, 
Yes? No? Maybe. <laughs> we'll um, find out. <laughs> processing. <laughs> uh, but literally, uh, you could do a full day course on uh, on XML without any difficulty. Something tells me we probably have. Yeah, we'll uh, find out if there's an XML course. Uh, We've got a challenge XML. for Christopher there as I keep going. Hey, there's a developing Microsoft Azure Solutions on the 19th with Brett Statham and Sidney Andrews. That should be fun. Okay. Um, it doesn't look like we do. Okay, so okay, so we may have a new, we may have idea. a new MVA right, idea to come yes. up with. But there's <laughs> soon. there is a lot to XML. So again, it's one of those ones. If you want to delve into that as your option for storage, uh, you'll want to take some time to learn that and spend a bit of time learning your way around. The next option, and this one's extremely popular and used in, in a lot of the, any of the really big sort of enterprise solution uh, websites, and that's to use a relational database. So this is what you're going to see. If you're going to a store and you're ordering things online, there's probably a relational database on the back end. Uh, if you're using a, a company expense reporting system that where you enter your expenses, that's probably all being stored in some sort of relational database on the back end. So relational databases, uh, they're made up of one or more tables that contain data. So if we take a look here, I've sort of got two tables. Uh, the first table here, this is sort of my customer table, if you will. And for each customer, I've got an ID, I've got a name, I've got a city for what custom, where that person lives, and I know the country where that person lives. Mm -hmm. And then I also have a um, orders table, which is keeping track of the orders each customer placed. And there is a relationship here between the two. You can see here that Satya, um, being inspired by our MVA, has decided to purchase himself a book on coding with Python. Oh, we have yeah. that kind of influence. I know, I know. You just wait. We'll see what Satch is talking about in his next webcast. <laughs> and uh, Susan, on the other hand, was so inspired by all this cool stuff that Christopher's talking about that uh, I had an urge to run out and pick up a book because you can see that I have a ID of 106 and customer ID 106. Purchase the book on building websites. Okay. So I have one or more tables, but there's relationships between the tables, right? I know which customers are going with which orders, and that's what makes it a relational data. So there's always going to be, or there's frequently going to be two tables, and there'll be one column that exists in both tables. They don't have to have the same column name. Um, you know, in the customers table, the ID column is referenced by a customer ID column in another table. So again, looking at the slide, you can see that we have an ID in the customer table that allows us to tell which orders were placed by which customers. Absolutely. So those values, that's why it's a relational database. That's actually where the word comes from. Exactly. One little thing only just because um, I, it, it, it's me and I, I've got to say it. Um, typically when you see those column names, they won't have the spaces. We did that for readability, um, but yeah, you might not see the spaces there. Yes. Just one of those little I things. Understand, I understand, yes. I just, Even though some databases will support spaces and column names. I'm with I'm I'm completely with you on this one Christopher. Yeah. As a person who spent many years working with databases and as a coder, I uh, really don't like working with column names that have spaces. So be nice to uh, fellow developers. Don't put column names or spaces into your column names. And don't do underscores either while we're at it. Yeah. Uh, that yeah, I don't know about you, but at least for me, uh, that you know, hitting that that underscore when I'm trying to touch type, it usually takes me about like five shots before I can find that underscore. You see, we can't stop ourselves. I Relational databases is is a big another big topic. It you is. know, there's like a whole MVA on that. There, there, there is somebody <laughs> posted that uh, we should have a T-shirt that says "There's an MVA for that." I, you, absolutely, <laughs> that'd be an awesome T-shirt. I can see that coming, coming soon to a absolutely. store near you, or at least a laptop sticker. I like that. There's an MVA for that. <laughs> Mr. Calder, paging Mr. Calder. <laughs> Um, when you, when we wanted to read values from a text file, we would have to read through the entire file. When yep. we wanted to read a value from an XML file, you could just read the entire file line by line until you find what you're looking for. Or we mentioned you could use a libraries and xQuery to request, say something like, "Give me all the employees in company Northwind." Um, in relational databases, we use a language called SQL. Aha! Aha. So this is so, why. There's so there's a, the SQL. So this no, is where. Okay. Gotcha. This is a yes SQL database. <laughs> Yes, SQL database. This is a yes SQL database <laughs> instead of a no SQL database. Because SQL, or structured query language, also sometimes just called SQL, um, this is the language we use to ask the database for information to insert and manipulate the data inside the database. So you can say, give me all the customers with a particular, or all the orders for a particular customer. I can say, go add a new order. I can say, delete an existing order. So again, you just take a quick glance at the slide. You can see a basic example of a SQL statement. Select star just means select all the, all the information for, uh, for Bill Gates from the customer's table. 
So not going to teach you SQL here. I'm sh I know there's an MVA on SQL out there, uh, but that's how we communicate with a relational database. What's great about relational databases, you can store very, very large amounts of data very efficiently. That's what they're good at. They're good for storing large amounts of data and letting us query it in a very efficient manner. You can also keep track of the relationships between all of the different records. Who ordered what? Who works for who? Which account belongs to which customer? That's what relational databases are really good at. You can also search for exactly the records you want. The database tool is actually going to be able to find the record you want and give you back just the record you asked for. So that cuts down on the amount of data that's being sent back mm -hmm. and forth, and it makes queries faster and less traffic on your network. Yep. And these days, hey, with all our mobile phones, we're all starting to care about that a little bit more. <laughs> a little bit. Um, so you get back only the data you need. Now, that all sounds awesome. You're like, wow, it does everything I want it to do. So why don't we always all use relational databases? Well, if they do all that, they have a little overhead involved. If you're going to use a relational database, it's actually separate software. You can't just go into Python and say, create relational database and start querying it. It's going to be separate software that you have to install somewhere on a server in a place where your Python code can connect to it and access it. Mm -hmm. So examples of relational databases include uh, SQL Azure, uh, SQL Server, Microsoft Access, MySQL, Oracle. Those are all examples of relational databases. But that's a separate product. You have to go install SQL Server. And then you have to create a database on SQL Server. And then you have to create your tables. And then you have to load it with data. And then you go to your Python code and you say, connect to that database I made over there. Go look in the table I made over there and start inserting data into it. So there's a lot more upfront work involved. Yeah. It's great once it's all up and running. Yep. But if all you want to do is store the high score for a game, yep. my gosh, that's just major overkill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to create all that just so I can store a high score. There's one. Let's keep it simple. So basically, what the, the main point that, that we're trying to make throughout all of this is, you know, there's that old saying, if the only tool that you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and of course, that's, that's not the case, that a hammer is good for a particular task. But you also need screwdrivers and pliers and everything else. And that's really what we're trying to do here, is just kind of show you, hey, look, these are all the different tools that are available for you. And they each have their different advantages, disadvantages. They all have their different places and their different purpose. Yeah, and we're just trying to help you understand which one's right for the different scenarios you're going to encounter as you start building more applications. Yep. Um, the next option would be to use a NoSQL database. I, 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 it's funny, now I always call it NoSQL, never NoSQL. It doesn't sound <laughs> right that way. NoSQL just rolls off the tongue better. There you go. So a NoSQL database um, is basically it's a database that stores data. So obviously these are all used for storing data. But it doesn't store them in tables with relationships the same way the relational database does. Right. Um, there's a number of different ones out there. If you've ever heard people talking about Mongo, again, I love the names of things, Mongo and, and uh, Jinja and all these wonderful things. You really can completely confuse your friends. Post something on Facebook about the fact that, you know, you're learning the difference between Mongo and NoSQL versus uh, using XQuery on XML, and I promise you, your, your friends will just look at you completely stunned. <laughs> uh, but if they understand you, all right, you found a fellow geek. Um, but uh, so. You can create their database like Mongo is very good at storing documents if you want to store a lot of documents. Or if you need to do a lot of graph stuff, there's OrientDB, which is designed for that. And, or maybe just key value pairs. So I just want to remember um, a, couple, a few values, and I can uh, rem want a name for each value so I can remember which value goes with the thing. So I want to know first place score, second place score, third place score then I can do that with what we call key value pairs. Mm -hmm. And Redis is an example of a key value pair database. And MongoDB, actually, you can absolutely use for key value pairs as well. It's another popular one for that. Now, this is my pet peeve, though, um, is I meet a lot of startup companies. And initially, they're starting out. Uh, they don't want to spend the money or the time to build that infrastructure of a full relational database. Yep. So they start off with a Mongo or a Redis. Awesome. That is great. And then as their website gets more complex and they're trying to do more and more things, they start trying to basically do weird things with their Mongo database to basically try to get it to do all the things that relational databases do automatically. Yep. So absolutely, Mongo and Redis are great, but when you to do as it gets bigger and you find yourself going, wow, it isn't doing what I want to do. I'm going to have to come up with some creative way to rework around that. Stop yourself and go, wait a second. 
is this getting big enough and convoluted enough? Maybe it's worth the infrastructure of a relational database because I've seen so many companies said they start off with NoSQL and then they're, they're so caught up in that that they start writing thousands of lines of code to try and do things that are all done for you if you just use SQL. Right. And, you know, kind of going back to something that we talked about earlier with, uh, with design, that one of the main points that, that we made was that separation of, uh, of concerns or views uh, display out the data. Um, one of the big things that you could do is when you set up the methods uh, inside of your, your routes file or files, if you've got multiple, one of the things that you could do is really, again, just call out to a separate class or to a separate pie file that has the functions that, that do all of that behind the scenes. Because when I get into my routes pie file and I go in and I say create, if I've got a little method that's going to store that inside of a database and I've got another method that's going to pull that back in from the database, I don't care where that database is, just so long as I know that it's going to store it, and when I ask for it back, that it's going to give it back to me. So what's happening behind the scenes really just becomes a black box to me. And if you design properly, what you can do is make that black box pluggable. So that way, maybe you do start out with, with Redis or with MongoDB, and then you start to grow, and you start to get a bit more complex, and you start to realize, hey, wait a minute, you know, we really do need to migrate over to, let's say, SQL. Well, you can do that with limited impact on the rest of your application, that you go update the data access portion, but you leave everything else the same. And again, my code, all I'm doing is I'm just simply saying, store question, retrieve question, or whatever your calls uh -huh. might be. And as long as, again, it's going to store the question and retrieve the question in that little black box, I don't care what that black box is. I don't care where it's doing it, as long as I'm getting the behavior that I expect. So you can make those types of changes from database to data Database and limit the amount of impact that that's going to have on your application. Yeah, yeah that's where good uh, designing good your design. code to, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you may have somebody on your team who's really good at figuring out how to talk to databases, or yep. you, when you're really good at that, or you're really focused on that code, yeah, put, make a module that's making the connection, asking for the data, and yep. that, passing it back in a function. And then, yes, in your other module, you say, hey, get me that value, would you? And yes, exactly. it'll, it'll make your life easier yep. when, uh, if you come to a point where you need to change data stores. And you'd be surprised how often that could be useful. Um, now, so Redis, uh, if I take a look here, is an example of a key value paired database where said, great if you just want to store a series of values. So you can have something very simple. Uh, so I have a value. I want to keep track of the number of people who visit my website. And so what I do is I have a key, and for that key, I store a value. So basically, I just have number of visitors. It's like a variable. Really, mm -hmm. and key is like my variable name, and the value is the value I'm storing the variable. The only difference is I'm storing it in Redis, and we call it a key value pair instead of a variable and a value, but aside from that, it's really the same. Uh, you can have some more complex names as well inside there. Uh, for example, I can actually start creating sort of structures of my variable names if I want to. Um, so here, whoops, wrong one. Uh, I have actually created a variable name or a key, which is user colon first name. This is actually quite common in Redis. Uh, a lot of people use this convention. It's a way of just sort of saying, I want to keep track of all my user information, so I might create a, a key called user colon first name and a key called user colon last name. So I remember but both of those keys are information about a user. So you can create sort of a structure to your key names to help you keep them straight. Um, one of the most popular key value databases out there is Redis. And that's actually the one we're going to use as the back end for our database that we've been working on. So, but remember, the data store is not part of Python. One of the great things Christopher talked about this morning was that one of the reasons we liked Flask and we liked Python was you can get started with it really quickly because it's very minimal, but that later when you needed to do extra things, you would need to add more components and install more pieces. So if we want to use Redis, we're going to have to install it. To install it, there's a few things we'll need to do. One, you literally need <clears> to build the Redis database or Redis product on your machine. So, the Redis server. Yeah, the Redis server. So you're going to need to go to, uh, easiest place to find it is uh, off GitHub. Um, there's the link for the Windows <laughs> setup file. There's different ones for different types of operating systems. This is not a Windows-specific product. And then once you've got that installed on your computer, uh, you're going to need to install the Redis library in your Python project so that your Python code can use the methods that are used to talk to Redis. Mm -hmm. 
and we're going to need to add that package to our virtual environment. Somebody actually asked this in the Q&A um, uh, during lunch. It was, hey, you know, so I downloaded um, I, Module 5 or whatever it was, and it's saying, hey, I don't have Redis. How do I get Redis? Aha. So, well, yeah. well, let us answer that question. Yeah. Um, and the last thing you're going to need to do is you're going to actually have to make sure that Redis, the Redis service is actually running on the computer as well. Because installing software doesn't mean the software is running. So yep. we're going to have to go to Task Manager and make sure Redis is running. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to flip over to uh, Visual Studio. And what I need to do is I'm going to need to go over to my environment here. Now, you've already got uh, Redis installed. I did. Yeah, you've got Redis installed and up and running. Yeah, so I'm going to show, but I yep. still will still show how you check if the service is running. But yeah, yep. I, I have already done the step of installing Redis because I didn't want to sit here and have to do the little install. Oh, so wait, wait, was it a different dance for installation while you're waiting for things? Um, it was, yeah, it's more. This was a slide like, dance. This yeah, was well, a slide yeah, dance. Yeah, we're not going to do this. Okay. Um, you know, but it was. Yeah, it was sort of like a. And now I'm trying to remember. It was sort of. It was sort of this like sort of this. thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, more of like the okay. head moving. Right. So yeah, I, because you're moving the mouse along with it, so you know your head just kind of wants to bob along. I with can't. It. I can't keep up with Christopher's yep. dancing skills. So I, uh, rather than having to do an installation dance while you watched it install, I pre-installed it. By the way, um, uh, excuse me, Mr. Barry. Um, yeah, this is not to wind up on outtakes. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. All right. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing we're not live. Good thing we're, we're not live. Watching. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what I, what I will need to do is I still need, uh, so I've got Redis software installed, but I need to make sure that the service is running and I need to add Redis to my Python environment. So let's start by installing it into that Python environment. So I'm going to go to my program and I'm taking the same project that Christopher finished up with at the end of the last chapter. Yep. I'm going to my environments, right click and saying install a Python package. So we'll do that. Install Python package. And literally, you just type in Redis, because that is the name of the package. When you select that and you select OK, it will go ahead. And you'll be able to see in the bottom little left corner in the output window, Redis was, in fact, installed successfully. And I can confirm that by taking a look over here in my Python environment. And you can see Redis added to my Python environment as well. OK. So I have the Redis package. I need to make sure that the service is running. I do that by bringing up Task Manager. And inside Task Manager, I'm going to go to my services. And I'm just going to check in order. I'm going to do this alphabetical order here. Scroll down to the R's. And sure enough, there is my Redis service. And it is currently running. If it wasn't running, I would just right click and say start. Uh, you, uh, if you're at a big company, you might occasionally run into problems where you don't have permissions to do that. Uh, you might need administrator privileges to do it. But if you're working on your laptop, that shouldn't be a problem. So uh, I have it installed. I have it added to my environment. And I have the service up and running. So how do I actually write code to connect to it? Well. Uh, once you, I'm going to need to import the Redis library so that I can access the coding environment. Just like we had to import Flask and import the use for and import render template, we're going to need to import Redis. Then we have to create a connection to that Redis data store using a function called strict Redis. And the syntax is pretty straightforward. Um, it, it looks a little confusing, but the nice thing is there's very little you ever have to change here. So this is, falls into the category of the cut and paste this line of code, and it's probably just going to work. So it's, uh, I'm creating a connection. I'm calling my connection R uh, in Christopher Arr. speak. Yes, it's great for talk like, a, talk like a pirate day. That's not till September, though, gentlemen. Uh, Redis. all the fun out of my day. Every day. <laughs> every, day <laughs> every day can be talk like a pirate day when you call your connection Redis to R. Yeah, absolutely. And every day is like Sunday. Yeah. Um, so we go Redis dot strict Redis. So strict Redis is the function we're calling to create our connection. And we have to specify where is this Redis service running. Well, I've got it running on my PC, so it's on localhost. So the value I type in there has to be the name of the machine where it's running. I said I have it installed locally, so that's just called localhost. It'll be the same for you. The port number is going to be 6379, and the database number is going to be zero because I haven't created specific database, uh, new databases in Redis. Mm -hmm. So really, you can literally cut and paste that line of code. That's how you're going to connect to your Redis database as well. The only thing that might change is if you have it. In, if I was trying to run Redis and it was installed on Christopher's machine, I would have to find out how to type in the, the address of his machine instead of localhost. So if we try it, because that's really a test. <laughs> and I go in here, let's see, and first I have to import Redis. 
So once again, I'm going to need to import it. And what I'm going to do is let's start off initially. I'm actually just going to, uh, when we go to the main page, I'm just yep. going to connect to Redis right there. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to create my connection R. R. Uh, sorry. I can roll my R's. <laughs> my mother from Scotland, so I can roll my R's very well. Um, and call it Redis.strictRedis. And the IntelliSense does pick up that function name. And it's awesome. I love the IntelliSense here as well for helping me remember what the values are I have to enter. Hooray, IntelliSense! Yes, love IntelliSense. And the host is going to be localhost. And while she's typing this in, it's worth mentioning um, that uh, those values, the localhost, the ID, the port, and then the database are the default. So um, you could actually just say strict Redis, and in theory it would work. Um, but it's always a best practice to type those types of things out um, because you never know if maybe the uh, the, the defaults will uh, will change. Uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit later. So, um, uh, so yeah. So you've got it uh, just like that. Uh, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention is that those first three parameters are positional. So you could have just gone localhost port and DB. But you know, again, it's it's nice to type it out as well. So that way, if somebody else comes along, maybe they haven't done Redis before, they can look at that and they go, oh, okay, well, there's the host, there's the port, there's the database. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. this line of code, I'm going to show you three different lines of code. They're all equivalent. I could have actually done this. And just said, call strict Redis. Yep. Whoops. We have to. Uh, we all know uh, Python cares about uh, the positions here. Or I could write this line of code this way, uh, as you were saying, without because local host parameter it expects. Yeah. Port is the second parameter expected, and DB is the third parameter expected. I don't actually have to tell it. Those are yep. the values for database, port, and host. Exactly. These three lines of code are all equivalent. So I'm just going to comment that out here. Uh, and I'll just make a little note here. Uh, alternate uh, ways to connect to Redis. Sort of like the movie Clue with three different endings. Each command is equivalent, really. Totally personal preference. Uh, what I, the reason I like to list it is because it helps me remember. The equivalent. Eventually, I will spell the word. <laughs> is it helps me remember what those parameters are. And that way, when I haven't looked at Redis for several all that time, it, uh, it's easier to come in. Christopher's losing it over there. Uh, I, I, Every time now we say R, it's just, yeah. Okay, we're going to talk like a pirate day now for the rest of the day. So. Arr, Arr. Arr. I'll get it. We'll get eye patches for the next module. All right, now, how do I know if it's worked? Well, actually, to be honest, I mean, you could start writing try catch statements here. You could. Uh, and, and, you know, saying if it does. But really, uh, to be honest, this is the simplest way to test it. Run it. If your web page comes up, you connect it. Yeah. If, if your web page does not come up, um, then you probably didn't connect. It, it, that seems pretty simple to me. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. So if I just go ahead and run our application, of course, needing to rebuild it along the way. And there it's off and running. It's trying to connect. And oh, look, I can go in. I yep. can start creating questions. I have successfully created a connection to Redis. Well done. So at this point, I think what we'll do is... What did we learn, Susan? I was going to say, let's just sort of take yeah. a look at that here. What, what, what did we learn? Um, so we've made it running, uh, but we learned about sort of some different data storage options yep. and some of the pros and cons between them and how to, right. how to install Redis and connect to it. Okay. So I'm going to now quiz you to All see right. what you did learn. Right, so so I aside from the fact that it's the entire time. now become Talk Like a Pirate Day. Okay. Um, if you had some scenarios, I'm going to throw some scenarios at you, and I want you to think uh -huh. about which of the data storage options we discussed you think would be the best option. Okay because that is one of the things we've tried to do. Okay. If you're building an online store that sells DVDs and books, and you want the, the user to be able to see the list of books by author, subject, price, or publication date, which of our data storage options do you think would work? You know, I'm seeing a lot. And, you know, one of the things to, to highlight, if I can just, you know, tangent. Um, tangent? Tangent mode. There we go. There we go. Um, so over here on, uh, on tangent mode, one of the things... <laughs> 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 One of the things that's, uh, that's sort of worth mentioning, like Susan had highlighted earlier, is that we could use really any of these uh, databases for all of these possible solutions. So now bringing it back to the original question, um, because of the fact that you've got all of those different uh, uh, types of data and so forth, I would say you would want SQL Server. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that's good. In this case, a relational database, such as exactly. SQL Server. All yep. right. I like that. Okay. You're building, a say, a quiz website. Okay. I like that. Whatever happened. Yep. I don't know. Hey. And you need to store the questions and the correct answers to the questions. You know, in this case, because of the fact that we're going with just the very simple um, uh, questions and answers, uh, I think Redis would really be the uh, the best option there. Um, so a no, so a no the, SQL yeah, database. Yeah, no SQL, that, that, that key value pair. Yeah. You yep. could use a relational database if it was a really complex, if it was something you're using to store exams and exam Yep. questions for university, you could do that if you wanted to. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you want to keep track of the number of visitors who came to your website. It's the kind of thing people often do. You know, they just want to store a number of visitors. You know, if that's it, just a, a number of visitors, so it, it, toss it in a text file and be done with it. Yeah, if you that's know? all you need. Sure. That's it, yeah. Single value, pff, toss it in a text file. Yeah, absolutely. If that's, you're already using, in a text file, if you're using Redis for something else already, yep. then you could store it in Redis. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's it, is that, you know, if, if you were doing a lot of different things, it, it's not like you have to say, well, one type of data is going to go over here, one type of data is going to go over here, one type of data is going to go over here. You can decide this is the data store we're going to use and put everything there. Or again, you could, in certain cases, move different types of data into different spots. Um, so if you just needed, you know, like caching um, key value pairs, Redis cache, hey, there you go. Dumb. You know, Redis would be perfect if you're looking for just a single uh, symbol value. You know, you could toss that into a text file. So, you know, you really don't have to decide on one solution and and just be be locked into that. You can go with a lot of different uh, solutions. Yeah, absolutely. And so yeah, so yeah. awesome. So what did we learn? Basically, we learned some of the pros and cons of our different data storage options: text files versus XML files versus relational databases like SQL Server or NoSQL databases like Mongo or Redis. And uh, we also learned how do you actually install Redis and connect to Redis using that strict Redis function. Mm -hmm. So what can we do with this? You can now install Redis, which you're going to need to do if you want to keep following along with us, because we're going to next module, we're going to learn how we can actually store our questions and answers using those Redis commands. And we learned how to create a connection to our Redis database from our Python code. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, we kind of got nice and rolling. Now I am going to real quick here, one last time, I am going to go into, uh, into tangent mode. Um, uh, only because uh, I, I just want to highlight real quickly that once again, this is the first time that we've been doing live closed captioning on our uh, MVA, on our on our live jumpstart. And uh, as a result, we're trying to kind of gauge feedback and things like that. So if it's not there right now, sometime in about the next 30 seconds, uh, he said, pausing long enough. Um, there's going to be a poll down at the very bottom um, asking about the closed captioning. So um, if you found that uh, that it's been helpful and so forth, please, please, please let us know. And and be honest, if, if there have been issues, um, let us know that as well, because that's the way that, uh, that we're going to get better. OK, cool. Awesome. So with that, what do you say we, uh, we take a break, and then let's come back and actually put some questions into that Redis data. Yeah, let's start creating. storing some data into Redis. Exactly. I like that. Yep. So, awesome. Perfect. Okay, All right. We'll see you soon. We'll see you in 10. All right, welcome back. Welcome back alongside Pirate Geek Girl. Well, I am. <laughs> since I'm going to keep going with that R Redis connection. Arr, you know, arr. Arr. So, um, where did we leave off uh, with, with R and pirates? No, we left off uh, looking to store data inside of our, uh, inside of our data store. Um, and so let's go ahead and now roll into how we're going to, uh, to do that and, and close out the, uh, the building of our, our little trivia application. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to need to go back into our uh, code and actually add the code to actually start saving values to the database. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to watch you type one. With one eye. Yeah. <laughs> no, one eye tied behind one a One eye patch works well. Two <laughs> eye patches, not so well. Um, you know, one eye patch looking pretty cool. Two eye patches, mm, yeah, one too far. Not looking. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so <laughs> after we've installed Redis, which is what we did in the last module, now we need to figure out how we're actually going to use it. So, uh, and forgive me, I'm going to lose the eye patch because otherwise I can spend the rest of a day with a red band across the uh, across my forehead. Um, <laughs> There's actually still a little bit. Yeah, of I'm, I'm sure. There. I'm sure I'm going to have a little line for the rest of the module. I'll, I can live with that. So we've already talked about sort of how to get started with Redis, um, how to connect to the actual Redis data store itself. That we have already covered, mm -hmm. um, and that we did with the strict Redis method, 
And by specifying, most important there was specifying the server name. And we specified the local host because we have installed the Redis software locally. And, and there is our connection by the called. Yep. Christopher, the name of our connection is? R. R. Correct. Thank you. So now what we want to do is we want to start storing some keys and values in that, uh, using that connection. So, of course, then the question comes, there has to be some sort of command we can use to say we want to store a value. Well, in Redis, uh, and when we're calling Redis from Python, there's a method called set that we use. Uh, you just specify a name for the key and the value you want to store. So that seems pretty straightforward. It is pretty straightforward. So basically, in this case, whoops, uh, go back up there. So if you take a look at this, uh, I call my uh, method, my set method. Mm -hmm. I specify my connection name, which is? R. Thank you. And I specify that uh, the name of my key is going to be first name, and that gets stored here. Or that's the name of my key, and then I specify the value bill to be stored for that particular key. So that's basically going to store this value for me in Redis. And when I want the value back, I can do that by using the get method. So I use set to store a value, and I use get to ask for the value back. So when I call the get method, I'm going to need a variable to hold the value that comes back. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see I specify the name of the key, first name, and it says, oh, well, the value for first name is bill, and then it takes that value bill and puts it into my variable. That's perfect. So just like we did request form, and that stored that into the variable, same concept, you're just going to say r get, r get, um, and then that's going to wind up inside of retrieved name. Exactly, what? except I'm just getting it from Redis instead of requesting it from a form on, this, on the browser. Perfect. Um, you can store numbers as well as strings. So absolutely, you want to do something like keep track of number of visitors at the website. You can store a zero. Um, it's just by the data type you pass in, whether it figures out you're passing in a string or a number. That'll determine the data type it stores. Uh, one of the neat things is if you do store a number, there are some extra methods that you can use to increment and decrement the stored value. Add one or subtract one. Yeah. So if I inc call increment, uh, it will literally add one to number of visitors, so from zero to one. You can also say increment by. So you can say add five, add two, add six, whatever the number is you need to increase it by. There is also a decrement, number of visitors by one. Number, uh, however, for whatever reason, there's no decrement by. Don't know why, it's just one of those odd little things. Uh, so there is a decrement function, there's an increment function, there's an increment by, but there's no decrement by yet. Uh, maybe somebody will add it in the next version. On it. All right, yeah, if you don't mind, if you okay. just code that over. I'll, I'll get on that, yeah. You, awesome. you keep doing your thing, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start coding over. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. Now, Christopher, what do you think is going to happen if you try to set a key and that key already exists inside Redis? Well, I've seen the slide, so I know the answer. Ah. Um, but what I would say is, without giving away the answer, you know, when I looked at that, um, uh, when I look at that, you know, I might think, hey, wait a minute, if the key's already there, it might throw an error because I might go, hey, wait a minute, you told me that the key uh, value was supposed to be this. Now you're telling me a new value. I don't know what to do with this, and it would throw an error. That's so yeah. th there would seem to be at least a possibility here, but I do know what the right answer is. Yeah, in this case, by default, mm -hmm. it's simply going to overwrite. So if I say, yeah. because the thing is, when I do an r.set, uh, I'm actually creating the key. Yep. and giving it a value. So when I call the set function a second time with the same key name, yeah, it might say, hey, that function already, or that key already exists. But in this case, absolutely, it's simply going to overwrite the existing key with the new value. And this might be the way you want it to work, or it might not be the way you want it to work. Just depends mm -hmm. on the way your brain works. If you're thinking, no, no, wait, I didn't want to overwrite what was already there. I wanted to, to if it's already there, then I want to append this value to what's already yep. there. Or I want to get an error message back because that value shouldn't already exist. So there are absolutely ways that, with code, there's always a way, the only question is how hard is it going to be, to check. So there is an exists function that allows you to see, does that key already exist? So I can say, hey, if uh, exists first name returns a true, so if it doesn't exist, well, then let's create it. So if you wanted to add in that functionality of it throwing an error, um, if it was already there and you tried to change the value, you could do that. Yes, exactly. Okay. You just write your own logic. Just write your own logic. Yeah, it. that's okay. the easiest way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you, now, this is one of those, um, hang on, maybe my, this is my side moment. 
Um, okay, but I go throw them off. Oh, is it the wrong side? Yeah, yeah. So supposed to, well, I do it to the right. You, you do can, the, I'm I guess go to the, the left. left. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and then Christopher's off. I like the fact that Christopher's off, Mark is off tangent. <laughs> One of the things, when I started exploring and first working with Redis, um, there are some options you can specify when you call the set method, uh, EX and NX and so on. Mm -hmm. And some of these options uh, say, hey, if you specify this option, it's going to throw an error if the key already exists. Mm -hmm. The world of open source code. They don't seem to work in the Python when I'm, when I'm using them. So I found it more reliable to do the check to see if they exist separately rather than relying on the EX and NX parameters. But if you read the documentation for the set method, you'll see the EX and NX parameters. You can try them, but I've never managed to convince them to work from Python. So I find it easier to just test if he exists myself. So dumb. And Done you with know, my aside. Yeah, yeah and, and I would also say, uh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll do this as well, just to continue the tangent. Um, but I would also say that, you know, again, there's multiple ways to, to write the exact same block of code, and, and you really do want to prize readability. And so I personally like having that extra step, because again, if somebody's never used that Redis API, they go in and they take a look at that, they're not going to go know it, what they're edX, gonna, They're not going to that the EX parameter yeah, true means if it already exists, give me an error. Exactly, exactly. But if they see explicitly exists, then they're going to know what that is without having to know what those those uh, those. Absolutely true. Are. So yeah. yeah, this is very, it's, it's that sort of, we call it sometimes sort of self-documented code or more readable code. Exactly. Yep. This is more intuitive to somebody reading it for the first time. Exactly. Now, if a key does already exist and you maybe want to append to the value that's already there instead of overwriting it, so maybe people are entering a name and then another name and another name. So your yep. maybe your key is called list of names. Right. And you just want to keep adding more names to the existing list, but when you get the first name, you want to create it. Uh, you can check if it exists using the exist function. There is also an append function that you can call, which will append a value rather than overwriting it. And that way you really kind of get complete control over what you want to do with that value if it's already there. Exactly. So lots of options there. Um, if you do want to actually delete a key, go figure, delete. No, I'm sorry, you lost me. Can you, can you yeah, do that again? Yeah, I know, it's tough. <laughs> Uh, it's probably because I forgot to do the r.delete when I started. <laughs> so the delete function will allow you to remove one. So let's go to our, back to our trivia r. application. Yes. And let's see if we can add code. You, you left me a few to-do items, I seem to remember, inside I, I, I that did. application. Yeah. yeah, get to work over there. All seriously. right, let's see what I can do. So I'm just going to, you know, grab my phone. I'm just going to Just gonna hang out over get there? Get work done. Oh, yeah. all right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so going for high scores and wordament, no doubt. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead here, and I'm going to go down. If you remember, we had some code down here. We'd sent the user the form, and then we had we, uh, the user had created a question. Yep. So they typed in a value. When they submitted the form, it came back. It was posted back to us. That's they hit correct. The submit button. Yep. And then we were reading the title, and we were asking from the form to get the value of the title they typed in, the question they typed in, and the answer they typed in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to store it in the data store. Now, the variable name I'm going to use or the key name, just so we can keep this straight. The key name uh, will be uh, whatever title they typed in, then colon, question, sort of thing. So if you think of it this way, let's say they enter a category. Uh, it might be uh, music, question, or it might be uh, countries. Can't type, apparently. Countries, question. And it, for answers, uh, I'm going to store it with a name something like music answer or uh, countries, again, cannot type, countries answer. So that's sort of a syntax. Though I'm going to be, things are case sensitive, so I'm just going to uh, make everything lowercase to save myself problems later. I'm always treating everything case sensitive, right? Best yep. practices. Music. So the, the keys are RK sensitive. Yeah. Okay. So those are the names I'm going to give to my keys. It'll be like music question or countries question or music answer and countries answer. Mm -hmm. And then the value will be whatever the user has typed in as a question and an answer. Okay. So uh, I've already created my connection up here. Um, but you'll notice where I had created the connection, I'm going to actually zoom out on my code a little bit um, so you can sort of see this. I want to point out that this is a function, correct, mm -hmm. Christopher? So I have a question for you. If I declare a variable inside a function, where can I use that connection? Inside that function. Can I use it anywhere else, like in a function down here? No. Right. Only inside that function, because it winds up setting what's known as scope. 
Right. So when I declare the variable inside uh, my hello method for my routing, I can mm -hmm. only use it there. Correct. So I either have to redeclare that connection for every single function, which yep. is a little clunky. It is. Uh, or I can just take that line of code and move it out of the functions. So have it up here with the rest of my code, not inside the function. Actually, I'll move it up one more line here, so, so it's above that. And I'm just going to move that comment up as well. Uh, you know what I just did? I just did the cut and paste blank line. Oh, don't forget to put your, your font back to a regular size so we can see. Oh, yes, absolutely. We'll do that too. There we go. Move in so you can see a bit better. There we go. All I'm doing here is I'm moving my Redis connection outside of the function. So above okay. the first function. That way, all of the functions in this module will be able to use that code. Okay. So now I have a connection. The connection is called R. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to my code. And where you said, Susan, please add code here to store so, the data in the data store. Add code there. Yep. I'm going to say r.set. And the key name is going to be whatever title the user passed in to me. Mm -hmm. And then a colon. And then the word question. Because this is where I'm going to store the question. R. With a silent R, absolutely. R. And then the value I want to store inside that key is the actual question that the user suggested we should ask. Okay. Then I'm going to need to store um, the answer for that question. So again, I'm just going to use the title that they typed in, mm -hmm. which is a category, following my naming convention, answer. Now, does it have to be a colon? Uh, it doesn't have to be a colon. That's just a convention. If you want to make it slash answer, dot answer, uh, or you, know, you want to start getting fancy doing title case or something like that, right. any of those will work. But it's a fairly common convention in Redis. Mm -hmm. You'll see the colon used a lot. So it's one of those ones, if you start using it, then when you look at someone else's code, you're more likely to see stuff that looks familiar to you. I got gotcha. you. But no, not required. And I want to store the answer that the user typed in. Because remember, a little higher up in the code, we had the user had, we'd been re reading from the HTML form, that question that they typed in and that answer, and we'd stored those in variables. So I'm just accessing those variables here and storing them in Redis. Yep. So this will store the values. Let's run and see if that actually works, see okay. if my code works. And then we'll worry about retrieving them. Sure. OK, so let's execute our code. Yes, I would need to rebuild it. We see the web page coming up, and we go and we decide to create a new question. And because that's, of course, where my code is written. So I'm going to write a trivia question on Canada, of course. Um, let's see. Uh, what is our national sport? And the answer? Curling? Lacrosse. Ah. Actual little bit of Canadian trivia for you. Uh, most people think it's hockey. Um, it's, in fact, the sport of lacrosse. So I submit that question. And we should be taken to the page that says, oh, thank you for answering your question. What is our national sport? Now, one thing that's worth highlighting here uh -huh. is it, it went to that page, so it, it connected, did its whole thing, and didn't have an error. Now, we could have, if we wanted to, added in the, uh, the try block and, and rerouted to an error page if it would have failed and, and things like that. And, and, and again, you know, it's one of those things where we're trying to just kind of walk through demos and focus in on, on the main line code. So that's why we're not incorporating that, uh, things like that. Yeah, could we? Absolutely. But again, you know, we're trying to, to keep it as, as straightforward as possible. Yeah, we're trying to keep it fairly simple yeah. for now. Yep. Uh, that we understand all the basic principles. Now, one of the things we haven't done, though, is that what is our national sport? You had already, that was already done in the HTML. That isn't using Redis. That's not reading the question back from Redis. Correct. So how do I know those values actually got stored? Well, I could start writing code to try and retrieve the values, but then you run into the problem of you don't know if it doesn't work was the mistake in the code that wrote the values or the mistake in the code that was reading the values. So one of the things that's useful to do is you can actually, when you install Redis on your computer, you get a tool installed on your computer called Redis Client. So if we go back to my computer for a second here, um, if I bring up Windows and I type in Redis, you can see there's actually another piece of software. When you install Redis, you get this included called Redis Client. Mm -hmm. And when I'm on Redis Client, might want to change your color real quick. I'll try to change the, the values here so it's a little easier to see. Yes. Change via text to black and the background to white. There we mm, Nope. Oh, oh, oh we're good. All right. Okay, okay, we're in. We're good. All right. So you can see what we're not sure about. Uh, I've never tried to change the Redis client background before. 
Okay, now what I can do is those get and set commands, I can use those right here in the Redis client. Okay. So if I can remember the name of my key, and oh, now I'm just going to go. Canada, capital C. It was capital C, Canada, uh, and then the name of the question. Was question then you can see it returns okay. what is our national sport. So I can see that, and this is, I'm doing this in Redis. I'm basically going to the Redis database and saying, hey, tell me, what's the value for the key Canada question? Nice. What's the value for uh, Canada answer? So I can see that, indeed, these values are stored. You don't have to be in Python to retrieve the values. Remember, this is separate software. So right. I can see that they're in there. And you know, if I want to, I could even try adding another trivia question in here. Let's try setting a value. Uh, into it. Make it happen. So let's create one called uh, Redis. It's going to be my category. Okay. And the question is going to be um, can, can you store a new question here? All right. And since it said OK, no error messages back, then I'm going to assume that Redis answer is yes. Okay. All right, so now I've tried using set commands. So theoretically, later, when I add the code to retrieve questions, I should be able to retrieve that question on my website. Seems to make sense to me. Okay. So now let's go back to our Visual Studio code. And I've um, done. <laughs> uh, now we're going to go down here, and we're going to go to where it said uh, we had the code here where we were bringing up the page, and somebody specifies, I would like to see it. Yep. And when they ask for a question, they specify the title of the question they want. Perfect. So, or of a category, if you will. Don't forget to stop your debugging. Oh, yeah, I'm still running my code. Thank you. Yep. I do that all the time. Yes. So, when we go to that page and they do a get, we obviously have to display to them the question to display. Mm -hmm. So I need to read that question from a data store. And I see a little note here from Christopher coming yeah, up. There's some code there. I'm back to my phone. All right. All right. And in this case, I need to use a get to retrieve the value. And the value I want to retrieve is going to be the key name. And the key name is going to be whatever title they typed in, because that's going to be part of the key name. And then we add that colon question. And that's going to string. Now we need a variable to hold that value. Uh, question equals. Ah, so I already got cat. So basically, I'm going to replace where Christopher had a uh, question is hard coded question here. I'm going to say question is equal to whatever is returned from Redis when we ask it to get the value with the key of title typed in. So Canada, Redis, whatever question title they entered, mm -hmm. colon question. And that value is now going to go into that question variable. OK. Hey, triple word score. All right, well done. Um, meanwhile, back at the wrench. <laughs> and again, we're going to need, when the, once they've seen the question and they've typed in an answer, then they're going to post back the form to us. Yep. And they're going to give us back an answer. We're going to need to check if that answer they gave us matches the stored answer. So instead of assuming the answer is answer, we're going to say if the answer, that the actual answer is equal to, we're going to have to go get that value from Redis. So we get title answer. And that's going to give me back the answer to the question we just prompted them. And then we have our logic that says, hey, if the submitted answer matches that answer, then display the page that says, you got it right. And otherwise, display the page that said, sorry, you got it wrong. And make sure you tell them the answer they suggested and the correct answer. Yep. OK, so moment of truth. Let's try it. And while Susan's bringing this up, um, one thing that's worth highlighting is the way that we built this, um, it was already all set ready to go with, for, uh, for that code that Susan threw into there. So we threw in kind of the, the hard-coded values, let's go in and test it, and then let's go in now and actually um, uh, start adding on the database code. And, and you know, this works out well in development because it allows you to kind of, of segment out where your potential problems are. Because what we tested originally was the fact that all of our little uh, Python and Flask code worked out just fine, which was you know really, really good. And now we're adding on the database part. And then we can say, well, wait a minute. It worked just fine with, without the database code. Now we add in the database code. Something's going wrong. Now we know where the, where, where the problem is, or vice versa. That if we ran into problems just trying to do it without the database, now we know exactly where that, uh, where that problem is. And I'm not saying Susan's going to have problems here. I'm just saying it allows us to better identify where that problem came from. And I I agree 100%, Christopher, because you and I both know that as soon as you're trying to create 
code that connects to something somewhere else, to some other application, yep. that is often where things go wrong. Exactly. So it is often the line of code that tries to connect to a database or tries to write to a database or to read from a database. Those mm -hmm. are frequently lines of code that take a little fiddling with to get them working. Yes. So that is often where I have problems when I am writing code. Yep. Hopefully not this time, but it has certainly been known to happen to me before. Exactly. So what I've done now on the screen is I'm creating a new question in our trivia called, and the uh, title is Python. And the question is, how do you spell Python? And the answer is <laughs> Python. Python. Right. Ooh, okay. So I'm going to submit that question. And it says, OK, store my question. Now, if I want to be asked that question, we haven't created hyperlinks on the page to take us to that page. But if we went back to the routing, I believe it was called um, uh, question whack and then title. That's right. Lower you type question, in yeah. question, and then you type in the title. So I called it Python. Yep. And that will bring up the question, which has that key value of Python. And I go up, and it says, now, this is weird. We're going to come to this in just a second. This is okay. B colon. How do you spell Python? I'm not sure where that B thing's coming from. And then I type in the correct answer of Python, and it's going to come back and go, ooh. Oh, I think we found a uh, mistake somewhere in our code. Mm -hmm. Now, this may be related to that whole B dash thing. So it's not working yet. And yeah. did you, you did see that <laughs> B. Uh, popping up on the screen there, which is a little strange. Yeah, letter B, letter B. There must be an answer. Yeah, letter, letter B. B. Um, but if you take a look, if we actually go, this is where having that Redis client is really handy because I can sort of go double check and go, well, did it store the values correctly? So let's go check and let's see if Python question is stored in our Redis data store. Yeah, and it's there's no little B dash thing in front of it. And if I say get Python answer, I can see it is actually equal to Python. So, OK, I'm looking at that going, all right, that looks all right to me. What's happening? Turns out, if you go digging through some Python documentation and Redis documentation, you'll discover that Redis actually stores the key values as bytes, not as a string. So when we do a get in Python and we say, hey, give me back that value, it returns it as a string of as bytes. And that's why you're still seeing the little b apostrophe appearing at the beginning of the string. So what we have to do is we have to tell Python there's two ways of doing this. We can either, as we do each get and set, we can say turn it into a string and read it back as a string. Or we can actually, since everything we're working with in this particular application is all strings, the other option is we can actually specify that on the connection level, just encode and decode everything for us. Treat everything as strings. So that's what I'm going to change. So we get rid of that B apostrophe. And that way, when we're doing our gets, we're getting a string back. And that's going to help a lot of our code. So let's go back to our Visual Studio. And all I need to do is change that one connection string. Uh, there we go up here. And I'm going to add two extra parameters here. I'm going to specify uh, that the character set I'm using is UTF. That's when you're changing from bytes to strings. It has to know which set of rules to use for the conversion. And I'm specifying UTF-8, which just means I'm using eight bits to represent a character. Don't worry about that too much. Uh, and then I've got the decode. So I'm going to specify when I do this, please decode my responses when they come back. I would like to do that automatically. True. All right, once I've done that, now uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to stop debugging, and I'm going to create a brand new question. And this time, when I go create my new question, this is um, working, is what I call it. Uh, does this work? And I'm hoping the answer will be yes. And the answer is going to be no. OK. And you're going to tell me why in a second? No. All right. Well, we'll, see. we'll, <laughs> we'll go this far. We'll see where it goes. So we're going to change this to submit question. And we ask, does this work? And then we're going to go, so we've hopefully got that question stored in Redis now. And then we go to question. And we bring to bring up the question uh, slash working. And this is where I like, it's funny. I typed it in 30 seconds ago. And I'm thinking that's what I typed in the value. And there, sure enough, it brings up the question, does this work? But you can see that that B apostrophe has been removed. So I've successfully returned a string now, which will be a little bit nice. Now, this is where I, I can see Christopher, uh, the smoke coming out of his ears as we're trying to live figure out why we got that error message. We were not expecting that particular one. See, and, and you know what? Uh, all kidding aside here, um, the, the point that I was making earlier about doing this in, in phases um, is really important because um, I fired up my code um, that, that I had prior with just the hard-coded uh, little samples and things like that, and it's failing there. 
there. So it's an immediate um, check to see, okay, well, where's the problem? Is it on her side or is it on my side? Is it the database code or is it the original code? And it is the original code. So I have a problem here um, with uh, with my code. Well, I'm going to try. And I'm just going to try something. Uh, I'm going to do a little of the uh, when all else fails. Let's see if we can narrow down where the problem is. Uh, so which is a which is a popular programming trick. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to. It was uh, the answer was correct. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if a submitted answer equals answer, I'm just going to return yeah, it's going to correct. Fail. Does that work? No. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's failing when, when you hit submit. So it's actually not even, um, it's not even hitting back into the server. Um, which is really weird. Oh, so the post isn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, the post, post isn't, isn't firing. working. All right, because yeah, if, that if I put the breakpoint, so if I put a breakpoint here, we're not seeing it go to this code. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Ah. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, well just to sort of demonstrate because we did actually have a request earlier of uh, could we show how the debugger works. So I'm just going to put a couple of breakpoints here so we can kind of see. You know, this is what I would be doing to try and figure out what's going wrong with my code. I'd put a couple of breakpoints in by put you just uh, click in the margins there and you create those little red dots in the margins. That creates a breakpoint and that's a way of telling Visual Studio uh, when you get to that line of code, stop so I can please look around. So if I run my code now. Oh, okay. Got it? Okay, yeah. just a second, let me go. And uh, I go in and I launch my application. And this time I'm going to jump straight to the question because I know that's where my problem is. So I go to my question working. And you can see it doesn't bring up the website. Instead, right away, it brings me back to my code because, and you can see a little yellow arrow there. And that little yellow arrow is indicating this is the line of code that's about to be executed. So you can see that it's about to see if the request method is a get. And what I really think is cool is the way when you hover over things, you can even sort of get a preview of what the different values are, which is kind of cool. Um, so now I can use these little buttons in the very top corner uh, to step through my code. So step into sort of going to execute one line of code at a time. So I can execute a line of code, and I can say, okay, so obviously the method was a get because now it's going to go get the title, and I execute that line of code. And again, you can, it's neat if you hover over the variable, oops, I'll have to do that in a live preview. Then what's neat is when you hover over it, you see a, a little pop-up that tells you the value of that variable. So I can see as I'm stepping through my code that the value of question is currently, does this work? So I can see that working, and I know that that line commit uh, executed successfully. And now I can see that the yellow arrow is on the return statement. So if I continue, it's going to bring back that template, and I'm going to see the page asking me the question. Okay. Now, uh, do me a favor. Go back to the page that, that's asking you the question. Don't close that. Just go back to your browser. And um, I was on this one here. I, uh, nope, sorry. I've got too many windows open. Got to find the right one here. Dum -de dum I was on this one. Okay. Right. So you'll uh, hold on one second. So you'll notice it says, uh, does this work? Uh -huh. now, one of the very cool things about the way that our templates work is that we can actually make changes to the templates without having to recompile our code. So here's the problem. Go back to Visual Studio. All right. So okay. So we've been going through the bugger. The bug is brought back. So like, aha, I think I know what the problem is. I know what the problem okay. is. Okay. And are you about to try and fix it? Yes. Okay. So now this is another neat feature of the debugger in Visual Studio. The fact that if you think you know what it is, you can fix it and keep going. You can fix it in certain places. Okay. Um, you can fix the template. Um, your Python code you're not going to be able to fix. Okay. But your templates you are. Now what I want you to notice, and this actually goes all the way back to earlier this morning when we were talking about um, creating those forms and reading the values in, and we talked about keeping those values um, in sync. And I will, I, I will always admit when uh, a demo failed that I wasn't expecting, because there are times when I'm expecting a demo to fail. Yeah, sometimes we, we yeah, tool. absolutely, we both do that. So in this case, that's not what's happening here. <laughs> this I was not expecting, but it's a perfect example of that trying to keep everything in sync. Now, one of the things that was happening is I was doing my demo sort of in chunks, that I went off and I did my form back and I did my code. So you'll notice there, request.form, submitted answer. So uh, down right at the very bottom, the last this line of code line that you've got. Yeah. So yep. you'll notice right there that it says um, submitted answer, request form, submitted answer. Do me a favor. Go into templates. All right. Let's go to the templates. And then go into um, answer question. Into answer question. All right. And now scroll down just a scotch. Perfect. And then you'll notice input type equals text. Yep. And then name equals, and it says answer. What was it expecting? 
Uh, something else, I'm guessing. It was expecting submitted answer. Submitted answer, okay. So what we can do is just update that. Uh, submitted answer. Um, nope, was uh, it camel all, case, lower, that. all lowercase? Camel case. Camel case, all right, so. Lowercase, lowercase. Lowercase s. Lowercase s, yeah, exactly. yeah be specific, camel. thank you. There all we right. go, Good. camel case. Um, okay. And so now go ahead and save this. All right, I can never remember which is camel case and which is pastel That's okay. case, so. Hit save. <laughs> um, and now go back to Internet Explorer. All right, so this is a case where it's interesting. Remember, right, I'm still running the application this whole time. I've still been debugging. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a live change. As I said, one of the cooler things about Visual Studio is that sometimes yep. you can do this. So, yeah, going back and now, to my all the way over. page. Yep. And then now go ahead and type in whatever it is that you want. Yes. Perfect. And then now go ahead and click Submit. And so you'll notice that it will now actually go back to the debugger. And one little thing I'm actually going to kind of um, uh, keep going here. One thing that I sometimes find is I'll go in and I'll set a couple of breakpoints, and then I'll realize, okay, wait a minute. You know what? I figured out what it is. I fixed it. Just go. Engage. Finish. So one of the cool things that you can do is you can actually just click Continue. Yep. And it will just either go to the next breakpoint if you have one, or it will just run the rest of the code. So hit Continue here for me. And this, in this case, I expect that to run until it hits another breakpoint. Now, I do have another breakpoint bound here. So it's a oh, okay. Then take stop. away that breakpoint for me. Oh, oh. It's okay to show it going through. Okay. So there's our little breakpoint. So you'll notice that now it's actually going to read the answer correctly. Yeah, and if I execute that line of code, we should it should go through and do that successfully. Yep. 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 So if you mouse over submit an answer, yep. if it's still in, uh, it's still in, uh, it, uh, it's still over in uh, the world oh, of it's uh, gone. HTTP. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, no, and I'm still getting a bad request there. All right, maybe I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> it's going to be something along those lines. Okay. Um, um, so if I put my uh, put a breakpoint here. Uh, and then I should be able to get it to, to continue. But yes, I'm still getting my bad request okay. back. Then let's do this. Um, Let me finish talking to Redis. And what we will do is during the debugging and, uh, and figure out what it is. But you can see where that debugger becomes really valuable as a tool as you step through your code and try to find things. And you also see that, yes, you know, uh, no matter how you try, it's very easy to mix up the names of your variables from your template to in your forms uh, when you're back and forth in the Python. So change a little bit. Test it, change a little bit, test it, change a little bit, test it. Uh, the more you do that, the easier it's going to be to find your mistakes when you do make them. So we know it's not working yet. I'm just going to stop debugging and go back to the slides for a minute. So we were able to save and retrieve some values of Redis, and we were also getting rid of that B apostrophe by adding an extra parameter to our connection string. When we say decode response it equals true and charset equals UTF-8, that allows us to get rid of that B apostrophe that appears when we're storing the values. And we, I already demoed how to do that. So we do want to pick up some good habits early when we're working with Redis. Uh, I said we'll generally use a hierarchical naming convention for Redis keys, much like we did here, uh, you know, sort of question title, colon question, pair, uh, game, high scores, top, user, one, two, three, four, five, name. Those are sort of typical examples. You don't have to do this, but it's a convention that's useful to adopt, and it's fairly widely, widely used. Um, a couple of FAQ. Um, I know the first time I was exposed to Redis, I was sort of like wondering, huh, you know, if I store a value in Redis and then I leave the website, will that value still be stored when I come back? Because when we were working with variables, if you declare a variable in your Python code, well, when you leave that website, that variable value is gone. Well, what's different about Redis is we were looking at how Redis is completely separate. You know, we were able to access the values over here mm -hmm. in our Redis store. So in this case, yes. Um, if you go to a website, you store a value in Redis, and then you leave the website and turn off your computer and come back you know, three days later, that value is still going to be stored there because it's a data store, and, and that is its job, is to store that data in, until you tell it to get rid of it. Now, it is possible if you want to delete the key. That's one of the reasons that's useful. Um, there's another option as well. If you just take a quick glance down at the slide, there is an expire function you can use as well. So if you know you don't want the key to stick around for too long, you can actually call r.expire, tell it the key name, and how many seconds you want it to stay alive. So it is possible to create, if you will, temporary storage. The next question, uh, if, all, if I have all sorts of users visiting my website, are they sharing the same keys and values? And again, the value here is yes. 
Redis is a data store that's separate from Python. If Christopher sets up, uh, runs this website, and he's connecting to my Redis data store, uh, then when he tries to look up a value, he's looking at the same value that I stored. So we're sharing the same data when we use a data store. Yep. And again, that's a little bit different from when we're working with variables inside our yeah. Python. Yep. You can do a lot more of Redis than we covered here. This mm -hmm. is, you know, intro to Redis, enough to get you started, storing values, retrieving values. Uh, if you want more information, here's a couple of good websites that you can reference. Yep. Okay. Um, let's give it one more one more shot here. Got an um, idea? Go back to Visual Studio. All right. Christopher uh, thinks he's got a shot at how to fix it. Do you want me to get rid of my breakpoints? No. Scroll down for me real quick. Okay. SCB. Yep. Okay. Go back to answer question. Go to the answer question. Answer question HTML. The, uh, you want me to go to this particular template? Uh, yes. All right. So I'm going to go to the answer question HTML template. So that's in my templates directory. Answer question. Yep. Um, S U B M I T T E D A. Okay. Do you want me to just cut and paste that uh, variable name and bring it over? Sure. Right. Um, I, I, I now know it's correct. Um, what I actually want you to do is just run it again. Okay. So just sure. yeah, launch it one more time. And if it fails, then then we'll go back and you fix it. You think it might just be a case of the live it was update simply, wasn't yeah, enough? If, yeah, if, sure. if the live update just didn't work. That's possible. Not everything lets you do live updates. Uh, actually, I don't want to do a create. I want to go to a question. Yep. Uh, let's go to question working. All right. Does this work? Hoping the correct answer is yes. <laughs> we will find out. Submit. And the answer is okay. correct. There, there we, go. we go. High fives. All right. Well, so uh, I, I want to do two real quick things here. Um, first of all, I want to talk to the problem one more time, just because I want to make sure that we, we know what went wrong well, here. I can, I can review that. And then do you want okay. to cover, since I have the Visual Studio open here, it's probably easier for me. Sure. Um, go for it. OK. So the problem we had was inside of our form, yep. answer question.html, we had created a, a text box. And the name of our text box was submitted answer. Yep. Though originally we had that name set to answer. Correct. And then in our Python code, when we went back to our Python code, we had said, hey, go to the form and request the contents of the variable submitted answer. And originally in the form, that was called answer. Exactly. So we had two different names there. One was so answer. So it was kind of like we had it like answer. this. Exactly. So when we went, so when Python said, hey, form, give me the value of answer, it said, never heard of it. Yep. And we change that and make it the correct value of submitted answer. It says, oh, I have a text box with that name. I'll give you the contents of that text box and put it into this variable. That's exactly it. And then the second piece the of the puzzle. The second thing, well, that's the, that was the problem. That was, the, I, that was what caused the error. Right? Now that we actually have this working, I want to go back and, and, and do something here. So go ahead and pl hit play again for me. Sure thing. Just because I want to prove that our data is actually there. Mm -hmm. So do me a favor, go to um, WAC question. Yeah. WAC uh, Canada, capital C. Sure. Go to enter. Canada question. Yep. And you're going to notice there's Canada. So what's our national sport? Type in curling. I know it's wrong. Type All right, curling. curling. I was going to go with hockey. You know, I am hockey geek girl. But okay. okay. And hit submit. And sure enough, you'll notice it tells us we're wrong. And you'll notice that it pulled the cross out of the database. So even though we shut down the app, opened it back up, shut down the app, opened it back up, Redis is a separate service. So all of those values are still there. So if you also went in, and I think you called the uh, the one that you created through the command line Redis? Yes, I did. Oops. There we go. And you'll notice, can you start a question here? Um, you'll notice that, again, she created this through the command line. You can see that right there. So even though she created it from there, it's stored inside that database. Our app is now just another client over that database. So even though we kept shutting that thing down, opening it back up, shutting it down, opening it back up, all of the data is still there. The flowers are still standing. So um, what we now have is that front end to that database. And that database is a separate service. Yep. yep. Yeah, exactly. So you can really see the separation of the database and the uh, Python code. So it's, it's really it's a different concept, different thing to work with, but it adds a lot of power to your applications to be able to store things between users, across users, and uh, across launches. Exactly. Moral of the story, make sure you, you have your names right. Yeah. So, Susan, <laughs> besides having our names right, what did we learn? <laughs> well, basically, we learned how to store and retrieve values in Redis uh, and how you can either uh, overwrite existing values or append to existing values. 
uh, delete, expire, and how to debug our code as it turned out. Yay! Uh, <laughs> what can we do with this? We can do things like track number of visitors to a website, store high scores for a game, remember user preferences, remember information about a user. Really, whatever you need to remember, you can store in there. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to laugh at our little mistake, turn a little red. <laughs> Going That's live. That's what I do. Absolutely. See, we're really cooking here on this show. Um, and, you know, speak um, uh, again, you know, there's uh, another brand new poll um, that's going to be thrown up there in a minute about the uh, closed captioning. First time ever that we're doing that. Please answer. Um, and then um, what do you say we take a break? We take everything that we've done here and make it available. Right, because right now you guys can't actually try our website. It's not possible. Exactly. So we should we should allow the, the, the world to use our website. Let's let's foist it out there. Yes. Let's so do we're it. gonna talk about how you deploy this so others can use the awesomeness of code that you create. But first, ten minutes. All right, see you. We'll see you guys soon. Uh, do you have any tens? Uh, no, no tens. Go fish. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, oh. Okay, we're we're good. Oh. Sorry. Okay. All right. I'll pass, right. pass okay. it over. Yeah, okay. clean that up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. All right. Hi. Um, yeah. So, um, that's Susan. I'm Christopher. Uh, this back. is an uh, introduction to uh, creating websites using uh, Python and Flask. Um, and uh, yeah, so where we left off, uh, besides a little bit of uh, troubleshooting, uh, was we left off with finally the ability to store all of our data. All those put away? Those are all put away. We're good. Perfect. The ability to store our data inside of a database, but we've still been doing all of this development locally. So unless we're going to grant everybody the ability to connect to Susan's system over there, nobody else is going to be able to see all of the great work that we've done on this application. So now what we want to turn our attention to is taking what we've done and, and sending it out to the world. Because after all, the title is um, Introduction to Creating Web Sites. So it's right there in the title, Web. We need to deploy this out to the web, and that's what we want to take a look at. So we want to see how we're going to take Flask and Redis and put this onto Azure. So, to put together our purple slide, we've been building this wonderful website, and now we'd like to share it with the world. How are we going to do it? Well, we got to talk about Azure. So, we're going to talk about our Azure accounts, we're going to talk about Redis and Azure, and we're going to talk about Flask and Azure. Now, as far as the Azure accounts go, one very big thing to keep in mind, and you're going to notice the slide here mentions uh, a 30-day free trial, but it's, it's worth highlighting, besides the free trial, that there's a lot of ways that you can go get Azure credits. So, for example, if you have an MSDN account, depending on the level of account that you have, you get a certain number of dollars, and I want to say it's between 50 and 150? Typically around 150. 100, so, okay. so typically what will happen, if you're working at a big company, there's a very good chance that your, your company has some sort of MSDN agreement with Microsoft, and generally those agreements often have an Azure component included. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're working at a big company, it's worth going and you know talking to uh, whoever is your IT person who works with your licensing and finding out if you have some Azure benefits. If you do, then you can literally sort of connect. Uh, you, what you do is when you create your Azure, it'll say what subscription do you want to use, and mm -hmm. you point to your company subscription, and then basically it comes off your company's Azure credits. We also have a program called BizSpark. Uh, so if you're starting up your own company that is uh, going to be creating and selling software, uh, things like apps and so on, you can apply for the BizSpark program, uh, which will require you to have a website. Oh, no so kidding. that'll be a nice little requirement when hey. you're applying for your BizSpark. <laughs> and if you you can use Flask <laughs> exactly, and when you're accepted into the BizSpark program, you get an MSDN subscription, and that uh, particular level of subscription gives you $150 a month worth of Azure credits as well. So there are certainly a couple of different programs that can give you access. There's also if you are at a, a university, if your professor wants to. If you're learning Python and Flask in a university class, your professor can actually request Azure passes mm -hmm. for all the students in the class. So that all the students in the class can go ahead and try out Azure, and they, again, get uh, about $100, $150 worth of free Azure a month, and that's valid for about six months. 
Uh, so it was a lot of different options. You moved that much too fast for me, um, although I, I guess maybe you were just like perfect timing. Just as you started that, somebody posted in the Q&A, uh, maybe a good question, uh, is there DreamSpark Azure credit? There is not a DreamSpark specific Azure credit. Uh, I can promise you that something we're working very hard on. I actually work with DreamSpark. I work with students as part of my job as a technical evangelist. Um, it is something we're, we're discussing with the Azure team right now, saying, hey, how do we work this in so that there's an easy way for any students who have access to that DreamSpark program that gives them the free software to try and include Azure in that. So that is something we're actively working on. but. Nothing right now. Okay. Now, one thing that is worth highlighting about those different credits is that they're based on a dollar amount. And the reason it's based on a dollar amount is because there's a lot of different things that you can use Azure for. So you can create websites, you can create Redis, you can create SQL, you can create VMs, you can set up virtual networks. I, I, there, I, I literally have a slide when I do Azure presentations <laughs> that has 200 icons, and those are all different things you can do with Azure. So we're going to focus in on one of them or two of them here. Yeah, we're going to focus but, in on two of them. But the reason that's why the credit is X dollars because we have no idea when we give someone credit which of those services you're going to want to try. Exactly, exactly. So you have the full flexibility to do whatever it is that you, that uh, that uh, that you want. But yeah, so, but let's show yeah. them how let's show them the Azure features that are going to be able to allow them to put Redis and yep. Python Flask yeah. on, on the, out to the world. Yeah, we should also highlight that you can get a 30-day free yes, trial as there, well. Yes, anybody can get a 30-day free trial, yep. anybody. Yeah, credit card is required, but you can set it to not be charged. So that way, if you overrun your your um, uh, your credit amount, you overrun that 30 days, uh, that your credit card is not going to be charged. And I think that's the default. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's actually, there's a little checkbox sort of thing when you're creating yeah. your trial account that basically sort of says, you know, what do you want to happen when you run out of credits? And you can choose start charging me or shut down my service. So exactly. if you're if you're literally just playing and trying it out, you can do it at zero risk of being charged. Yep. Now, let's focus in on Redis first and Azure. Now, in order to create a Redis cache, Unlike before where we had to download that and install it and, and, and start the service, now we can actually do this through the UI. That And this is showing the cool new portal, which I, I love, um, where you just simply go in, you hit new, and then you hit Redis cache. It will then prompt you for the name that you want to use. It will prompt you for the subscription that you want to use because you could have multiple, maybe you know Visual Studio or an MSDN subscription, uh, like uh, like as shown here. It could be a um, uh, one that you're paying for. You know different uh, options that are available. You get to choose the location where that's going to be stored. So obviously choose something close to where you happen to be or, or where, where your, your users application be. Yeah. yeah happens to be hosted. Um, and then finally, last but not least, is that uh, is that pricing tier, and that's going to control the amount of uh, storage space that you're going to uh, to be able to have. So shall I go ahead and uh, show everybody how to do that maybe? Sure. Because yeah, you got some slides there, but you know, let me let me jump ahead and Let's actually. Let's just do it. Yeah. Let me flip over to my system. Uh, what I've done is I've gone here, and if you take a look at the URL I've gone to, it's portal.azure.com, and that makes me takes me to the new Azure portal. And when I go to that portal, um, I've logged in with my Azure account. And what I can do is I now want to create a new Redis cache on Azure. So I go down to the bottom of the screen there, and there's a little new button. And when I click on that new button, it gives me the option to create all kinds of different things. We were saying there's <laughs> lots of options. You want a new Ubuntu server? You got it. You want a, a team project? You've got it. You want a new Relic APM? Got to say, never even heard of that one. Uh, you can have that too. But if you scroll further down, you will see one of the options is indeed the ability to create a Redis cache. So we're going to, I'm going to choose Redis cache, and I'm going to get a bunch of prompts asking me what I want to call it. Now, if you remember, when we connected to our Redis cache, we specified uh, that we were connecting to localhost. Well, if we're going to put our Redis data store out in the cloud, we're going to have to specify the server name to point to that Redis data store out in the cloud. And that's where this DNS name comes in. The name I type in here is actually going to affect the name of a server I type mm -hmm. in when I want to connect to it later. So I can call this my flask, uh, flask test uh, redis cache.windows.net. So, whoops, sorry, one of the things is it all has to be lowercase letters, no spaces. That's why I'm getting a little exclamation mark there. Um, oh, that name must be used, doesn't like it. Flask test is, if it says that name is not available, Remember, this has to be unique around the world, so it means you've got to come up with a name. So I'm going to call it my uh, MVA on lowercase. 
Yes, lowercase. <laughs> MDA, flask. That gets me all the time. I always want to do camel case or, or Pascal. Pascal, case. yeah. How about MDA, flask, Python, uh, two? Are you happy with that? No? I'm it's, happy with it. Okay. How about Sue's awesome DB? You happy with that one? Uh, I think you're limited to the number of characters. Yes, I think I've got too many names. All right. Uh, how about short name? It uh, really you're doesn't like it. Just go with short name. Um, my name. Use at least six characters. Uh, is. It's being really difficult. It's funny. I've actually got one already created, and I don't know what's going on, but it is being ridiculous. It just doesn't. Uh, that's okay. So, um, uh, you know, you'll notice yeah. here that you can go in. I'll pick, go select the rest. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I, uh, so I can pick the pricing tier. So the pricing tier in this case, uh, for what I'm doing is a very small database. I'm going to be fine with the basic tier, which is cheaper. It's going to use up my credits less quickly. Um, so I'm going to pick the basic tier, and I'm going to select that. Then the resource group, you don't change that. Uh, that's used when you start setting up for high availability. Again, for subscription, that's where I would, if I'm working at a big company, maybe they have a subscription I can use. Uh, in my case, uh, I have a subscription I have. I have an MSDN subscription, so I pick that, and that determines which subscriptions, credits, or billing would be hit. Mm -hmm. And location is which physical server in the world is my Redis data store going to be stored on. Now, I can store it on Japan if I want, but if the people who are going to be using my website and storing values aren't living in Japan, I probably want to pick something a little closer to home. Probably. So I live out in the east, so I might actually pick uh, the, north, the east U.S. because I live in Ontario, and that's actually reasonably close to where I live. So that little, literally determines a physical location where your database will be. You want that to be physically close to the users. And then when I'm done that, I would literally just click create, and it's going to go off and set that up. Now, right. I'm not, it's okay, I'm not that concerned about the fact I'm having problems with the DNS name, because it takes about 10 minutes or so for it to create the Redis data store. I'm not sure why it's so slow, but it takes well, quite a while. You know, so a lot of people will say that, you know, that it yeah. takes a little while for it to do it. But what I always like to say is, think about what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Now, what this is doing is this is going off and setting up a database server that's going to be globally available to um, anybody that, that you decide or any application that you decide to have access. It's now going to be globally available. So it's um, uh, going to take a little while. Absolutely, but it's actually doing quite a bit, and it's still going to be faster and easier to maintain in the long run absolutely. than if you went off and, and tried to do it on your own. So, you know, does it take a few minutes? Sure, absolutely. But, you but, know, it, but it beats having to buy my own server, install it, connect it to a network, yeah. install Redis on that so everybody can access it. And by absolutely. the way, I found a name it was happy with, so it's now going off and creating my Redis cache. Perfect. Once I've created the Redis cache, what I would do is I would simply, when I'm ready to go back to it, I would go to Browse. Yeah, show us the turkey in the oven. Yeah, and you can actually see if I, I can get a list of all my Redis caches, and you can see the one I'm in the middle of creating called Sue's Redis Cache. That was the name it was finally happy with. And show us the, the right. one that we're going to be using. Yeah, so so you don't have to wait. We've got, said, the turkey over here. We have our completed <laughs> turkey. And uh, it's from those great cooking shows. And uh, when I select it, um, I can look up some important information I'm going to need when I connect. So let's say I've forgotten that URL. So yep. I don't, instead of localhost, I know I need a different URL, but I can't remember what it's called. I can simply go to properties, and over here, you're going to see the host name. So that's what I'm going to type in here. That's going to be my host name yep. instead of localhost. Now, here's something really important. Notice the SSL port. All the examples we were doing earlier, we were connecting with port number 6379. One of the things about uh, working with the Azure Redis cache is, by default, it uses SSL, which is, means it's encrypting things yep. and trying to make sure people aren't sort of looking at your stuff as it's going across. Exactly. Yeah, just a couple of other really cool things as well. It also makes sure that you're connecting to the system that you think you're connecting to. Because if I'm using this as a back-end database and I've got my application and my application makes a call into it, I want to make sure that I'm calling into the mm -hmm. right database um, and I'm not calling into maybe a server that's trying to Spoof the one that I think I'm connecting to, and now all of a sudden I'm putting sensitive data into the uh, into the wrong place. Into, some, uh, into somebody's database who's trying to steal my data. Yeah, exactly. So, so SSL is more secure, but it does use a different port number. So we're also going to have to change in our construct connection string. We're going to have to make sure the port is 6380 yep. as well. So that's a couple of little things we need to know. Now the other thing is when you are using SSL, you'll also be required to pass in a key. This is an encryption key that's used. So how do you find out what the key is for your cache? Uh, once again, if we take a little uh, look here, you can see there's a little button up here called keys. 
If I go and select that button, it will actually bring up a primary and a secondary key. Now, mm -hmm. you can't see the entire key, so you won't be able to just zoom in here and, and steal my uh, keys. <laughs> But what you can see here is there's this key here. Uh, you can use the primary or the secondary. And there is what's wonderful is this little button here. If you click on that, it will copy the key. So you can just paste it into your code because you're going to need that in your connection string. You don't want to be typing in lowercase k, lowercase x, lowercase m, uppercase l. The odds of getting that correctly are pretty slim. So that little copy button is very useful. Mm -hmm. You're going to need that in your connection string. That's going to be the password value. Yep. So. Um, that's, that's, all, that's how you create your Redis cache on Azure, and that's all the information you're going to need about your existing Redis cache so that you'll be able to connect to it from your Python code. So shall we see if we can actually update our Python code to now connect to this Redis cache? Sure, sounds good. So let's uh, kind of walk through what we're going to need again. We're going to need the URL that we're going to connect to. We're going to need the primary key. And then there's the updates that, uh, that we need to make. So we need to go in our DNS name, Redis cache Windows Net. Our port number is 6380. Now, one very cool thing, again, since you're using the key value pairs, is that we can reorder things. So you're going to notice when I go back to my code that I've put the SSL there. Because we've named the parameters, it doesn't matter. Exactly. And since our database isn't going to change, we don't need that. And then I just don't want to put the password out on our screen. By the way, um, you are going to notice, yes, I'm going to check this um, code into the um, uh, into our GitHub, and uh, you're also going to notice that uh, we're going to destroy the cache right after creating this MVA. Because yeah, so, I'm not going to have you guys all run up my Azure bill. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so by hosting all your websites yes. with my Azure cache. Yes. So what you're going to notice, <laughs> let me uh, come back over here to uh, to my code, is that there's my little update. You'll notice there's my uh, host, there's the port number, and then you'll also notice scroll over a little bit, and there's that SSL equals true, and uh, that little thing is going to make sure that uh, it's going to use uh, SSL. It also tells it to use port 6380. That sort of reinforces yep. it all. Exactly. So now, let's take our, our, our Flask app and actually port this out to Azure. So let's start off by talking a little bit about what an Azure site is. And put simply, it's hosting for web applications. Does that slide say MVC? No. Does it say Web Forms? No. Does it say a node? No. Does it say PHP? No, it just says web. Web applications. Completely whatever technology it is that you want to use. So if you want to use MVC, if you want to use Node, if you want to use Flask, if you want to use fill in the blank, we can host it. So that's the great part is that it doesn't matter what technology it is that you're using. The next big thing is that Azure will scale. So if you want to just go in and create a little test site, you can do that. If you want to create a full enterprise application that's going to scale, have global failover, and the whole nine yards, automatic backup, you can do all of that. So you can start very, very small and grow this out to very big. Now, of course, the next question then becomes, well, how much is this all going to cost? Now, the cost of the pricing models, the levels, are going to indicate the different features that are going to be available. So whether or not SSL is going to be available, scaling is going to be available, automatic backups, um, the ability to do deployment from dev staging to production, uh, and so forth. All of that is going to vary based on the pricing level. And um, again, you know, we need a, a t-shirt. Um, there's an MVA for that. I do want to highlight that uh, coming up uh, January uh, 14th that we are going to have an MVA on beginning Azure websites. So if you want to see the power and capability that Azure Websites has to offer, come join us on, uh, on the 14th. You can check all of that out. Now, for our purposes, we got a very simple little app here. So we're just going to go with our free websites. And our free websites are a perfect little playground. Yeah, they really are. It's yeah. Exactly. Playground's a perfect word for it. Yep. It's, a, it's just a place you can go. You want to explore, try putting websites out in the cloud. And it, cloud is one of those buzzwords these days. You're yeah. not, you are going to be dealing with the cloud. So Absolutely. you've got to start learning it somewhere. Exactly. And so you get up to 10 of these. But keep in mind, you're only allowed five concurrent connections. So again, it's, it's, it's a playground. It's just some place to go off and poke at things and just kind of see, all right, well, what's going on? Well, let's go in and see what's going on. 
Now, Susan did everything through the Azure portal. Yep. And and that's cool. And I love uh, the Azure portal, and, and it's, it's a fantastic uh, little tool there. But here's the thing. I'm in Visual Studio, Susan. Mm -hmm. I want to use Visual Studio, Susan. Yep. Can I use Visual Studio? Yes. Call. Which is awesome. All right. I'm just going to use Visual Studio. One less interface to learn. Exactly. So I'm just going to right click here, and I'm going to say Publish. And it's going to say, all right, well, choose your target. Microsoft Azure Websites, um, or Import or Custom, and, and a whole bunch of other options. Um, in my case, I'm going to go with Microsoft Azure Websites. Click. And now it's going to say, all right, well, sign in. OK, well, let me sign in. And um, let me just go ahead and uh, cause a distraction over here. Mm -hmm. Yep, hi. Causing a distraction. Yep, yep, that's a distraction. Barry, Barry, distraction. Distraction. Thank you. I'll wave. So, uh, so this is the part where Susan <laughs> says, so meanwhile, uh, I was talking earlier. One of the things I'm going to throw into the QA window, we were talking about ways to access Azure. I'm about to toss up in the Q&A window the link for where you access uh, Azure Education Grants, because I was mentioning that ability to get the uh, the free Azure uh, for anyone teaching courses, which is really popular, because said, there say you want to try web hosting and you want the students to build websites and deploy them or try storing Redis on Azure and so on, we do have those great educational grants. So I'm going to put that into the uh, chat window in case anybody's looking for it. Perfect. OK, so now, back over to my system, now you're going to notice that I can uh, deploy this out to a uh, little site. You'll notice we have a little last minute test uh, that we had uh, from the other night. Um, I'm just going to go in and click New. And it's going to say, all right, well, give me the name of, uh, of the site. And let's say um, MVA Flask. It's green. Uh, the subscription, I'm going to go in with Visual Studio Premium. Uh, it's going to ask me for my region. I'm going to go with West US. It's going to ask me for a database. I don't need a database because we're going to wind up calling Redis as a cloud service. Okay. So I don't need to create a brand new database here. So that's it. That's, that's all I have to do. And then click Create. And then just a little back and forth here with a little green. Waiting, waiting. There I go with the little dance again. All right. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. Now again, you know, people will look at that and go, you know, why is it taking so long? Think about what it's doing. Yeah, it's still you know? it's still a lot simpler than going out, purchasing a server, bringing the server home, installing an <laughs> operator system on that server, installing IIS on that server, configuring it and trying to set up all the security for all of that, and then figuring out how do you deploy your website to that server that you just bought and installed and did all that work on. Exactly. I got better things to do with my time. It's football yeah. season, you know? <laughs> all right. Hockey season. Rabbit season. Um, <laughs> so now that this has come up, I'm now going to just simply hit publish. That's it. And so now what it did is it created a free website for me automatically. It is taking all of my code here, it's packaging it all up, and it's sending all of that up to our little MVA Flask site. And in about another 12 seconds here, it's going to pop up a copy of Internet Explorer that's going to show me the website that we have created. So we'll just kind of wait, 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 wait. Again, moving the mouse. And you'll notice, sure enough, there's the little create a question. So I'm going to uh, click on uh, create a uh, question. And this is going to be Azure. And can I create free websites? And the answer is yes. I'm going to hit. Submit question. It created it. And then I'm also going to go in, and I'm now going to say forward slash question Azure. Enter. Can I create free websites? And the answer, of course, is yes, and hit submit. And all of this is now done on the cloud. This has all been deployed out to Azure. And, and the couple of things that I like here is the fact that this is so much simpler and I know we've been sort of beating this into the ground, but it is worth highlighting one last time, and I promise this will be the last time. This is so much simpler than going off and having to set up a server on your own. And you'll notice the Visual Studio tooling here is pretty impressive. So when I was ready to deploy out my website, I was able to just do that straight from here. And you would also notice that if I went back into Visual Studio, I made a couple of changes. Imagine I made a couple of changes. Okay. I go in, I make a couple of changes, and I'm ready to push these out again. It's just as simple as right click and publish. Cool. It doesn't That's, matter if you're doing it locally or if it's out on Azure. When you say publish, it sends it to wherever you wanted it sent. Exactly. That was pretty cool. That is pretty amazing. I mean, literally, you know, we've we've taken that website, but we built from scratch. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and you know, if somebody... There's really only one error. And you know what really blows my, boggles my mind is I have to bet if somebody had told me two years ago, I'd be doing a Microsoft course showing someone how to deploy Python and Redis onto Microsoft Azure, I, I might have thought they were nuts. <laughs> times, I gotta say times have changed. It's kind of cool that we're sitting here doing Python and Redis, which are open source technologies, and putting them out there on Microsoft Azure. You know, I, I have to say, kind of just following right along with that, is that I've been um, a Microsoft guy um, pretty much through and through since about NT4. I actually got my CNA on Network 312. Um, again, I'm dating myself here. Um, but since NT4, um, I've pretty much been all Microsoft. I had a little bit of a tangent with Linux. I did Linux for a little bit, just kind of played around with it. Um, I did just enough cold fusion um, to be dangerous with it. But outside of that, it's been uh, Windows. It's been SQL, C Sharp, C -sharp yep. um, uh, Web Forms, and, and every other Microsoft technology. Do you want to know when I started getting into and doing open source? Are you ready for this? When I got a job at Microsoft. <laughs> True uh, story. But yeah, so, so it's it's a very different world. Yeah. Now you don't have to store, you don't have to publish your websites to Microsoft Azure. There no, are other you places you can host websites. Mm -hmm. Said that's uh, you know Azure is one of the great places to store it, but certainly absolutely. that's not your only choice. You can yep. absolutely do research on other web hosting options as yeah. well. But yeah, the Azure is very easy. It integrates really well with Visual Studio. Yep. And uh, there is a support for Redis on Azure as well. So it was a nice example of a place where you can put everything. Yeah. So with that, you know, the, the big thing to highlight now to, to everybody, you know, I don't have a slide, unfortunately, of the, the what did we learn and, and now what can you do with this? Well, what did we learn? We learned how to get in and start working in Flask. So we started off kind of talking about the basics of Flask. We rolled that into setting up our templates and detecting the, uh, the request types and responding to it. Then we added on a data store and closed all of that out with publishing. And that really is, that's, that's the core toolkit that you need to create any type of application. So you now have enough that you could go off and create some simple applications. So maybe you needed to set up something to do polling. Maybe you needed something to... Maybe you're setting up your own hockey pool. Yeah, so, you know. Kind of thing, that yeah. kind of stuff, absolutely. Sorting the, the schedule for your volleyball team and absolutely. sharing it. And people can report their game scores at the end of the games. You're the, keeping track of a sports league. The, the way that I learned ASP, and this was, you know, again, years ago, but the way that I learned ASP uh, was actually going off and creating a website for uh, our fantasy football there you go. Um, yeah, because it doesn't matter what you're doing to practice as long as you're exercising the muscle. Yep. That's the important part. Well, with that, what do you say we uh, we call it a day here? I think we've uh, we've we've done uh, a fair amount here. So uh, a couple of real quick things. Uh, number one is uh, you're going to notice a little poll down at the very bottom. Please do go ahead and uh, and answer that poll really quickly. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, do thank everybody for uh, for tuning in. Um, hopefully you guys had uh, as much fun as uh, as so, we did. So are we done? <laughs> arr, arr. Uh, I believe we are done. Uh, no more eye patches required. Um, <laughs> and uh, I want to thank everybody for joining. Please check out the couple of uh, next Web Wednesdays. Um, I believe the next date that we're back is January 14th on a Web Wednesday. There are other MVAs between now and then. Um, Susan, again, Merci. always a pleasure. Merci, vielen Dank, <laughs> auf Wiedersehen, ciao. It's and been awesome. So long. Konnichiwa. Thank you very much. <laughs>